Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. When I go to comic books, I go to superhero material. Superheroes are my jam. Oh, sure, I love other genres plenty, sci-fi, horror, fantasy. I'm big into the nerdy stuff above all else, but comic books? I tend to stick to the cape and costume fare. I scoff and roll my eyes at anyone who thinks that superhero material is less deserving of respect than any other genres. Because, of course, there's good and bad stuff, highbrow and lowbrow stuff, prestigious material, and utter trash just like any other work of fiction. But while superheroes from Marvel and DC are what I love, you cannot deny that comic books as a medium have a very wide range of what sort of stories can be told. Manga managed to figure that out ages ago, but American comics have always struggled with getting the medium to get any kind of massive success outside of superheroes. But there is one very notable exception. Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. And what's hilarious is that The Sandman is an epic fantasy that basically put Neil Gaiman on the map outside of sequential storytelling, but a lot of the major lore and side characters featured in The Sandman are a part of DC Comics history, both in old superhero characters and horror titles that they had published before. Beforehand, Gaiman had done plenty of writing, most notably journalism material, a biography of Duran Duran, a companion book to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and of course started writing Good Omens with Terry Pratchett. The Sandman wasn't Gaiman's first comics writing. He started getting into comics thanks to Alan Moore's Swamp Thing and befriended him, soon taking his advice and assistance entering into the UK comic scene on Miracle Man 2000 AD and a few other books. DC brought him in in 1987 for a miniseries called Black Orchid as part of the British invasion at comics in the late 80s, alongside Brian Bolland, Grant Morrison, and several others. What's also funny is that Gaiman wanted to write a ton of other stuff besides Black Orchid, having presented a list of characters characters he wanted to do, but they were all currently in use by other writers. Black Orchid was at the bottom of the list, but it also put him into a position that would lead him to Sandman. That's always the fun thing about working with lesser-known characters. The creative freedom with it because the higher-ups don't give a rat's ass if you radically alter the life of a mostly forgotten Bronze Age character like they would if you did it to Superman. The critical success of Black Orchid led to editor Karen Berger to offer Gaiman the chance to revamp a character that had been on his list of stuff he wanted to do. The Sandman. The only stipulation was that it couldn't be one of the established characters who had used the name before. It had to be a new character. And thus, in 1989, we saw the premiere of The Sandman, a DC title for mature readers only. So naturally, I, a guy who likes to make boner jokes, is the perfect audience for this. The Sandman is technically a DC legacy hero when you get right down to it, because, as mentioned, there were other heroes with that name before. The original was Wesley Dodds, the Golden Age hero who was inspired by pulp heroes with his businessman-style attire, but with a gas mask and sleeping gas gun. He also would develop a superpower of prophetic dreams, but also his cool original look would eventually be replaced with a more generic superhero outfit. In the 70s, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon created a new hero with the name, Real ID identity Garrett Sanford. His story is a little more complicated, but he was basically a dude who tried to protect children's dreams from nightmare monsters that could potentially kill them in their sleep. The Freddy Krueger Memorial Gang. He was assisted by two living nightmares named Brute and Glob, and we'll be getting back to them soon enough. Prior to the start of the Gaiman series, though, it's revealed that Sanford had gone insane. Long story short, he was stuck in a dream dimension he could only escape from for an hour at a time, and thus went mad from loneliness while his body was physically in a coma, and eventually committed suicide. He was replaced by the character Hector Hall, the son of the Golden Age Hawkman and Hawkgirl. And if you thought Hawkman's history was already confusing post-Crisis on Infinite Earths, just just remember that Hector, his son, actually took on three different superhero identities, two of whom were other people's first. In this case, due to shenanigans happening at the time in the pages of Infinity Incorporated, Hector found himself possessing the body of Garrett Sanford and thus became the Sandman. He contacted his girlfriend, Lita, Lita? I'm going with Lita, to join him in the dream dimension and she accepted. Lita herself was a superheroine, and like Power Girl, was a refugee of the Crisis on Infinite Earths. Lita was originally the daughter of the Earth 2 Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor, probably thanks to her unique codename as Fury, again, like Power Girl not being obviously associated with Superman. She got carried over with a revised origin of being the daughter of a Golden Age Fury the creators invented. All of these retrospectives I've done are because they're important to me for my development in becoming a comics fan, and The Sandman is no different. It 
introduced me to a lot of DC lore I wasn't familiar with and expanded my understanding of what comics could do beyond superheroes. It also shows that you can take old ideas and give new spins on them, sometimes darker ones, but also sometimes just more fantastical. And despite it being its own thing, the Sandman would prove to be massively influential and still have effects even into the modern era, which we saw in Dark Knight's Metal last year. But we should probably start talking about it because there's a lot to cover. Let's dig into Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, number 1 to 20. So obviously, with a retrospective, as we've gone over before, I can't really talk about all the covers. We've got 20 issues alone we're looking at today. However, I'm sure people would want me to say something about Dave McKean's gorgeous covers that he did for every issue of the book's run. I don't like them. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Let it all out. Look, this is one of those it's me, not them kind of things. My personal philosophy about comic book covers is that they should be fairly reflective of the contents of the book, including in artistic style and plot. I'm already kind of iffy about having someone who isn't the book's regular artist doing the covers, but on top of that, the Sandman's covers are very unconventional. Very artsy, with rather surreal imagery, sometimes relating to the contents of the comic, but oftentimes in only the vaguest of ways. As I said, they're gorgeous, but I personally do not like it when a cover isn't representative of the contents. You could probably argue that it helps with a dreamlike atmosphere, given the plot and all, but I argue in turn that not every issue is dreamlike, nor requires that kind of mood setting. Consequently, the scans I'm using for these videos are not as high quality as the ones you might find for sale online or in modern trade collections. For some reason, they decided to recolor the books a while ago, probably to make it a little more consistent with where the book was going, but I prefer to use the coloring from when it started started just for the sake of presenting it as it was. It demonstrates how strong the material is, even if the art isn't perfect. So let's see where things started with issue one, Sleep of the Just. Dr. John Hathaway, the local museum curator, hurriedly arrives at the home of Roderick Burgess in England, 1916. Burgess is a rich sorcerer, and Hathaway's son has just died in World War I. Hathaway brings a book to Burgess, The Magdalene Grimoire. Burgess also goes by the title The Magus. I am using this pronunciation under protest after the last time you all said it goes like that. I still think Magus sounds better. After all, we don't pronounce magic magic, now do we? This is Jeff versus Gif all over again. Anyway, point is, Burgess says that with the grimoire, they can stop people from ever dying again. But mostly himself, because he's rich. While Burgess readies a magic ceremony, we see a series of children who are going to sleep. Some terrified, some peaceful. Of special note here is Unity Kincaid, a young girl in England who dreams of a tall, dark man whose eyes burn like twin stars. Unity dreams of Abe Vigoda. Assisting Burgess and his robed minions in this task is his son Alex. We'll be seeing more of him in a bit. The ritual commences. Bloodletting, chanting, and various mystical objects. 
until a figure appears inside of a magic circle. Someone in green clothes, a lime helmet, almost a gas mask, a purple cloak, and red gloves. All of which were changed for the recolors to be darker and more consistent, but regardless, the figure has been captured and lays in the circle, also having with them a ruby and a pouch of sand. The minions think they succeeded, but Burgess knows better. They were trying to summon death itself, and this is not death. Still, he recognizes that this being is powerful, and they strip it, of its clothes and objects. And that series of children we saw earlier? Some now have fallen asleep and are never going to wake up. Some now can't sleep at all. That spell has put a hiccup at that moment across the world. Unity Kincaid, for instance, now sleeping 20 hours a day. And damn it, they're not gonna invent Mountain Dew for another 30 years! They place the figure in a glass prison and try to offer a deal to them, but they don't respond. After World War I ends, Dr. Hathaway falls under suspicion of missing objects at the museum, and he tries to commit suicide and blame it on Burgess in his suicide note, but Burgess uses his magic to burn the note and escape justice. In 1920, Alex has done research on his own and figured out, of course, that the figure they summoned was Dream of the Endless. And I should probably just explain the Endless here and save time for later, though admittedly it can be a difficult concept to wrap your head around. The Endless are seven embodiments of forces in the universe. Not gods, not representations, they just are those parts of it. It's just that the concept of death, the concept of dreams, happen to have personalities and wills of their own. While those concepts are immutable and, as the name implies, endless, it's those individualistic personalities and will that are, for lack of a better term, vulnerable. They can be killed or damaged or, as we see in the first issue, imprisoned. But it's not like the universe breaks if that happens. People don't just stop dreaming because Dream is imprisoned here. He is a cog in the machine of existence. An important one, most certainly, but existence will fill the void and go on even if that embodiment is indisposed. We saw the hiccup in reality when it happened and it affected all those kids, but life goes on for most everyone else. Nature abhors a vacuum and all that. In this case, we learned that a portion of Dream's power ended up with Wesley Dodds, the Golden Age Sandman, to try to fill that void in his own unique way. We'll meet the other members of the family later and what they represent, all having their own unique quirks and changes in personality and viewpoints on their professions. Also, all their names start with the letter D because shut up! Since his son was able to figure this out on his own, Burgess declares that Alex will be a suitable heir to his little empire when he dies which must upset the second-in-command of Burgess's little magic order, Sykes. In 1930, Sykes splits away from Burgess and takes Cash, Burgess's mistress, Ethel Cripps, and a bunch of magical objects, including those that had been taken from Dream. Magical war is declared. Confusion erupts as both sides use the rallying cry, pick a card, any card. Sykes makes a deal with a demon for protection from Burgess, trading in Dream's helmet for it. Said protection comes in the form of an amulet, which he loses in 1936 when Ethel Cripps leaves with it, Burgess making his head explode afterwards. We get a quick check-in with the kids, now adults, who were affected by Dream's capture, including the detail that Unity Kincaid was raped seven years ago and gave birth to a baby girl, her family hushing up the scandal. I bring this particular case up because it's actually going to be important later. In 1947, Burgess rants at Dream about how he still refuses to speak, refuses to accept a deal, then just emotionally collapses. I... I didn't have to get so old. I shouldn't have had to get old. I don't know, man. You managed to capture one of the Endless. It's frankly on you if you couldn't figure out some way of using magic to extend your life. Watch my captor grow old and die. No satisfaction still here. I mean, it's good for a chuckle at least, but that's the first in like 30 years. It's like you're starving to death and you get a single jelly bean to eat. Up to 1955. Burgess is dead and Alex is in charge, now living with his boyfriend Paul, who thinks that maybe this whole thing has gone far enough, but Alex points out that letting him out would be bad, that he's not likely to be forgiving after being imprisoned for 40 years regardless of what they tell him. Still, he goes down and speaks to Dream, saying that the offer his father gave is still on the table. Power, immortality, and a promise that he won't seek revenge. Dream finally speaks, a single, no and we finally get a look at him. I'm not gonna bring up the live-action adaptation very often here for comparison, but there will be a few things that come up where I prefer the comic version, and no, I've never heard the audiobook version. I'm sure it's great, but it's a very different medium here. Being an adaptation, they make changes, and that's fine. The Sandman Netflix series is good, it's just different. 
Part of that being due to the fact that it's an adaptation, and it has to make certain choices with how it presents the material. Sometimes streamlining the plot, sometimes going for different moods than the comic, but it also changes how things look. Again, these are not bad decisions, it's just I have a preference. And personally, I don't really care for Tom Sturridge's dream. Well, at the time of this video's release, he's in his late 30s, he looks young and pretty, whereas Dream in the comic is visibly older, more unkempt, and a bit rougher around the edges. And the eyes really matter to me. They don't really change Dream's eyes in the show, whereas in the comic, Dream has black eyes with maybe a tiny pupil. And I get not wanting to wear contact lenses, really, I get it, especially for long hours, but it feels like they could have done some occasional changes to his eyes with CGI, even if not all the time. I wanted to be reminded that Dream is not a human being. By 1968, a bunch of hippie kids started coming to Alex to make him into some kind of quasi-mystical cult leader. Though mostly it was an excuse for tantric sex and cheap magic. Also, Stanley Dover stopped by at one point to spot Dream in the glass bubble and then steal the grimoire, but that's something we covered back in the Stanley and his monster miniseries. Anyway, Alex forbid any of the kids from doing psychedelic drugs in his house, worried that waking dreams might give some fuel for their prisoner. Likewise, giving coffee and amphetamines to the two guards in the basement to keep them from sleeping. By 1970, though, all the hippies have drifted away, and he hands the organizational aspects of his life over to Paul. Despite the ageless being in the basement who doesn't eat or sleep, Paul apparently doesn't believe in magic. Paul is an idiot. Alex's own mental state deteriorates as time goes on, becoming more obsessed with Dream. As the years pass, he gets older and more decrepit, ranting at Dream that they could learn so much from him if he cooperated, threatening him, etc. In 1988, after another ranting session, Alex inadvertently spins his wheelchair into the circle surrounding Dream, damaging the markings just a little bit. His guards don't notice. Boy, the old man's stroppy today. Anything happening then? Nah, same old rubbish. Says here that the Nemesis statue is crashing near Windsor Castle. Same old, same old. One of the guards starts rambling about his sexual prowess, which invites the other to very faintly daydream, and with the broken circle, that's finally enough of an opening for Dream, who seems to collapse inside the glass prison. The guards are smart enough to not try to enter themselves and get help, but said help decides to take a look inside, which allows him to finally escape and re-enter the realm of dreams. It feels so good to be back. I left a monarch, yet I return naked, alone. Hungry. Yeah, not enough politicians have that end up happening. He enters a dream and, amusingly, he has to actually steal Dream KFC from Colonel Sanders as if it was actual food for him. My first food in 70 years. I'm so hungry I don't even taste it. Going back to him later for popcorn chicken, though. He summons up some clothes for himself. Because he lacks the tools he had with him, the helmet, the ruby, etc., he's not as powerful as he should be and needs to retrieve them. Plus, that gives him the other thing that he wants... Revenge. With the King of Dreams free of his prison, the people who had been affected by his imprisonment are restored, for better or worse. For definite worse is Alex, who goes to bed and, in his dreams, is restored to his youth and met by Dream. He very quickly gets to the groveling, though Dream hushes him up. There are offenses that are unpardonable. Can you have any idea what it was like? Can you have any idea? Confined in a glass box for three score years and ten! A human lifetime! Time moves no faster for my kind than it does for humanity. And in prison, it crawled at a snail's pace. I asked for one goddamn rubber ball to bounce against the wall like Steve McQueen. That's all I want! Wanted. You barred me from my realm with your foolish circle, threatened, cajoled, and pleaded for gifts are neither mankind's to receive nor mine to give. You had no thought for the harm you must have brought to your world. The Paul brothers are your fault, you know. Alex admits that their goal had been to capture death, and Dream just says that he should consider himself lucky they didn't. Still, he demands the return of his tools, but Alex admits they were all stolen by Sykes 50 years ago. As such, Dream delivers his punishment to Alex. So, something to understand about the live-action series versus the original comic. The live-action series is fantasy, but the Sandman began, however, as horror fantasy. The live-action version has downplayed the horror elements, to its detriment in my opinion. Not that it's bad, just that they decided to go in a different direction, especially because the series would become less horror-focused as it went on. I don't think these stories are as strong without the horror elements, though. And early Sandman was 
very horrific. Alex's punishment in the live-action series was eternal sleeping. In the comic, it's eternal waking. Have you ever had a dream where you woke up into another dream? I have, and it was just like this. Alex wakes up, only to find himself in a new nightmare of terrifying images and experiences. He wakes up and Paul speaks to him before his face melts. Alex wakes up and his nurse's head falls off, and it just keeps happening. He is condemned forever to wake up into another nightmare, and is in a coma in the real world. As the original promotional material said, Dream has shown him fear in a handful of dust. And that was the first issue. This opening storyline, Preludes and Nocturnes, is intended to set up a lot of stuff not only for the rest of the series, but our main character and the universes he inhabits. He is extremely powerful, but not invulnerable. He is not human, but he has human qualities, and he is not above cruelty or using his power against those who have wronged him. But let's move on to some more characters. As I said earlier, a lot of side characters and the like presented in Sandman are from older DC titles. And if I listed off every single one, we'd be here all day, so you'll forgive me if I skip over some of them. Retrospectives are long enough as it is. Still, we've got two big ones before us today. Cain and Abel. That is, the biblical Cain and Abel. The first murder. The two were DC horror hosts for anthology books, The House of Mystery and The House of Secrets, respectively. Cain is brash and cunning while Abel is cowardly and stuttering, with their shtick being that the former will murder the latter, who returns to life soon afterwards. The two live in The Dreaming, the realm where our protagonist calls home. And just to avoid redundancy in the word, we'll be referring to Dream by his other name from here on out, Morpheus. As I said, Dream is endless, but the personality we see is Morpheus. Dream is both his title and who he is. I know it's complicated, but yeah, Morpheus for now. Morpheus returns to the Dreaming and is nursed back to health a bit by the two brothers, where we learn that our hero also has another title that he holds that's pretty significant for the series, the Prince of Stories. I've actually been kind of puzzling about this one for a bit because, you know, dreams and stories are not the same thing, yet Morpheus does hold dominion over stories as much as he does dreams. The connection seems to be, as I understand it, that since dreams can encompass anywhere and anything, much like how stories can do the same, they overlap in their function. Stories are just a different kind of dream, creating visions in our imaginations of the events that transpire in them, both awake and asleep. Or maybe Neil Gaiman just couldn't come up with a synonym for stories that started with a D. Drama, maybe? Speaking of the letter D, let's head over to Arkham Asylum and John D, aka the supervillain Dr. Destiny. Oh, yeah, haven't I mentioned that yet? The Sandman is most known as one of the great early successes of Vertigo, DC's imprint for darker, more mature storytelling. But this is 1989, and Vertigo does not exist yet. The Sandman at this point is very much entrenched in the DC universe. So yeah, we're gonna see quite a few familiar faces in the issues to come. For now, though, the supervillain Dr. Destiny is visited by his mother, who we have met already. She's Ethel Cripps, the woman who stole the ruby from Sykes. Dr. Destiny is not in good shape, looking less like his traditional Skeletor costume and more just like a skeleton. Anyway, once he's recovered enough strength, Morpheus heads deeper into his realm, into his castle. And everything is in pretty bad shape. I mean, just look at the central pillar of that castle. Sure, it's phallic. Why wouldn't it be? There he meets the caretaker and official librarian of the Dreaming, Lucian. Like Cain and Abel, Lucian is actually another former DC horror host. A short-lived one at that, but one nonetheless. Also, get a load of this artwork of Morpheus' face and remember that this is the same dude who cursed someone to eternally waking up in nightmares. The Prince of Stories, everyone! Lucian explains that Morpheus is tied into the existence of the Dreaming, and the longer he was absent, the more the place began to decay. All the books in his library went blank, and that most of the creatures that inhabited this realm scattered or dispersed back into the stuff that dreams are made of where they had come from originally. Meanwhile, Cain gifts Abel an egg that hatches into a gargoyle that he names Irving, which pisses Cain off enough to murder Abel because gargoyle names are supposed to have names starting with G. See, Cain doesn't like dark Disney cartoons featuring Star Trek TNG actors, then. Later, Irving will gain the name Goldie. Just being in the Dreaming is helping Morpheus regain power, but he placed too much of his power inside his tools. Without them, he can't restore the Dreaming to its former glory. Lucian suggests he summon some guidance on where to find them. The three witches, 
Once again, DC Horror hosts from It's Midnight, The Witching Hour. We actually saw them briefly a few years ago when I reviewed one of the DC and Looney Tunes crossovers. Here, they're reimagined a bit as the three in one, all aspects of the same being, but split into three. They've gone by many names, including the ones used as horror hosts, but they're better known as the Furies of Greek mythology. The three constantly shapeshift into each other as he asks for their help. They're not too keen because apparently he refused to help them once before against Circe, but he explains that there are universal laws that must be obeyed. One of them being that he's allowed to ask three questions, one for each of the sisters. Aye, my dearie. One answer, then. One answer from each of us. Are you really the head of the Quickie Mart? Yes. Really? Yes. You? Yes. No, he asks for the whereabouts of his tools. He can't inquire more deeply, but it's a start. The Ruby, as we saw before, ended up with Ethel Cripps and then to her son, John D, a.k.a. Dr. Destiny. The helmet was traded to a demon. The pouch of sand, however, was eventually purchased by John Constantine. Stop! I know what some of you are typing. I didn't think I'd have to get into it during the Hellblazer episode because of the comments from the previous time I'd mentioned him, but apparently we need to talk about this. His name is pronounced Constantine. You are absolutely correct that the Keanu Reeves movie and the popular Matt Ryan version in the Arrowverse pronounced it Constantine. And guess what? They're wrong. They're simply factually incorrect. I actually agree that Constantine sounds better, is a better pronunciation, but that's because I'm an American, and Johnny Boy is very much a British character where it is Tyne. All of his British creators who have worked on him say it is pronounced Constantine. They even put it in the comic itself that it's Constantine rhymes with wine. And people were very keen to inform me of this when I did the 500th episode where he was a prominent character and I kept saying Constantine, but I guess by the time the Hellblazer review came around, it swung the opposite direction. Hell, I remember when the Keanu Reeves movie came out and one of the big complaints about it was the pronunciation of the name and they used the different pronunciations as a way of distinguishing between the two. So there you go. But how could they have gotten it wrong? I don't know. We've spent decades asking the film and TV industry why they do some of the dumb things they do. This is just another example. I don't blame any of you who pronounce it Constantine, prefer it Constantine. I mean, in the Arrowverse, it's Constantine. But them's the facts for the comic. It's Constantine there, so I'm saying Constantine. Anyway, Morpheus thanks them for their help, but they laugh at this. You don't thank the fates, Dreamkin. <laughs> We haven't helped you! Your troubles are only just beginning! Ugh, nice ladies, but they are going to be the death of me. Morpheus decides he's not strong enough yet to visit Hell. In addition, he's been out of the loop for 70 years and knows nothing about superheroes, so he doesn't want to check in with the Justice League to learn about Dr. Destiny. As such, he decides to head after Constantine in the pouch, bringing us to issue three. The good Mr. Constantine is soon visited by Morpheus, demanding the pouch back. Well, I would, but you see, I already sold the pouch to two other members of the Endless. John is amenable, and they head to an old storage locker. For two hours, John searches before coming across an old photograph of himself with an ex-girlfriend of his named Rachel. She was a junkie who lived with him for a while, but then he took six months in Alaska to deal with the lupus affair. When I got back, she was gone. Along with me stereo, the telly, me silver surface, any old junk she could convert to money. Okay, two things. One, assuming Silver Surfers isn't some British slang term I'm not familiar with, DC just name-dropped the comics of their biggest competitor. Wow. Two, if that's the case, John Constantine's a Silver Surfer fan? He realizes that Rachel must have stolen the pouch, too, since she always liked to play with it. Chess, the cab driver, takes them to Rachel's dad's house, hoping to ask him for her whereabouts, but Morpheus consents the presence of the pouch in the house. They enter, and... Well, once again, things were a bit sanitized in the live-action version. There, Constantine just had a brief vision with Rachel again, talked about romantic stuff. Here? No, things are a bit... messier. They find a half-alive person in the house who Morpheus says is being eaten by dreams. Then John accidentally touches some... goo on the walls, and he suddenly has a vision of a falling dream before Morpheus pulls him out of it. So what's the goo on the walls? A human body. What's left of it? Your woman's father, I would surmise. But it... it's still alive! That's right. Jesus! 
Jesus Christ! Further into the house, they encounter more goo, but it's decidedly pinker and not human. The being in it telling them to leave, but Morpheus commands them to let them through. The creatures are dreams and indeed recognize their master, apologize, and slink away. They finally find Rachel, and she's... Yeah, your mileage may vary over who looked worse, this or the live-action version, but the point is the same. She's basically decayed now. The sand was not meant for human hands, and it's responsible for all this. Morpheus says they can leave, and that the dreams will return to their normal place in time, but John doesn't think they can leave Rachel like this. Morpheus says that she's basically dead already, but he screams that they can't leave her like that. This is actually a case where I'd say the show did it better, with Joanna ranting a bit more to Morpheus and pointing out his selfishness here. He's got his sand back, who gives a crap about humans? You could argue that the comic did it better by saying less, but I think it wasn't saying enough in my opinion. He has John go outside and uses the sand to craft a dream for her to die peacefully in, walking into the sunset with John. Before Morpheus can leave, John does request one thing. Just ever since Newcastle, the last ten years. Ever since Newcastle, I've been having these nightmares. Bad ones. Most nights, and I wondered if you could... I understand. Very well. Your nightmares shall be intensified per your request. So, uh, did Dream go back at some point and clean up the one guy who was still alive but now goop? Anyway, this brings us to issue four, which is tied with issue six for my favorite comic in the series, A Hope in Hell. As mentioned earlier, Morpheus's helmet got sold to a demon, and well, what better place to start looking than in hell itself? He admits that this is not gonna be easy. Without his tools, he's not at full power, and, well, it's hell. The guard at the gate doesn't buy that he's Morpheus due to the lack of said tools, but fortunately Morpheus is strong enough to shove him aside and get a better guide to the devil, Etrigan, the rhyming demon who I'm sure we've seen before on the show, but not often. Morpheus is impressed that Etrigan has risen in hell's ranks, being a rhyming demon is a promotion. To rise among the fallen? Strange and true. But as things change, Lord, they transmute as well. And if I've changed, O Dream King, then what of you? I have been absent for some time, but changed? Perhaps. Remember this, it'll be important later. Etrigan takes him past several places in Hell, in particular a forest made of suicide victims in cages, one of which contains an old lover of his. She asks if he's come to free her at last, but Morpheus admits that while he still loves her, he has not forgiven her for something that has transpired. Yeah, the Endless have emotions just like anyone, sometimes they're more powerful or they don't quite grasp how it works for ordinary people, but Morpheus has had lovers in the past and none of his relationships ended well, frankly. Anyway, they arrive at Lucifer's palace, and I do love how the devil is portrayed in this one. Stereotypically angelic and humanoid in appearance, yes, even wearing white, but the wings are another matter, black with spiked edges along the top. They really do come across more as a fallen angel than a demon. This is all politics, really. Both are considered sovereign rulers of their respective kingdoms, so there is protocol and respect to be paid even if they have issues with each other. Morpheus explains how his helmet was stolen during his imprisonment and that a demon now possesses it. As such, he wants it back. If this was really hell, you just know that Lucifer would make him fill out like a thousand different forms to requisition it back and then deny the whole thing because of an undotted I. As I brought up in the Hellblazer review, things have changed in Hell. Lucifer does not rule alone. Hell is now managed by a triumvirate, with Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Azazel all holding equal power. Some years ago, the Dark, the shadow creature, came forth to challenge Heaven. The episode ended in... perhaps a stalemate. But the civil war in Hell that ensued tipped the precarious balance of power. We rule in coalition now. Is Zazzle, Beelzebub, and I. And sorry, Morpheus, but we can't help you. It's an election year. The events he talks about were apparently a thing that happened in Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, but the actual appearance of this triumvirate first occurred here. With the three gathered, Morpheus explains that a demon has his helmet, but he doesn't know which one. Then let us summon all of them to tell, and meet them on the vasty plains of hell. Ugh, summoning everybody around here for an in-person meeting? This is hell. But yeah, apparently it's that easy to bring in all the denizens of hell. It's not a small amount, but sadly I don't think the art quite portrays the vastness of how much that would be, even with a two-page spread. Still, Morpheus quickly locates the demon. 
Corinzon. Unfortunately, Corinzon points out that he got the helmet in a legitimate trade. He has broken none of Hell's laws, thus if Morpheus wants it back, he needs to challenge him for it. Morpheus thinks he may not be strong enough, but he really has no other choice, so he accepts. So, as the challenged, I choose the battlefield. I assert reality. Virtual reality! As a demon from hell, I'm a big fan of the virtual boy. In the show, Corinzon had to pick a champion for himself and had Lucifer fight in his place. Not the case here, and I think it's one of the adaptation changes that makes sense. Especially by doing so, they put more emphasis on the relationship between the two rulers instead of just some random demon. It also gives a chance for Matthew the Raven to play a part in it, and Matthew hasn't even shown up in the comic yet. But still, one thing that I much prefer with the comic is that they make this an event in Hell. In the show, it's done fairly privately in Lucifer's chambers. Here, it's like a demonic nightclub where the two are having, like, a poetry slam or a rap battle in front of a ton of demons. Still, the idea is roughly the same in both. Morpheus and Corinzon need to alter reality to create a new opponent that can defeat the one they just made. Corinzon summons a wolf, Morpheus a hunter on a horse, then a horse fly to kill the horse and throw the rider, then a spider to kill the fly, etc. The show also depicts this as the rulers taking physical damage from this, which is a really neat idea and realization of it. I just like the jazz club idea thing too, especially since Morpheus has this outfit on. The direction of the fight changes. Instead of animals, they expand to the cosmos. A world giving way to a supernova, giving way to the universe, giving way to anti-life. And thus we get to Morpheus's counter to that. What defeats the end of everything? The end of universes and gods and worlds? Hope. And Corinzon has nothing that can stop it. I suppose if you want to be pedantic, you can kill Hope with despair, but let's not play the game any further. Corinzon doesn't think of it, and thus he loses. Corinzon is dragged away for failing, and Morpheus' helmet returned to him. Morpheus compliments them and says it's very honorable of them to do this, and he'll remember it. But, of course, they're the lords of hell, so they're kind of assholes, and point out that all of hell is gathered here, and they can just prevent him from leaving. Helmet or no, you have no power here. What power have dreams in hell? Eh, only veto power, but it's considered impolite to do so, so it's never done. However, Morpheus explains to not only Lucifer, but all the demons, what power would hell have if those here imprisoned were not able to dream of heaven? I mean, they would still have the fire and the poking and the penis flatteners. Let's not pretend they don't have any power here. But of course he's right, and the demons part to allow him to leave. Lucifer telling the other two of the Triumvirate that one day he'll destroy Morpheus. In the epilogue, we learn that Ethel Cripps has died, leaving John D. one object in her will. The demonic protective amulet. I love this issue. I love the imaginative battle. I love the writing tying the theme of hope throughout it in a subtle way until it not only wins the contest, but indeed Morpheus's message about hell only having power if those it tortures can dream of something better. I love the artwork's twisted vision of hell. I love the brief exploration of hell politics. It's just a phenomenal issue with great fantasy elements and an optimistic message. Just good stuff all around. This brings us to issue five, Passengers. John D is able to escape from Arkham Asylum. Someone escaping from Arkham Asylum? <laughs> now we know this is fantasy. After exchanging some words with Jonathan Crane, who even says to tell him all about his evil plans once he gets back, D uses a stolen gun to force a woman to drive him to where the ruby is kept. I'll tell you where to stop. Trust me, I'm a doctor. I would, but you're a dermatologist and you look like this. Time for our reminder that this is the DC Universe as Dream starts searching for his ruby with the Justice League, beginning with the artist, credited to Sam Keith and Malcolm Jones III, emulating Jack Kirby a bit when Mr. Miracle is having a nightmare. It's during the Justice League International days, and this isn't the weirdest thing that's happened to them, so he's happy to look for the ruby, even enlisting the help of the Martian Manhunter. Jean actually recognizes Morpheus, though as a Martian deity of dreams. He tells our hero where they kept the ruby after the JLA satellite crashed, and thanks them both. Meanwhile, despite her fear of John D, the driver of the car, Rosemary, seems to be building a bit of a rapport with him as he explains his backstory a bit and what the ruby could do. People think dreams aren't real because they aren't made of matter, of particles. Dreams are real, but they are made of viewpoints, of images, of memories, and puns, and lost hopes. Also, sometimes they're made of string cheese, and other times made of traffic cones. I know, I don't get it either. I didn't really have a lot of time to study it before I became a supervillain. 
He also mentions that he modified the ruby quite a bit, though it affected him the more he used it, taking away his ability to dream. Morpheus, meanwhile, reaches the storage unit and quickly finds the ruby, but when he touches it, something overwhelms him and he falls unconscious. Dee and Rosemary arrive at the storage facility and... Yeah, unlike how this played out in the show, Dee kills her. Why? Well, that's something we'll get into in the next issue. Dee finds the ruby and the unconscious Morpheus. He takes it and walks out, soon finding himself at a 24-hour diner, where he sits in the back and leads to my other favorite issue of Sandman, 24 Hours. This was also a story that was heavily modified in the live-action version, and in kind of a weird way. In the show, they made Dee's motivations more about lying, that if he removed people's lying and mistruths and deceptions, that the world would be a better place, a freer place. They set it up very early on and played it through in their version of these events, but as I said, the show was downplaying the horror elements, so 24 Hours, which is very much a horror story, doesn't have quite the same bite to it. And yet they still included some very horrific imagery in it. So if they were trying to remove the horror stuff, why keep that and change other things? They go for a message in it too, where Dream explains that D takes away people's dreams, their hopes for the future, and that actually leads to them being worse people, but in doing so, it removes the visceral terrors of the story and also doesn't properly convey what's happening. All the events that we see in the diner are occurring to the entire world, but we only see it from the perspective of the diner, so we can imagine just how awful it is out there. And it's not bad, it's just different, and I think it works better in the comic. I'm not gonna get into a lot of the specifics because, well, we've still got a lot more issues to cover after this. And also, I like being monetized, and some of this is yeesh. But if you want more details, Moarte did a long box of the Damned episode on it back in the day. We start out slow, introducing the characters and their stories from the skewed perspective of the diner waitress. Some of it is her wholesome thoughts, some of it is her own homophobia and, frankly, naivete about people or how she wants things to be. John D. uses his power to keep them from leaving the diner, then expanding his influence to the rest of the world causing them to kill themselves and others, which we can see in news reports and TV shows. He has them repeat events over and over, lets them live out their own fantasies and dreams, oftentimes violent ones, perversely experiencing their joys vicariously, but only really liking it when the fantasies are awful. He makes them fight each other, then worship him. The world continues to fall apart. He makes them admit to their most shameful, heinous acts, makes them do horrible things to each other, makes them fight, torture, and murder each other, briefly gives them lucidity again, and while the TV show gave Dee a motivation, how he wanted to make the world better, when asked by the patrons why he's doing this to them, John's response reflects the monster that he is. Because he can. Dr. Destiny did not have an origin story, not even a real name pre-Crisis when he was introduced and fought the Justice League multiple times. He was just a supervillain with incredible technology that later involved dreams. And we're seeing that kind of mindset of villainy in full display in this story. Why is he doing this? Because he has no motivation. He has no deeper meaning behind his acts. No great goal or aspiration that he wants to use this power for. He is a monster because those stories needed a monster. And this is what happens when no one is around to stop the monster. The people in the diner are not good. Hardly. We learn all the horrible things they've done and believe in themselves... But we also see bits of humanity in them, regrets and hopes and other aspects. We see nothing of the sort from John D., who killed the woman who he kidnapped to drive him to the storage unit for no reason other than he decided to do it. Villainy for amusement's sake. Murder and torture to give some entertainment to himself. He is evil because he is evil, and that is his destiny then, now, and forever. The people whom he kills, and yes, by hour 22, everyone in the diner but him is dead, did not deserve their own fates. And John Dee's evil is the promise of all evil. Eventual boredom, because his sadism is forever wanting and empty. He even says he was getting a bit bored when Morpheus, having finally awoken, arrives at the diner to see what he has wrought. Leading us to issue 7, Sound and Fury. After admitting to Morpheus that he doesn't really have a reason for why he's doing the horrible things he's doing to the world, which, to me, the most subtly horrifying image we see in this montage is a 911 operator sobbing because she has no more ambulances to send to people and the calls keep coming in. Morpheus explains that he created the ruby to manipulate the fabric of dreams in the world he rules, 
but it was not made for this. He's not strong enough to repair the damage that D has done without his tools, so he needs to undo whatever he did to the ruby and give it back. Naturally, D just says he's gonna kill the Dream Lord. I also love that Morpheus doesn't keep trying to plead with him after this. It's clear that D won't see reason, so accepts the challenge and says they'll meet in battle in the Dream Realm. As the world continues to burn and people hurt and kill each other, D enters the realm of dreams and is confronted with surreal dream images that shift around until he banishes them and calls out to Morpheus to finally face him. Realizing that the ruby stole some of Dream's power when he touched it, D tries to use it to drain everything left of him, but in the process ends up shattering the ruby. He is left in a white void. So now I rule the dream world. I will hide in dreams. I'll never go back. Never leave here for the real world where people hurt you, where they don't care. Spoken like someone who's never dreamed of showing up to class naked. He rants and rambles how he's the new king of dreams. Until we pull back to reveal that the world is not so much a void, it's Morpheus's hand. And he's dressed like this. Thank you, John D. Finally, my casual slacks and beige t-shirt. Truly vestments fit for a king. By shattering the ruby, it released all its power out and back into Morpheus, now giving him his full control over the dreaming. It's mellowed him out a bit, to the point where he admits he could kill John D for what he's done, but nah, the ruby likely twisted his mind simply by it being an object not meant for human hands. So he elects to return him to Arkham Asylum. Uh, not criticizing dude, but isn't Arkham Asylum still kind of a hellhole here? Sure, great you're not killing him, but you're not exactly putting him in a place where he can get the help he needs. John says he's sorry about what he did, though how sincere that is is up for debate. They even meet Dr. Crane again, who welcomes him back and tells Morpheus that things have been going badly around the place, what well, with the end of the world and all, and something needs to be done. Morpheus agrees, deciding that on this night, humanity will sleep in peace. It seems like he puts the entire world to sleep off the madness, give them a breath of calm. It's not really explicit if he repaired all the damage, if the dead are alive again or not, but for the moment, the Earth is at peace again, and we can presume something like that happened, since no one's really talking about any of this in the next issue. Speaking of, that brings us to issue Eight, the sound of her wings. We've learned quite a bit about Morpheus, so now it's time to meet the one that Burgess had failed to capture. His sister Death, depicted as a pale goth woman with an Ankh necklace. What are you doing? Feeding the pigeons. One of the lesser duties of the King of Dreams, but I've been neglecting it for the last 80 years. She quotes Mary Poppins at him. I love that movie. You ever see it? No. I don't know if you've noticed, sister, but I was kind of gone for 80 years. I missed a lot. Death in Sandman is... nice. Peaceful, happy, comforting, and joyful. Inspired by a drawing a friend had made of a woman named Cinnamon Hadley, Death is probably the most popular character of the entire series, and it's easy to see why. While not the first unconventional representation of Death ever, as in one that doesn't really befit the Grim Reaper or a dark, terrible creature, it's still a fun way of looking at the concept. Not as an inevitable tragedy, but as someone who can provide a laugh and some perky joy in one's final moments. Many take great comfort in that, that in the end, we're not met with darkness and cold, but instead a warm hand who will go with you on the journey into whatever waits for us after this one. Which admittedly, according to the story, could in fact be hell because it's a real place people go to in this universe, but still, at least you got pleasant company along the way. Death has had a number of spin-off miniseries, probably the most out of any character in the series, that explores her in more detail, as well as presenting some interesting concepts and ideas about her. As it happens, the original plan for this retrospective was that the first three parts would cover the main series itself, and the final part would look at all the Sandman spin-off miniseries. Did you know that there are like 40 or so spin-off comics, some of which are just as long as this series? I didn't when I had that idea, and it's why we're not doing that. Anyway, Morpheus is bummed out because after all he went through to get his revenge and regather his tools and restore his power, he just feels depressed and lacks direction now. Death calls him out on his bullcrap. He's having a pity party for himself because his game is over instead of going to find a new one. She invites him along with her as she makes her rounds, collecting the dead. Some are tragic, some are hopeful. One is kind of racist, and one is funny. Morpheus can't understand why they fear her so much, taking comfort in the sound of her wings as she brings them to the next life. He remembers that he has responsibilities just as she does, and he takes comfort in that. The joy of life as a cycle of many things. Tragic, hopeful, and funny, and ultimately leading to an end. But for now, he has things to do. That brings us to issue 9 and the next major storyline. The first eight issues were collected and named Preludes and Nocturnes. This was back in the day when there might be multi 
multi-part storylines in comics, but each issue tended to be a tale in itself, rather than a big story split over the course of four to six months. And thus we begin the second storyline, The Doll's House, with the first part elaborating on that woman in hell whom Morpheus was mad at. It's consequently where we learn that Morpheus is kind of a jackass! An African tribal leader brings his son out to a spot in the desert, a ritual that was passed down over the centuries, taking a shard of unusual glass and telling the tale of where it came from. The tale is told only once, and only after the younger man is circumcised, the glamour of youth! About how, once upon a time, they lived in a city of glass when the area was fertile and not a desert. The city was ruled by Queen Nada, who was continually advised to take a husband, but her response was that she didn't know where the man for her was. A stranger came to town, and she saw him and instantly fell in love. However, they couldn't find the stranger afterwards, despite a heavy search, so they went to the next best place to locate him. She went into the forest until she found the King of the Birds. Who, Darius? I wouldn't talk to him, he's got that weird skull thing. The Bird King, who has a tiny crown that's kind of adorable, soon learns where she can find the stranger, though advises her not to pursue. That whatever he is is neither god nor man, and it'd be better if she found someone made of flesh and blood. Thanks to a mystical berry she ate, she's transported into the dream time, and discovers that the stranger is Morpheus, known at the time as Kaikul. Turns out he's into her too, but upon discovering that he's one of the Endless, she flees, explaining that mortals are not supposed to love the Endless, and that disaster would only follow if she tried to pursue this. He's adamant, but she continually refuses, even after he says that he'd make her queen of the dreaming, for love is not part of the dream world. Love belongs to desire, and desire is always cruel. So dreaming of falling in love and being with people forever isn't a thing? That's kind of a bummer. Eventually, after pursuing her, they bang. When the sun arose that morning and saw the two of them together, it knew that something that was not meant to be had happened. And a blazing fireball fell from the sun and burnt up the city of glass, raising it to the ground, leaving just a desert. The sun is an incredibly petty douchebag who murders an entire city full of people because their queen got laid. This justifies my lifestyle choice of being a pasty nerd who reviews comic books in his basement. Nada says that worse will happen if they stay together and she commits suicide. Morpheus is pissed, offering her spirit one final time to join him, but if she refuses, she'll be condemned to eternal pain. Given that we saw her in hell, you can guess how that went. Dream of the Endless! Prince of Stories! Lord of the Unwaking! King of the Assholes! The Elder tells his son to put the glass somewhere, and someday he'll tell the tale to someone else. This is a thing that happens sometimes in the series, where we'll take an issue or so to learn about part of Morpheus' backstory, and consequently that he's kind of bad at relationships. Still, let's move on to issue 10 and The Doll's House proper. We briefly meet two more of the Endless. The first is Desire, whose realm is some kind of giant statue of themselves. Since the concept of Desire is not really bound to any particular gender, they're always portrayed as fairly androgynous in appearance, with the narration saying that Desire has never been satisfied with just one sex, so if we had to put a label on them, I'd say they're gender fluid, though don't take my word for it. Desire apparently has designs on Morpheus, wanting to manipulate them in various ways, which includes what happened with Nada. We also meet their frequent partner in crime and another of the Endless, Despair, who is apparently Desire's twin, though not exactly identical ones. Desire mentions that a Dream Vortex has appeared, and they plan to take advantage of this. And thus we meet Rose Walker and her mother Miranda, who travel to England to meet with someone who paid for their trip. As it turns out, it's an elderly Unity Kincaid, one of the people stuck in sleep when Morpheus was imprisoned. It turns out Miranda is her long-lost daughter, sent to be adopted by her family to avoid the scandal and all that, but she wants to be reunited with her now that she's awake. Aw, ain't that sweet. So anyway, this storyline is actually about a living nightmare who's a serial killer. Let's back up a bit. Rose is the dream vortex that Desire was talking about. What that means exactly isn't said in this issue, but she's able to actually view the dreaming as she sleeps, a fact that Morpheus is aware of. As he reassembles his kingdom, Morpheus has Lucian take a census of the realm. Four beings are unaccounted for. The first two are Brute and Glob, the living nightmares who I mentioned in the intro. The third is Fiddler's Green, a mythological place akin to a heaven for long-traveled sailors that is alive in this story. And finally, the aforementioned serial killer, the Corinthian. Morpheus thinks that the dream vortex that is Rose will eventually draw the missing nightmares to her. And he's not wrong. Rose gets a visit from the three witches, who warn her to beware of dreams and houses, 
But we also learn that she has a brother, Jed, who is missing. We enter issue 11 with Rose beginning a search for Jed by moving into a boarding house in Florida full of strange characters. We meet two of them right away. Barbie and Ken. Seriously. That's really weird because Barbie's a Marvel character. As well as two women who spend all their time in wedding dresses and veils named Zelda and Chantal. Zelda and myself have lived here for two years. We possess the largest collection of stuffed spiders in private hands on the eastern seaboard. Yeah, well, I have a ton of Bulbasaur plushies. And Cybermats. Beat that. There's another, Gilbert, who we'll meet soon. In the meantime, we learn that Rose's mother divorced their father when they were young. He took Jed with him, and they hadn't heard from them in years. Said father died in a car accident a few years back, and Jed went to live with his grandfather, a lighthouse keeper, but said grandfather ended up drowning, and Jed went off to live with his father's cousins, who were heavily abusing him while collecting money from the state with him as a dependent. However, we learn a few things of interest. One, that he dreams of going on adventures with the Hector Hall Sandman and Lita, and two, that he has somehow become disconnected from the dreaming. This is our proper introduction of Matthew the Raven, as Morpheus sends him to spy on Rose Walker and suspects that what's going on with Jed is somehow connected to the missing beings from his realm. Matthew is a very interesting case here, because he is a previously established DC character like the horror hosts. But also, I mean he was a full character. A human character. Matt Cable was a supporting character in Swamp Thing, having a ton of storylines in that one, including one that eventually led to DC dropping the Comics Code label on it because of the weird sex stuff that was going on in the book. Shock of all shocks, it was an Alan Moore story. Point is, because the character died while in a coma and dreaming, Morpheus offered him the chance to become one of his ravens, something he apparently does on occasion whenever he needs one to serve him as a scout or just a companion to talk to. Matthew is dispatched to keep an eye on Rose during all this. Speaking of, Rose is rescued from some skinheads that plan to attack her after she attends a drag show featuring her landlord, which, personally, I would have enjoyed seeing the drag performers coming out to kick the neo-Nazis' asses. By Gilbert, the aforementioned other tenant of the boarding house. Thanks to a private detective, she learns about Jed's more recent history and goes with Gilbert, armed with a cane sword and a revolver, to go after him. While Morpheus discovers that it was Brute and Glob who severed Jed's connection to the Dreaming, and are living in his mind. He is pissed about it. Honestly, he seems more angry about this than he did about his imprisonment. But then again, that was an offense done to him personally, and this was an offense done to a child, so I'd be pretty mad too. And it leads us into issue 12. We see Hector and Lita hanging out with Brute and Glob in some kind of high-tech base monitoring dreams. And we very quickly discern that something's wrong. Lita is quasi-catatonic, drifting around the house and casually mentioning to Hector that the two of them decided to live permanently in the dream world while she was six months pregnant, but it's been two years since then, and she still hasn't delivered the baby. Hector, for his part, is oblivious to all this, acting like a stereotypical Silver Age superhero and not noticing anything being wrong. The two nightmares barely have to do anything to poke him into service, not noticing that despite the job being about protecting the dreams of children, the only child they ever interact with is Jed. Well, hey, Morpheus knows what's up, and he's coming in to save the day. Hector and Lita will have a happy life free of the nightmares, evil will be defeated, and Jed will be rescued, and every Everyone's gonna be happy, right? Right? Morpheus very quickly gets through their defenses and is rather amused by Hector Hall's declaration that he's the Sandman, defender of dreams and all. Brute and Glob explained that they set all this up because in his absence, they wanted to try to make their own King of Dreams under their control, using both Garrett Sanford and Hector Hall for this task. He sends them to be tortured by darkness for a thousand years, but unfortunately, that brings us to the next problem. See, Morpheus talks about humanity and how much he loves them and has tried to help and protect them, but he does not understand humans, especially when they are suffering. He may understand the broad idea of inflicting pain bad, hurting people very bad, using his tools to cause suffering bad, but when it comes down to individual pain and torment, He's really kind of clueless. Morpheus sees his responsibilities as the Dream Lord as the beginning and end of his existence, occasionally straying from them for personal amusement or romantic attachment, but when confronted by Hector Hall in the real world, now freed from Brute and Glob's influence, he discards him as a ghost that is walking the earth when he should not and banishes him away. And Lita? She's still quasi-catatonic, distant and disassociating with all this, only breaking from it when it looks like Morpheus has killed her husband. Morpheus just casually says, 
Oh, he was already dead. Whatever. And of course, this does not placate her. What's worse, not only does he not offer any comfort or explanation of what just transpired, but when she tries and fails to attack him, he out of nowhere proclaims that her unborn baby is his, and he's going to claim it someday. Our hero, everybody! It's a similar attitude that he had concerning Rachel after the effects of the dream powder. It took Constantine to yell at him to get him to recognize that, oh, this is a living thing suffering and I can't just shrug it off. Unfortunately, no one exists like that for Lita, who is just confused and angry by this being that, from her perspective, just murdered her husband and is promising to steal her baby. As for Jed, Morpheus's breaking of the private dreaming that Brute and Glob had made causes some kind of massive energy burst that kills his abusive family and he goes wandering off, forgotten by Morpheus. He ends up hitchhiking and is picked up by the Corinthian. Issue 13, we're gonna skip for a minute. It's good, but it's another flashback story to Morpheus's past, and we should get back to the proper narrative of the doll's house. In the last issue, Rose and Gilbert's rental car broke down and they had to head to a nearby motel, originally planning on only staying overnight. The motel agreed to this because of that, but they didn't want the two there because the hotel was completely booked up for a convention. A serial convention! Captain Crunch was the guest of honor, trying to teach people new strategies to keep the Soggies from ruling. Collectors, as the issue is called, is not about serial. This is a convention for serial killers. And Captain Crunch would be totally inappropriate for that. Killing in wartime like he did isn't really the same thing. Collectors is another favorite of mine, simultaneously funny and disturbing, and another of the early horror successes of the series. As someone who's gone to plenty of conventions, it's fun to see elements somewhat parodied as you've got panel discussions on various kinds of serial killers. For instance, a religion panel featuring one guy who claims to be God having to argue with murderers who claim to kill in God's name. A dance hall that these killers can twist the night away in. Guest speakers of famous killers, and even opening ceremonies with jokes. And yet simultaneously, along with a panel on woman serial killers not wanting to be stereotyped as black widows or killer nurses, you have someone break down and admit that they were hoping someone at the convention would understand how much he wants help and doesn't want to kill people anymore. And the worst part is the weekend pass's price tripled if you hadn't pre-registered. Rose had tried to call ahead to inquire about Jed, but the police answered and explained how her relatives were dead and they needed to stay put at the hotel, even telling the hotel to accommodate them despite the convention. Gilbert spots the Corinthian in an elevator, recognizing him, and warns Rose to say Morpheus' name aloud in case she runs into trouble, while he goes off on his own to investigate. And indeed, one of the killers, a child molester and murderer, attacks Rose and forces her to call on him, who saves her. Like with Lita, he does nothing to comfort her other than warn her to get out of the hotel for a bit while he takes care of business. This isn't for your eyes. The Corinthian, having been recruited as the guest of honor after the previous one failed to show up, makes a rallying speech about how awesome serial killing is, and how they're the truly special and amazing, and the American dreamers, and yeah, Morpheus shows up and tells him he's full of it. You disappoint me, Corinthian. Man, imagine your dad showing up when you're making a big speech and proclaiming to the crowd how much you suck. The Corinthian, with hungry, terrifying mouths instead of eyeballs, was apparently Morpheus's masterpiece. A nightmare created to be the darkness and the fear of darkness in every human heart. A black mirror made to reflect everything about itself that humanity will not confront. But instead of living up to that while wandering this whole time, he's just a serial killer. Just something else for people to be scared of, that's all. To be fair, Morpheus, even that descriptor you gave of his intended purpose is still just something else for people to be scared of, just a bit more so. You've told them that there are bad people out there, and they've known that all along. But not me, because I have done nothing bad ever. The Corinthian tries to fight him, but... Well, he's a dream, and Morpheus is the lord of dreams who created him. So he just uncreates him, and says he'll try to do better the next time he makes him. And as for the serial killers, who are probably very confused about what just happened, he takes their sustained fantasies, their comforting daydreams that they're righteous and special, and the maltreated heroes of their own stories, and strips them of that delusion. They walk away from the convention with the knowledge at all times of what they truly are and how pathetic they are. Still, on the plus side, nobody caught con plague and there are no elevator parties. See y'all next year!
Gilbert, meanwhile, has found and rescued Jed, leading us to issue 15. There's not much else to say about the overall story of issue 15. The majority of it deals with the dreams of the inhabitants of Rose's boarding house. Some insights into the characters, Barbies will be significant next time, but consequently what Rose as a dream vortex is capable of. Unity Kincaid is dying, so Miranda Walker has to stay with her. Jed is not in great shape after everything that happened with him, and Gilbert goes to watch over him. Matthew soon sent out to retrieve Gilbert, who is, in fact, Fiddler's Green made into human form. Rose, for her part, finally sleeps, but is somehow able to sense the dreams of everyone around her, and pushes at the walls separating them, combining and traumatizing them all a bit by mixing very disparate, different experiences that were not meant to interact. Morpheus pulls her into the dreaming, and we learn, via conversation between Gilbert and Matthew, that he intends to kill her. The only time he's truly empowered to take a human life. Now, torture people? Oh boy, he can do a lot of that. Isn't that right, Alex? Morpheus explains to Rose why she has to die. Once in every era, a mortal becomes the center of the dreaming and is capable of shattering the barriers between dreaming minds, sucking them all into one until the vortex collapses and takes the minds of those around her with it. It ends up damaging the dreaming beyond repair. It's part of Dream's duties to prevent this from happening, and he failed once before to stop it, resulting in an entire world getting destroyed in the process. He doesn't know why this happens, but it does, and it needs to be stopped. He does offer her the chance to stay in the dreaming after death, as happened with Matthew, but she does have to die on Earth. Sure, you'll be dead, but at least you'll have a nice split level that's on the bus line. Matthew and Gilbert show up, the latter trying to convince Morpheus to let him die in her place, but it doesn't really work like that. He also explains that he left the dreaming to experience life as a human, enjoy substance and victories and defeats he never could as just a place. Honestly, it's something that I think would have made a huge difference for Morpheus as a character if he had done the same thing. Take some time living as a human. Even death does it sometimes to remind herself why life is so precious. Gilbert resumes his role as Fiddler's Green, inviting Rose to visit him if she stays in the dreaming. Back in the real world, as Unity starts dying, she falls asleep and reappears, younger and with purple hair, in the dreaming. She says that she can die in Rose's place. She was supposed to be the Vortex, not Rose, but then Morpheus got imprisoned and it caused a hiccup and everything. She can take on the part of Rose that's the Vortex and die instead. That's brilliant! How does she know all this? Like, there's some narration that says she hears a whisper of her own voice that reveals the truth, but like, how does she even comprehend all this? From her perspective, she spent decades asleep. She's probably still wrapping her head around VCRs and Super Mario Brothers. Anyway, she takes this heart and Morpheus kills her. And since she was already dying in the real world from old age, it allows everything to come to pass naturally. Unity will remain in the dreaming, and Morpheus explains that Rose's family has suffered enough. He'll make sure that Jed awakens and lives on. After the trauma of what happened, the boarding house inhabitants are making a change. Barbie and Ken getting divorced, Hal heading out west towards Hollywood, Zelda and Chantel buy up the boarding house for themselves, and, well... Gilbert's gone. Unity left all her money to Miranda, and Rose takes six months to recover from the events of this, but in the end walks away with a haircut and deciding to color it purple too. We also get some more connection back to earlier, with it turning out that Rose was friends with one of the diner patrons from 24 Hours, and indeed that they died and did not come back, so that's a bummer. Rose takes her experiences to mean that there's a lot more about the world than humanity understands, and forces that treat humanity as their toys, their dolls. However, Morpheus has the opposite attitude, as he explains. But first, he pays a visit to Desire as he's put the pieces together. Desire was the one who assaulted Unity while she was sleeping, setting this chain of events in motion. They knew that this would somehow pass the vortex down along the family tree, and Morpheus, whenever he escaped, would be forced to kill her. But the bigger deal would have been that Morpheus, even unknowingly, would have murdered a member of his family since Desire was her grandparent. Morpheus explains that the Endless are the servants of the living. They exist because, deep down, mortals know they exist. They are the dolls of the living, not the other way around. Still, even if Desire rejects that attitude, he makes it clear to them one thing. Interfere with him or his realm again, and he will respond in kind. And he'll be backed up by destiny and death, who are far more powerful than Desire or Despair. Also, he says this while Desire has cat ears and a cat tail, so you know Desire has their finger on the pulse of what a lot of people want. Before we move on to our final issues for today, let's take a step back to issue 13, Men of Good Fortune. 
As I said, this one's kind of weird in that it's slapped right smack in the middle of the Doll's House storyline, even though it has nothing to do with what's going on. Still, it's a significant one, and a really good one. In 1389, Morpheus and Death are hanging out in a pub, Death trying to get her brother to understand more about humanity. They overhear a man named Hob Gadling saying that nobody has to die, they just die because everybody does it and goes along with it. You hear that, decapitation victims? It's on you. Yeah, I remember back in the 90s when it was really trendy to die. Just the biggest fat in the world right alongside Beanie Babies. In any case, he declares that he will not die. He has too much to see and experience. As such, Death and Morpheus overhear this and decide to play his game. Morpheus declares that he will not die, and they will meet again in 100 years in the same tavern to discuss what he's learned. And thus we cut to 1489 and the two meet again. Hob wondering if he's made some sort of deal with the devil or the like, but Morpheus explains that he's just curious. Death won't touch him unless Hob wants it. So this whole time, Burgess could have just talked to the two of them and said, Hey, can I get the same deal as that dude? Went to a lot of trouble being a dick for it. Hob marvels at some of the modern inventions that make life better, like chimneys and handkerchiefs. He's even investing in this goofy idea called printing. It'll never be popular, but hey, beats dying. And it becomes a regular ritual. Come back every hundred years to check in. So in 1589, the two of them meet yet again, and Hob, now going under the name Sir Robert Gadlin, it's become commonplace for him to leave for a year, then come back as his own son, has acquired a bit of wealth thanks to investing in shipping. Honestly, the most unrealistic part to me is that this same building is still a pub or restaurant many centuries later. It's not impossible, just seems a little far-fetched that it hasn't been repurposed for something else by now. I don't know, maybe Morpheus has some kind of influence and is keeping it around for these meetings. Still, he seems unimpressed by the things he's talking about, including marrying and finally having a son after 200 years. Instead, Morpheus is impressed with some weirdo playwright who's getting some harsh feedback on his first play, and proclaiming that he'd give anything to be able to write like Kit Marlowe. Morpheus takes him up on that offer, that this... Will Shaxbird or whatever can make some great plays and that they'll strike a deal. But let's advance another hundred years to 1689 and things have not gone well for Hob. His wife and child died and that put him in a severe depression. Staying in his house long enough for people to notice how long he'd been alive without aging and they tried to drown him as a witch. And yeah, he's immortal and stuff, but he still suffers pain and hunger and the last 80 years have not exactly been providing sumptuous feasts. Morpheus asks if he'd like the respite of death finally. Are you crazy? Death is a mugs game. I got so much to live for. So many new places on the streets to urinate. So many new rats to try to hunt down and eat. In 1789, things have turned around for Hobbes so that he's back on top but not from a pleasant source. He's gotten involved in the slave trade, something that Morpheus discourages because of its immorality. It seems it's taken this long for Hob to finally ask him what his name is and what his deal is, but before he can answer, the two are attacked by Joanna Constantine, the ancestor of our own Johnny Boy. It seems somehow a few people caught on that these two weirdos kept meeting every hundred years, and she's been planning on interrupting this meeting to learn how and why they did this. But Morpheus just uses his dream dust to deal with them and show them ghosts from their own past. At 1889, they meet once more, Morpheus even commenting that he ended up seeing Joanna Constantine again and recruiting her for a task. Hob states that he's met a few other immortals since their last meeting, including Jason Blood of Etrican the Demon fame. He also deeply regrets being involved in the slave trade now, and he's had his ups and downs in life, but he's come to realize that Morpheus isn't still doing this because he's curious about what happens when a man doesn't die, since there are several of those those running around. He thinks Morpheus wants friendship and companionship, an idea that Morpheus finds insulting, leaving in a huff. Hob declares that if they meet again in a hundred years, it'll be because they're friends. And thus we arrive in the present day, where Morpheus arrives and declares that it's impolite of him to keep his friends waiting. What I find really great about the story of Hob Gadling is that it's such an inversion on the usual trope. In fantasy and sci-fi, you have the immortal who regrets living for so long, is really sad about it. Oh, I've seen too much. But Hob is the inversion of that. He always thinks there's more to see. I'd like to think that that's the attitude I'd take. When you think of how much has changed for the world culturally, technologically, socially, artistically, in only 50 years alone, much less 600 years, there really is so much to see and learn and figure out. It's also important as a character piece for Morpheus, because indeed, he is lonely. The other realms of the Endless tend to be pretty sparsely populated, if at all, but Morpheus surrounds himself with creations and other beings, people with their own tales and stories, who can aid him and provide some form of companionship. And Hob Gadling, for all his 
Fultz is a pretty unique person who has changed over the centuries in what he values and cares about. And this won't be the last time we see him. But let's get back to the regular stories with issue 17, beginning Dream Country. Dream Country is less of a storyline and instead a series of single issue short stories with two not very significant and two with more significance, beginning with Calliope. It seems that in 1927, the muse Calliope of Greek mythology was captured by a writer named Aramis Fry. Fry kept her prisoner and raped her, granting him creative inspiration and a long writing career. In 1986, now an old man, he sells her to a struggling writer, Richard Maddock, who can't even start his second book and the publisher is breathing down his neck. Doing the same awful things as Fry, even trying to sickeningly justify it to himself that she's not even human, he soon finds the same amount of success. Writing deals, poetry, critical acclaim and fortune, etc. Calliope contacts the three witches as the Furies, begging for help, but unfortunately there's nothing they can do. They do suggest that Morpheus could free her, but she's reluctant. It seems the two used to date. In fact, the two had a child together, whom we'll be learning more about in another video. Still, since it's 1986, Morpheus can't help her anyway, since he's still imprisoned by Burgess. And over the next few years, Maddox continues his horrible ways while gaining more success. I loved your characterization of Aileen. There aren't enough strong enough women in fiction. Actually, I do tend to regard myself as a feminist writer. Ah, I see we accidentally started reading a Joss Whedon biography. Thankfully, in 1989, Morpheus is finally freed and is informed of what happened to Calliope. And as we've seen, he may have some problems understanding parts of humanity, but he understands exactly how evil and terrible this is, and not only frees her, but punishes Richard Maddock. He needs inspiration and creativity? Fine. He can drown in it. Maddock finds himself unable to do anything else. He has too many ideas in his head, and he's going mad trying to write them all down, even using the blood from his fingers to do the deed. In the meantime, Calliope points out that Morpheus has changed by his recent experiences, since in the past he would have left her to rot because of his own dickish pride and unforgiving nature. He admits he no longer hates her over what has happened, and even sets Maddock free from the punishment upon her request, which is very nice of her, but I say let him stew for a while given the sheer level of his crimes. In any case, they part on decent terms, and that brings us to issue 18, A Dream of a Thousand Cats. It's not a favorite of mine. I get thematically what it's going for concerning how dreams can shape reality and whatnot, but even putting aside that plot-wise it has nothing to do with anything else, it has some bad things happening to cats in it, and I love my cats, and I don't like seeing stories where bad things happen to cats. Starfire is actually sleeping right next to me right now. It's artistically beautiful, basically a dark fairy tale about a cat who seeks justice for her kittens being murdered by her owners over petty, stupid reasons, who ends up meeting with Morpheus. Morpheus explains to her how, once upon a time, humans were the servants of giant cats, who used them for their own amusement until one day a human realized that dreams shaped the world and recreated anew. Thus, if they collectively dream of a world where they are in charge, it will be so. Morpheus seems to suggest that this cat's task is to do the same thing, to get as many many cats as possible to dream of the world as it was and to reshape it once again. Is that why he's such an asshole at times? That the dreams he watched over used to be from cats, but then humans rose up and he doesn't understand them as well as he does cats? Like I said, not a favorite of mine, but I get why others like it. Issue 19 is A Midsummer Night's Dream. And unfortunately, these last two I also don't really care for either. In this one's case, it's not because of the content being bad or anything. Hell, this issue won a World Fantasy Award. The problem is... I've never actually seen or read Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is the entire point of the story. I'm not a huge Shakespeare reader, and most of the stuff I have studied is the tragedies. Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Hamlet, etc. I've seen none of the historicals, and only one of the comedies, Comedy of Errors. I think I saw As You Like It once, but it was so long ago I don't remember anything about it. I suppose you could say I've seen Taming of the Shrew, but only because I've seen 10 Things I Hate About You, which is probably not how the bard intended it to be seen. The point is that because I'm not familiar with the work, a lot of the symbolism and meaning and connection are lost on me. The important plot point here ties us back to Morpheus's deal with Shakespeare. In return for his writing career, Morpheus has two plays that he could specifically request. The first is A Midsummer Night's Dream. He has Shakespeare 
Shakespeare's acting troupe perform the play specifically to fairy folk, some of whom are in the play itself, like Titania and Oberon. Morpheus explains to the queen that because her kind have decided to leave the mortal plane forever, and they provided so much amusement and story and mirth that he wanted to honor them, make sure that a memory, even one that's not historically true, would live on forever among mortals. It's definitely a sweet gesture, and we'll be seeing the fairies again in the future. Rereading it for the retrospective, I appreciate it more than I originally did, but a lot of it is still lost on me, I'm afraid. Let's get to the final comic we'll talk about today. Issue 20, Facade. It's a tragedy, and a bit of a depressing beat to end on. I honestly have no idea why it's here. It doesn't feature Morpheus, it's not an extension of any plot lines. It does feature death, I suppose, and it gives us a bit of insight into her. But I'm not very fond of it, and it feels a bit out of place with the rest of the series. Element Girl, aka Urana Blackwell, was a supporting character for Metamorpho back when he had his own comic. She got the same kind of powers as him from the Orb of Ra, the Egyptian sun god. So of course this tragedy is the fault of our long-standing foe, Ancient Egypt! <laughs> And eventually found herself pretty much ostracized from society and her former spy employers because of her appearance. She can't really live a normal life, she doesn't really want to be a superhero, and she lives on a veteran's check she gets once a month. So no one to talk to, no friends or loved ones. It sucks and she hates it, and especially after she has a run-in with an old friend and her fake skin mask falls off to her embarrassment, she just wants to die. And who should show up dealing with a woman who accidentally died in the same apartment building but Death herself? The two have a conversation about it, and Death tries to cheer her up and encourage her, but nothing going. Unfortunately, due to her nature, there's nothing she can really do to kill herself. She'd either survive the attempt or remain conscious despite anything terrible happening to her. And Death doesn't kill people, as she explains. She's just the guide to pass them on. She was there waiting when the first living being appeared, and she'll be there to turn out the lights when all living things expire but she can't just kill her. Still, she tells her to finally speak to Ra by staring directly into the sun, who grants her request and turns her into salt or something. I guess what bothers me about this story is that as someone who fervently believes that life is always preferable to death, that existence can be filled with joy and friendship and warmth even under the most difficult of circumstances, that it seems to take the stance that suicide is a perfectly acceptable solution, and I can't accept that. You can probably argue that this is very much in the vein of assisted suicide for someone suffering, and Element Girl is indeed suffering, but I don't know. She has a disability, yes, a condition that makes her life harder to bear, but especially speaking to this now, when disability rights are also a very important thing that people are fighting for, equal treatment and things like marriages and taxes and accessibility, I have to read this comic that takes the stance of, yeah, killing yourself is probably the best outcome. I don't know, maybe I'm just reading way too much into it and I'm talking out of my ass with that interpretation. It's just not a story I like to revisit compared to some of these other ones. But Sandman is, overall, a great series to revisit. The first 20 issues showed a lot of what made the series great. Fantasy, horror, interesting characters, and a lot of plot threads that would be revisited down the road. So come back next time as we check out the next 20 issues, we'll meet with Barbie again, learn some more of Morpheus' long history, and ask an interesting question. What happens when the devil decides to quit? Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. We continue our retrospective of Neil Gaiman's masterpiece, The Sandman. Last time on The Last Episode! Morpheus, aka Dream of the Endless, was imprisoned for 80 years, but was finally able to escape and wreak swift revenge on his captors. After going through literal and figurative hell to reclaim his tools of power, he set about re-establishing his realm and finding wayward beings that had left the Dreaming in his absence. In the process, he took back several nightmares, freed Lita Hall and her unborn child from a dream prison, not that she recognizes that that's what he did, and we learned just how much of a crappy boyfriend he was over the years. Personally, I'm still shipping him and Hob Gadling. In the meantime, though, let's dig into the next 20 issues of The Sandman and see where we go from here.
Issue 21 begins the next major storyline, Season of Mists. We're introduced to Destiny, the only member of the Endless who was not originally created for the series. Destiny is yet another horror host, this time for the book Weird Mystery Tales. And man, when you stop and look at this stuff, DC had a lot of horror titles back in the day. There are a few I still haven't mentioned yet. Destiny is the oldest of the siblings and tends to lack much personality, consumed entirely by being the keeper of his book. Said book contains... everything. To be accurate, written in it is the sum knowledge of everything that has or will ever happen. It is the encyclopedia of everything, every event that has ever occurred. And as you can imagine, quite a lot had to be cut when they released an abridged version. As is customary for the series, Destiny comes across the Grey Ladies, aka the Witches 3, aka the Furies, who warn him of several events that will soon transpire, but that they all have their start in his domain. Reading ahead in his book, he sees what he has to do. Summon a family meeting of the Endless. The Endless are soon called, Death being asked to wear fancier clothes by Destiny because he's a bit of a buzzkill. Morpheus' finest vestments? Have him dressed as a pirate. Ha 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 Your costume, costume is ridiculous. ridiculous. Destiny does not seem to raise any objections to Desire dressed in lingerie or Despair appearing naked. They discuss that there is a member of the Endless who won't be coming, though details about why aren't given yet. However, we then meet the youngest of the Endless, whose speech is garbled, a rainbow, and the one who seems the least focused of the group, which makes sense given who she is... Delirium. There are a few pages on them that describe these members of the Endless, giving some info about their domains and characteristics, but the most interesting tidbit is that Delirium was not always Delirium. Once upon a time, she was Delight, but something happened that changed her into what she is now. We never learn exactly what that was, but it also shows how the nature of the universe can change if these elements of existence can be transformed in such a manner. Anyway, the meeting. I suppose you must be wondering why I called you all here. To destroy Superman. No, he explains about his encounter with the Fates and the book telling him that something important was going to happen because of this meeting. Thus, he called the meeting and is like, well, get started on figuring that out, people. They mostly bicker, Morpheus being grumpy that he was called away for a meeting without purpose and staying only because Death asks him to. Despair is the one that surprises me the most. We don't see a lot of her throughout the series, but here she seems to more embody remorse more than anything else, saying that they didn't used to always fight, particularly missing their brother who isn't with them. Desire brings the conversation around to Morpheus's craptastic track record with relationships. How's your love life? Killed any girlfriends recently? Or sentenced any more of them to hell? He's out of line, but he's right. Morpheus walks away to cool off, death following after him. He rants at her a bit that he loved Nada, but that she defied him despite him giving her due warning. And death calls him out and says, yeah, Desire's right. Sentencing someone to endless torment because she turned him down, especially since she was correct that it's very messy and bad for one of the endless to marry a human, is total bullcrap and a crappy thing to do. And Morpheus realizes... Yeah, maybe they're right and this needs to be fixed. A very consistent thing about Morpheus' character is that he trusts Death implicitly and totally. He may argue a little bit or disagree, but she is the second oldest of them and contains far more wisdom than him. Unfortunately, that also means he has to go back to hell. And that little speech in A Hope in Hell isn't going to save him a second time. He heads out to prepare. Don't do anything stupid. I am afraid it is too late for that admonition. It's kind of my new name. Dumbass of the Endless. When she returns to the meeting, Destiny declares it's over because him returning to hell was the entire point. Bringing us to issue 22. Morpheus summons all of the inhabitants of the Dreaming to inform them of his quest. And that it might mean he's not returning. It's been two years since he was freed from Burgess's cage, and during that time, the Dreaming went south, and he wants to make sure that doesn't happen again if he doesn't return. Thing is, given how pissed off he left the Devil last time, he's probably not just gonna hand Nada over. The Endless are powerful, but they're not all powerful, especially when on someone else's turf. Hell, he will admit later that Lucifer is actually more powerful than him. Which... Eh, it doesn't seem right, but I can see them being a little more on equal footing, especially inside of Hell. If he's destroyed, then another aspect of Dream will fill my shoes. It's kind of what I meant last time. Dream is endless, but the personality we're seeing? This particular shape of him can be killed or imprisoned or harmed. In fact, we'll later learn that the despair we've seen is not the first of her kind. So yeah, we're going to hell. Hey Morpheus, some dude in power armor dropped off a big shotgun, said to take it with his compliments. Well, actually he said rip and tear over and over, but I think I got the gist of his meaning. 
Matthew says that at least he's got the element of surprise, but nope, that would not be honorable, Matthew. I was not a sportsman, Matthew. Morpheus, sorry to armchair quarterback here, but he's the devil. Who gives a rat's ass if it's honorable? But no, he sent a messenger ahead to alert Lucifer that he's coming. Said messenger is Cain, and since he's the biblical Cain, he's actually got direct protection from God himself, who I remind you is very real in the DC Universe, referred to as the Presence, despite the fact that all these other gods and pantheons are just as real. Comics are wild, kids! And thus they cannot physically harm him. Though they do scare the crap out of him after he announces that Morpheus is coming whether they let him in or not. Because this could mean Morpheus' death, he goes on a little tour of people to meet with and say goodbye to, which includes Lita and her son, and she is not happy to see him. She's doing better now since the last time we saw her, though she hasn't come up with a name for the baby yet. Once again, he sucks at this. There is much you do not understand, Hippolyta Hall. Perhaps one day we will talk further. For now, I merely wanted to see the boy. You're kind of an idiot, aren't you? <laughs> he leaves with this. By the by, his name is Daniel. There's something goofy to me about the fact that someone as extra and overdramatic as Morpheus uses the phrase, by the by. But yeah, Morpheus doesn't bother to ever sit down and talk with Lita. And I can see you've been really busy since you saw her. What with... The nothing that we saw for several issues from you at the end of the last part. Anyway, his last stop is Hob Gadling, visiting him in his dreams with a bottle of really good dream wine to inform him that he might miss their next meeting. Hob makes a toast that gives us our title drop. To absent friends, lost loves, old gods, and the season of mists. And may each and every one of us always give the devil his due. Yeah, I repeat that line to myself whenever I have to think about one more day. Lucifer rants to a terrified Cain about how less powerful demons keep trying to usurp him, but he will only admit one being to be his superior. God, of course. And he doesn't talk to him anymore. Well, you know, there's nothing stopping you from extending the olive branch, dude. You never know. Don't let pride get in the way of reconciliation. Still, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, eh, little brother killer? S certainly Lord Lucifer. Whatever you say, Lord Lucifer. We didn't say it. Milton said it. And he was blind. You saying blind people can't rule hell? He sends Cain on his way and then makes a proclamation to all the demons and damned souls of hell, informing them of Morpheus' upcoming visit, and that said visit has crystallized something that he's been thinking about for a while. After Cain returns to the dreaming, Morpheus suits up to begin his assault on hell itself. Not the weirdest Diablo armor set I've ever seen, but there you go. Anyway, in issue 23, he arrives in hell, finding the doors open for him. He enters and finds waiting for him... Nothing! Absolutely nothing! No demons, no soldiers, no damned legions, no hell spawns, no wicked beasts, no things that go bump in the night, no specters, no penitent masses, no crawling putrid things. Nothing. Even Nada is gone from her cell. Hell is empty. And while not played up for it, I'd like to think that that's the last big horror-related concept for the Sandman book, because I think one of the most terrifying ideas is to arrive at hell and find it vacant. But the answer to what happened is not terrifying. Worrying, yes, but not terrifying. Lucifer meets up with him and explains it. He quits. The devil has handed in his resignation. While he finishes all the things he needs to do to close up shop, dealing with stragglers who aren't leaving, for instance, he explains what's going on. After 10 billion years, he's tired. Originally, when all this started, he thought he was rebelling against God, but now he's starting to wonder if this was just always God's plan. If he hadn't rebelled, another would have. He's never going to be allowed to go home again, and all this time, mortals have blamed him for their own sins, when all he did was enact punishments that he was expected to deliver. Claiming that he owned their souls now, when no one can own a soul. They just refuse to live up to how they're the crappy ones. How long was he expected to deal with them all over a rebellion he doesn't even care about anymore. And now, after Morpheus announced he was coming, it gave him the impetus to finally close hell and call it off. He's decided that this is the ultimate freedom. No more fighting, no more responsibilities. That one gets Morpheus confused, given how devoted he is to his. He's gonna go off and enjoy retirement. Lay on a beach somewhere, or learn to play the piano. I mean, he's already mastered the fiddle. He's got to expand his musical repertoire. As for the denizens of hell, he sent them off. 
to Limbo, to other dimensions, back to Earth, and that includes Nada. He also recalls that he once promised to destroy Morpheus, and perhaps his final gift to Morpheus will. The key to hell, giving ownership of the realm to the Lord of Dreams, to do with as he pleases. This consequently, and as pointed out in the Hellblazer review a few episodes back, is why the Lucifer in that story can't be the same one here. Lucifer never takes back the throne in Sandman or in his spin-off series in the early 2000s. No real mention is made of the other two of the trio of demons ruling hell having an objection to this. Oh sure, we'll see Azazel soon enough, but it seems like the series is kind of retconning how powerful Lucifer is to make this easier. Seems like Azazel and Beelzebub would object to getting kicked out of hell otherwise is all. Anyway, the abdication of the throne and closing of hell is naturally going to send some ripples throughout... Well, everything. As I said, all religions are correct in the DC Universe, so we begin with Odin of Norse mythology learning what happened and deciding to do something about it. First, he heads to the cave where Loki is imprisoned with poison dripping onto his face and comes to recruit him. Why have you come here, glad of war? To gloat at my misfortune? To pass the time? No, Loki Skywalker. Ah, oh, great. First Rey and now Loki? Who isn't a Skywalker at this point? Odin wants possession of Hell. His logic is that with Ragnarok eventually approaching, they could have a place to retreat to and survive the end of them. And we'll soon see that he's not the only god with designs for Hell. Morpheus returns to the Dreaming and is overwhelmed by this. He went to Hell prepared to go to war to reclaim Nada, but now is back without her and in possession of the most prime piece of real estate from one side of existence to the other. As other forces begin preparing envoys to send to him, Dream contacts Death to ask for advice. But she's a little preoccupied. It seems that Dawn of the Dead was right. When there's no more room in Hell, the dead will walk the earth. So yeah, she has no idea what he should do, and her job just got a thousand times harder because a lot of dead people aren't staying dead. Damn it all, Lucifer, if you had just waited another year, Danny Chase could have survived! Naturally, this whole thing also gets the attention of Heaven, which dispatches two angels, Duma, Angel of Silence, and Remiel, who is set over those who rise, not to make any offers, but rather act as observers of what's to come. In Limbo, Azazel rallies the demons to a new plan. They'll take back Hell by making an offer Morpheus can't refuse. Nada. He brings Corrin's on, the demon who originally had gotten his helmet, along for the ride. Oh, and since we're on this biblical kick, there's another inhabitant of the Dreaming I should probably mention, even though she doesn't do much. Eve! The biblical one, of course. Though her appearance shifts anytime we see her. A heavyset old woman to just an old woman, and then a young woman, etc. Believe it or not! She was also a horror host! Eve of the Eden Apple from the Tree of Knowledge Eve! That Eve was a horror host! She and Destiny switched books they were hosting even! Where did this idea come from? Who approved it? Comic books are frickin' weird, people! Oh, and Matthew lives in her cave, apparently a reference to how Eve had a raven in her hosting duties named Edgar Allan. Anyway, the envoys from various pantheons arrive. Odin, Thor, and Loki, Egyptian gods Anubis and Bast, the Shinto god Susano Ono Mikoto, the demons, a representative of Lord Kilderkin, a manifestation of order, the opposite number, Shivering Jemmy, representing chaos, the two angels, and soon afterwards, in issue 26, brother and sister Clerican and Nuala of the fairies. They're all offered hospitality from Morpheus and rooms to stay the night. Uh, but let's back up for a moment to issue 25. Like with the story of Hob Gadling, for reasons I don't quite understand, we interrupt the main narrative to something unrelated. It's not as disconnected from the plot like that issue was, but it's still weird, focusing in a bit what's happening with the dead returning on Earth, but it has no impact on the overall story. It's a ghost story about a child named Charles Rowland who's stuck in a boarding school over Christmas as his father is in Kuwait, and dead students and the dead headmaster all show up to take over the place, and torture and eventually kill him. He joins up with another ghostly child, and while he's supposed to go with Death, he refuses to leave without his friend. They just run off to do their own thing, and Death is too busy with everything else going on to worry about it. Leading into some spin-off books and material known as the Dead Boy Detectives. It's good stuff, it's just weird that it's here. Maybe Moarte will talk about this one in more detail, but let's get back to the bigger plot. So all these players have gathered to feast, with Thor making an ass of himself, and make their own appeals to Morpheus. Who should get hell? 
To the Fae, they want Hell to remain closed due to a deal they had made with them a long time ago, forcing them to sacrifice nine of their number every seven years. They're also offering Nuala as a servant to sweeten the deal, because fairies are kind of dumb assholes. I mean, for crying out loud, he can conjure up beings whenever he wants. He doesn't need servants offered to him. I'd have given him, like, a gift card to a salon so he can style his hair. Or socks! When you get older, you really appreciate getting socks as a gift. Each of the representatives meets with him privately to make their offer. Odin explains his desire to have a retreat from Ragnarok, and his offer includes some DC continuity. He created a little pocket universe simulation of Ragnarok, which the Justice Society of America is currently engaged in and forever trapped. At the time, the comics presented it as the real thing. Contained there is Wesley Dodds, the Golden Age Sandman, whom Odin claims still has a fraction of his soul from the whole being imprisoned for 80 years in a glass ball thing. Huh, kind of ironic given Dodds' state at the time. Don't worry though, that'll all sort itself out later in DC continuity in the JSA book that came later, but that's a retrospective for another day. Chaos offers nothing, just a threat that there will be war if they don't get it, though later Chaos's representative will admit this was just her doing it for giggles and they have no such intentions. Still, he gets a balloon out of the deal. He got something that he was not expecting. That's how you make an interesting offer. Order offers collected dream essence they've been stealing for years for their own purposes, but Morpheus rejects that out of hand since he could have taken it at any time. Still, Order isn't a dick and says they'll plead their case from a reasonable perspective the next day. Susano Ono Mikoto says that Morpheus should just name his price and they'll give it. The Shinto gods wanting to expand their own influence as they've been assimilating other cultures' pantheons into their own, usually through symbolic avatars and altars that one wouldn't normally expect, citing King Kong, Marilyn Monroe, and Lady Liberty as now being part of them. Bast offers information that she knows where the seventh member of the Endless, the one who left and wasn't at the meeting that started all this, is, and she can tell him that. And finally, Azazel, offering not only Nada back to him, but Korinzon, presenting him as a sacrifice that he can torture forever, should he desire, after what happened with his helmet. And really, Korinzon is more there to sweeten the deal. Azazel makes it clear that he intends to consume Nada's soul and destroy anything that remains of her if he doesn't get hell. So, I guess we know whose offer shot up to the top! And honestly, it looks like the best offer on the table to me. The others were either threats or little scraps of things that he could be potentially interested in. The concern about the Fae is certainly valid, but as we saw, death is being overwhelmed due to this situation, and it can't sustain itself. Hell kinda needs to be restored unless an alternate solution can be found to the ghosts and zombies. Giving hell to the demons at least means there isn't a massive upheaval that screws over more people than it helps. Still, that brings us to issue 27 and the ultimate decision. We actually see that there are other representatives present, just not really vying to win it. Like Merlin here, they all want it. I don't. I never thought that disposing of the unwanted could be so hard. Hell, Batman could have told you that. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. He speaks to the two observing angels and comments that he's leaning towards the Fae because he feels hell serves no good purpose. But the angels soon get an incoming message from the big giant head, aka God. The message states that there has to be a hell, a place for demons and for the damned, that hell serves as heaven's reflection and shadow, defining each other. Thus, he has made the decision for Morpheus. Hell will be reopened under new management. Remiel and Duma, much to Remiel's horror. Duma, being the Angel of Silence, says nothing and just kind of accepts it with some tears, but Remiel rants and raves about how unfair and awful this is, that he never rebelled against God, but is tempted to do so now, since this will mean that he'll never be allowed back into heaven. Although that just seems like a dick move on God's part. Remiel and Duma can't just come visit once a month for a status report or something? Morpheus really has no authority over God, and, well, I suppose you could argue being the creator of everything and all, he's got a better claim on hell than the Lord of Dreams, so Morpheus surrenders the key to them. He says as much to the gathered representatives, Remiel even saying that the war between heaven and hell is over, with hell now under direct control of heaven to oversee its operations. Azazel is pissed, probably because it means that he won't have any power or authority in the new hell structure, promising Morpheus that he'll devour Nada slowly for this, but that's where the other shoe drops. Morpheus explains that he extended his hospitality and protection to everyone who came which includes Nada and Korinzon, and he will not see them hurt. Azazel says to come and get them then, renouncing his hospitality. And that, Azazel, is why you are no longer a lord of hell, because you do stupid things like that. 
As I commented earlier, starting a beef with the lord of someone else's realm on their own turf is a really bad idea, and Morpheus demonstrates that. Not only does he easily travel inside of Azazel's void to retrieve both Corinzon and Nada, but after Azazel thinks he's trapped him inside of himself, it's revealed that... Nope, Azazel is his prisoner, inside a little glass orb just as he had been. This is my home, Azazel. My place of power. This is the heart of the dreaming. Reality here conforms to my wishes. It is what I wish it to be. No more, no less. And you will make one hell of a lava lamp. Oh, it's even better. He just shoves Azazel inside a chest alongside other junk and closes it. This demonstration makes it clear to the other representatives that challenging him on this decision would be bad, so they say their farewells. Morpheus comments to the departing demons, who are all getting in line to return to hell, that he'll leave Azazel in the bottle to think about what he did, and maybe let him out eventually when his manners improve. Odin, Thor, and Loki leave, though Loki seems to act strangely, declaring that what's happening is wrong. This brings us to the epilogue, issue 28. As demons return to hell and Remiel laments his and Duma's new situation, Morpheus finally is able to talk to Nada. He apologizes to her for what she went through, and naturally an I'm sorry I was wrong is really not enough to make up for 10,000 years in hell. After slapping him and ranting at him, he briefly considers retaliating against such an act in his domain, but then again, his pride and dickishness is what got them into this situation to begin with, so he simply admits he was wrong and there's nothing else he can say. She accepts that, and even despite all this, they still love each other. But it's clear they can't be together. She doesn't want to be the queen of the dreaming any more than he wants to abdicate his responsibilities, so they have to come up with another solution for her. That solution is revealed at the end. She's being given the chance to reincarnate on Earth as a new baby, a new life to replace the one that she lost 10,000 years ago. Unfortunately, it's all gonna come flooding back to her when Morpheus drunk dials her at 3 a.m. in a few years, wanting to get back together after he goes through a painful breakup. Turns out Loki switched places with Susano Ono Makoto, Thor and Odin grabbing the Shinto god to take his place, but Morpheus knows Loki did this. Because of the extension of his hospitality, Morpheus is gonna let Loki go free, replaced with a dream image of him in the cave, while also freeing the poor god put there, but Morpheus wants something in return. And this seemingly innocuous little afterthought in the story is gonna have a massive impact down the road. As for the fairies, turns out the offer of Nuala as a servant wasn't just for keeping Hell open. She's being given to Morpheus regardless. And Morpheus can't really reject a gift from the Queen of the Fairies, despite Nuala's own feelings. Nuala, having not known that ahead of time, can't go back without pissing off Queen Titania as well, so she has to stay. Though Morpheus says she needs to remove the glamour that keeps her looking beautiful and not disheveled, as we soon see. I don't know why he cares about that. A lot of stuff in dreams are merely illusions anyway, so what does it matter what she looks like? Lucifer, for his part, is waiting for his spin-off to start up by hanging out in a beach in Australia. He meets a dude who talks about how his life hasn't been great as of late, but he still loves a god that can produce such gorgeous sunsets. After he leaves, Lucifer has to admit to God, Okay, the sunsets are pretty, dude. Good job there. And back in Hell, Remiel decides that they can reform the purpose of Hell. Make it a place of redemption instead of punishment. Problem is, he doesn't want to stop tormenting people. He thinks that torturing them will make them better people, and they'll thank him for it. And, um... No, it doesn't work like that. It, in fact, makes it so much worse when demons are torturing you endlessly, supposedly to improve you. They've basically turned hell into a saw trap. And so Destiny literally closes the book on this part of the Sandman, having technically gotten all this rolling. Season of Mists is a great storyline, exploring some fascinating ideas, expanding on the mythos of the series, while also giving some resolution and expansion of Morpheus's character. Some of the stuff in it really needed some more room to expand, and was done so in miniseries down the road, while the main intrigue and plot proceeded. Just good stuff. And we follow that up with three standalone issues exploring more of Morpheus's history, beginning with Thermidor in issue 29. As Morpheus had told Hob Gadling, he came across Joanna Constantine again when she did a job for him, and this is the story of that. In 1794, Morpheus comes to her to do a task that he can't accomplish on his own because it concerns family of his. Morpheus has a son, the Orpheus of legend, and his head is still alive even after so many centuries. Somehow the head was stolen and brought to France, 
where Constantine has to retrieve it in the midst of the French Revolution. With Orpheus's help, she succeeds, and the head brought to the island of Naxos to be watched over by a family of caretakers. And consequently, the head of Orpheus is going to play a big part in things to come. The Sandman plays the long game for a lot of these elements, setting things up for payoff later, or for spinoffs. Issue number 30, August, is mostly a philosophical discussion about the nature of rulers, fears, gods, and boundaries. It's the story of Augustus Caesar pretending to be a beggar in the Roman marketplace as he talks to a little person actor who's helping him with the disguise about why he does the things he does. The actor, Lysias, doesn't know why he does what he does, but in the end, the Roman Empire would eventually fall due to Augustus's choices, which may have been an attempt at revenge against his great uncle, Julius Caesar, for raping him when he was 16. The Sandman, a rich, imaginative fantasy epic full of awful people doing really awful things throughout history. Next up is issue 31, Three Septembers and a January, also known as How Long It'll Take for Me to Get Back on Schedule. It is 1859, and this is the story of Joshua Abraham Norton, a.k.a. Norton I, Emperor of the United States. In case you've never heard of him before, he was a real person in San Francisco in the mid-1800s who declared himself Emperor of the country. And while at first his proclamation that he was now the Emperor was printed as a joke, people decided to go along with it. Sure, he held no actual political power, but he was a local celebrity who started issuing his own currency that was accepted in a few locations, was friends with many, and he would make frequent proclamations and statements about the world and two world leaders. They tried to arrest him once, but there was a bunch of local outrage against this, pointing out that he had harmed no one, stolen from no one, and had done nothing to hurt the country, which is more than can be said of most monarchs. And it's kind of a reminder that kings and emperors and the like only have power because people allow allow them to have power. No one had to indulge him in his proclamations and declarations of being the Emperor, but they were happy to have him as such, and he wasn't an asshole about it as far as I can tell. And thus we have the Sandman issue, which tells a fictionalized, fantastical explanation for what happened with him. Despair summons Morpheus, says Norton, distraught after several failed business dealings, seems close to killing himself. Despair is a challenge for Morpheus. Norton has fallen into Despair's realm, and she wants to prove that dreams cannot redeem him. Desire and Delirium are with Despair on this. Well, Delirium is sort of with her on this. She keeps being distracted by fishes that transform into fireworks and sing Ave Maria, but, but she's there in spirit, at least. And Morpheus, coaxed into this challenge after Despair brings up their missing brother, decides to indulge them. In Norton's dreams, he bemoans that America is supposed to be a land of opportunities, but instead it's a land of chaos and confusion, lacking a king. And thus Morpheus gives him something to dream about, the dream of being a king. Norton is inspired and becomes the Emperor, who has lunch with Mark Twain, inspiring him to write a story about a frog that will make people laugh. The Emperor admits that people laugh at him sometimes, but it doesn't matter. He's still the Emperor. Delirium points out that Norton is mad and should be under her domain then, but that's not quite it. His madness keeps him sane, and Morpheus says he's not the only one where that's the case. Desire tries to tempt Norton with women and money, but Norton refuses any sort of temptation or deal along those lines. He wants for nothing. He is the Emperor, and this is his city, his country, and he is treated well. He is content to be what he is. What more than that could any man desire? Well, Queen Victoria for one. The real-life Emperor Norton sent letters to Queen Victoria suggesting the two of them get married to strengthen the bond between England and the USA. A lot of the statements from the others kind of bring back what Morpheus had said at the end of The Doll's House, that those three members of the Endless see mortals as their playthings, claiming Norton is theirs while Morpheus sees mortals as deserving their respect and that they exist in service to them. In any case, Desire frustratingly declares that they'll get back at Morpheus for this, make him spill family blood and get the kindly ones down on his head, setting up the events of the doll's house and more foreshadowing for the future. And thus, after Norton dies of a heart attack on the streets, Despair irritatedly declaring that Morpheus won, that Norton never gave in to Despair, and death takes the first Emperor of America to what lay beyond. This leads us into the next longer storyline from the book, A Game of You, and... I am very sorry to say I don't really like it all that much. It's not a favorite among others either, but apparently is Neil Gaiman's favorite. Now, I do understand why many people love it, and especially an important character we'll talk about in a bit, but it just does not resonate with me for a few reasons. 
The big one is that, much like the Element Woman issue, or issue number 25 with the Dead Boy Detectives, Morpheus is not really the main character here. He shows up, yes, and will help resolve the situation, but he really has nothing to do with what's going on. And at least number 25 was connected to the larger plot. A Game of You is the larger plot. And unfortunately, I don't find the execution that interesting, and I don't really know what I'm supposed to take away from it emotionally. Well, other than screw awful families who will dead name a trans woman on her gravestone, but that's for the final part. And some of the backstory for this storyline, an explanation of a big part of the conclusion, will not be told in The Sandman itself, but in a prequel comic released in 2013, 17 years after the main Sandman comic was over. It's otherwise not explained or hinted at what that was, except in very simplistic terms, as if it was something we were already supposed to know. But let's actually talk about it. We're reintroduced to Barbie, that woman from the doll's house who lived in the boarding house. We saw during that whole dream vortex thing that in her dreams, she was a magical princess or the like, helping fantastical creatures trying to stop a monster called the Cuckoo. But everything went to hell when Rose broke down the barriers. She's divorced Ken, moved to New York, and is not doing great. No longer able to dream, but her best friend Wanda, a trans woman who lives in the same apartment complex as her, tries to cheer her up after a restless sleep. Like in The Doll's House, we're introduced to the other tenants. A woman named Thessaly, who will be playing a big part here and in stories to come. Lesbian couple Hazel and Foxglove. And a grouchy guy named George. Also, Barbie likes to paint her face and makeup a lot, putting a chessboard on one half of it. This is a weird new entry in the Crow franchise. In the Dreaming, Morpheus senses that something is crossing from one realm of existence to another. That one of the scaries, or distant islets in the Dreaming, is beginning to die. Despite Morpheus saying it's all very interesting, he also tells Matthew he's not gonna do anything about it. They live. They die. They come and go. Why should I do anything about it? Because the best stories in The Sandman are the ones where you're proactive, doing things, providing interesting commentary about the nature of existence on mortals or stuff like that. And the worst ones are the ones where you utterly do not give a crap or are barely a cameo in your own series. Wanda takes Barbie out for coffee and food where Barbie explains how she hasn't dreamed in two years that she used to dream of being part of a mystical land and all that. During this, Wanda also mentions Bizarro World, like the Bizarro stuff in Superman mythos, but as part of a comic within the comic called Hyperman, except all of that is canon in the DC Universe, which Sandman is technically part of, but she calls the Bizarro stuff Weirdzo. And fair enough, it was just like, didn't want to draw attention to any of that continuity stuff and want to just make it a goofy reference. Except then on the next page, she refers to it as Bizarro, so was that like originally a Bizarro reference and they had to edit it but missed those last two lines? It's just weird. Point is, while Wanda discusses how her family sucks and prays for her to repent her wicked ways, one of the fantasy creatures from Barbie's dreams shows up in the street, killed by police officers as it and her recognize each other. It gives her a gemstone, the Porpentine, and tells her she needs to go back to the mystical land, called just the land, or the cuckoo will destroy them all. Wanda takes a very traumatized Barbie home and she starts remembering everything, though is confused because it's only supposed to be a dream. She even summons up a bunch of weird dream birds that then disappear, save for one that gets swallowed up by George from her building. Dude! Show some restraint! That could have lasted you like three whole meals! Also, he has a poster of Barbie on his wall because he's a creepy weirdo, declaring that the children of the cuckoo know her, leading us into issue 33. After learning that Hazel is potentially pregnant from an affair she had with a waiter a few weeks ago, Barbie drifts off to sleep and finally finds herself back in the land. The other tenants of the building fall asleep and George opens up his stomach to reveal a whole bunch of birds that are sent out to each of the people there, instilling weird nightmares, except for Thessaly, who awakens and grabs the bird. She kills it, burns it, and then goes down to have a talk with George. With a knife. Oh, and it turns out that Foxglove was the estranged girlfriend of Judy, one of the diner patrons in 24 Hours who got killed by Dr. Destiny. You know, with how expansive and big and full of huge lands and domains and regions the Sandman universe is, it's a really small world, isn't it? Barbie, meanwhile, meets up with some of the anthropomorphic animal creatures of the land and learns that to defeat the cuckoo, they need to reach the brightly shining sea, and it's a long way, so they get started and we head into issue 34. 
The Nightmare Birds poof out of existence. Hazel and Foxglove, shaken by them, but are soon met by Thessaly, who brings Wanda along to check on Barbie. They find her unconscious and holding the stone, unable to be awoken. Under Thessaly's instruction, they take her to George's room, where they find George dead in a bathtub with a knife in him. The others want to call the cops, but Thessaly makes it clear they're not doing anything she doesn't want them to. She's a witch. She cuts off George's face and nails it to a wall, using her powers to summon his soul and get some answers. George was indeed the servant of the Cuckoo, communicating with him for years in his dreams and promising him Barbie if he did as ordered. The birds were meant to consume them through their nightmares. For some reason, George wasn't able to do it himself. He doesn't know what the Cuckoo is exactly, only that it can be found in Barbie's dream. The others are willing to come to Barbie's aid, and Thessaly knows only two ways to enter said dream, either via Morpheus or through a magic spell that requires menstrual blood. She calls it the Moon's Road. She says Morpheus won't give a damn about them, either mortal women or her kind, so they go the Moon Route, inadvertently revealing Hazel's pregnancy to Foxglove. But in any case, they summon the Moon, who it turns out is pissed off for being summoned, part of some compact they had made with her kind hundreds of years ago. However, the compact also binds the moon to obey her commands. And you know how I always complain about the moon being too huge sometimes in comics for artistic effect? Well, the moon is in the living room here, and that seems a bit small for the moon. Wanda is ordered to stay behind to guard Barbie's body just in case the cuckoo sends any other agents, while Thessaly, Hazel, and Foxglove head into Barbie's dreams, bringing us to issue 35. Barbie and her entourage travel across the snowy wastes on their way to the shore, discovering a dead body clutching a scroll for her, an old ally of hers that she recalls. While taking some shelter, she reads the scroll, which has photos of her and her painted face. She explains that she didn't want anything as permanent as a tattoo, but the face painting allowed her to be a different person, every day. And that day you felt like being a chessboard. Go figure. The scroll is the weird thing, though. It's a dry, encyclopedic description of a European cuckoo bird and its habit of placing its eggs in the nests of other birds to be raised and can influence a mother bird via a commanding, hypnotic voice. It's all set up for our kinda sorta villain of the story. Morpheus, meanwhile, is informed of which scary it is that's dying by Lucian, the dream lord thinking that he thought it had collapsed a long while ago, so now, yet again, he needs to wait and see what happens. Noala admits that while under his command to watch over Barbie, he actually warned her about it, but Morpheus says she did the right thing. Well, enough of checking in with the actual main character of this book, and it having no impact on anything, let's get back to Barbie's Dreamhouse adventures. They've somehow made it to the forest, and we learned the land existed from long before Barbie arrived there. One of their number is killed by the inhabitants of the forest, but they find a safe path and reach a city. Another of their number going down to try to find help, but falls under the control of the cuckoo. Barbie getting captured and taken to the cuckoo's citadel, which is just her house from when she was young. Back in the waking world, it turns out the moon is transphobic, and that's why Wanda couldn't come along. And we'll see why that's especially bullcrap near the end, by the moon's choice and not anything else. But George's face informs her that they literally summoned the moon into the living room, which affected the tides. And that means a hurricane that was going to miss New York is now on its way. But if that's the case and the moon was literally in the living room, why doesn't gravity or any other scientific detail affect it? Why does magic only affect shrinking the moon and putting it in a small space, but not the effects of it going away for a few minutes? The cuckoo is revealed to sort of, be a child version of Barbie. It explains that Barbie just had a dull, uninteresting life as a child and made up a fantasy land populated by her toys. What the cuckoo is exactly is not really clear. She says she's Barbie's imaginary friend, but she also talks about how what she's doing is a little like possession, taking her over through her dreams and that she wants a chance to live, using her hypnotic voice to take control of Barbie and force her to consent to being destroyed so she can live. Meanwhile, Thessaly, Hazel, and Foxglove travel the moon path to the dreaming, where identity apparently blurs and all three are kind of intermingling mentally. In the pale light of the moon, I play the game of you, whoever I am whoever you are. And that's our title drop! And I guess the storyline is about identity and how we see and define ourselves, but I, I don't know. It feels like it has a lot of ideas, but they're kind of half-baked. Like, I don't know why this isn't working for me when other storylines have worked fine. I was gonna say it's because we don't really know much about the principal characters, but we actually learn quite a bit about them. And again, that whole identity thing. 
It's part and parcel with Wanda as a trans woman, Barbie liking to redefine herself through the face paint, Thessaly putting on an image of being boring and bookish while ready to casually inflict violence to defend herself and invoke very powerful, dangerous magics. Hazel and Foxglove have their own identity issues. As lesbians, as former lovers to others, as new potential parents. I get why the story connects with people, but it just does not click with me. I was thinking maybe, as I said, the problem is it needed more time to fully explore its ideas, but I, I don't know. I'm not really vibing with it already, and it's six issues. I almost feel like more time would just stretch the thin plot even thinner and just be boring. I do know the land is half-baked, relying on a lot of very basic fantasy tropes and imagery without much exploration of how it all works. Barbie at one point in the forest invoked The Hobbit with how it felt, and it really just reminded me of how much world-building Tolkien put into The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, while this fantasy realm just feels trite and basic. And it really does not help that The Sandman, the character I am reading this book for, is barely in it! The three arrive and begin hunting for the cuckoo. Hazel and Foxglove sort of make up for the whole Hazel cheating on her thing and plan to have the baby together. In the real world, Wanda goes out into the streets to rescue an old homeless woman in the storm and bring her inside. It's kind of character development. Wanda had brushed her off earlier when she was begging for money and just had been, New York is full of crazies, gotta develop a thick skin here, but now she's risking herself to help her. Thessaly and the others arrive at where the cuckoo plans to complete a ritual to escape the dreaming, but the cuckoo tricks Thessaly into killing the wrong person so she can use her hypnotic voice to control them. Bang up rescue, ladies! We're gonna call you the dream team from now on. On. In the land, Barbie destroys the jewel, and the storm gets worse in the real world. The stars fall out of the sky in the dreaming, and Morpheus finally shows up in the plot, and the cuckoo has no idea who the hell he is. He frees the others from the cuckoo's mind control and says it's time now for him to absorb the land back into himself. And he does so. All the creatures in it come marching in and get absorbed by him including creatures Barbie had never dreamt up because, as said, the land was there longer than she was. And at the end, there's a woman named Alianora, who apparently was the one that Morpheus made a compact with long ago to create the land, and then she disappears. We get nothing. No explanations, no story, no exposition about what the hell all that was or who she is. So even in a storyline which had other characters as the protagonists in place of him, they're not even the main characters, because so much of this is stuff that has nothing to do with them. Thessaly explains that she actually met Morpheus a long time ago, and she's still after her revenge on the cuckoo for the attempt on her life. But Morpheus isn't interested, since the three of them are trespassers on his domain. And her little moon summoning spell has caused a lot of problems. And we see that in action as the hurricane hits the apartment building. Back with Morpheus, one really frustrating part of reading this all back to back is that he seems to keep flip-flopping on how much of a dick he is to mortals. As Hazel keeps pointing out, they didn't know they They'd be trespassing, they were just trying to help a friend, but Morpheus is just all, I don't care, you suck. He says that he created the land as part of a compact with that Alianora woman, well he doesn't say her name specifically, but that's the actual explanation, but she died before it was fulfilled. As such, since Barbie ended the compact, she's granted a boon, whatever she wants. Barbie thinks the cuckoo is dangerous and evil, but Morpheus just says she's acting according to her own nature. Is that evil? Um, yes. Something's nature can still be evil. You literally had demons at your palace last time, and they're evil by their nature too! Morpheus says that it's Barbie's and Rose Walker's fault that the cuckoo was trapped like she is, but he doesn't really explain what's meant by that. Like, when Rose briefly shattered the barriers between their dreams, it somehow trapped her there? Why? Especially when Morpheus was supposed to have fixed that. And if he didn't, why didn't he? This is a pretty big oversight on his part considering the damage here. Anyway, the boon can be anything she wants, including killing the cuckoo, or restoring the land and everyone killed, but Barbie elects to have them all sent back home safely, allowing the cuckoo to leave peacefully too. They're all sent back to the waking world alive and safe, but the same can't be said for Wanda and the homeless woman, who were killed in the rubble. Most of the remaining issue is the really frustrating part. Barbie goes to Wanda's funeral, 
hosted by her awful, awful transphobic family who cut her hair, dress her in men's clothes, and only refer to her by her dead name and put said dead name on her tombstone. Dora, Wanda's aunt, who is supposedly the only halfway decent one who would still talk to her, is just as awful and judgmental and a piece of crap. It's a really sad, tragic, and frankly unnecessarily downbeat ending to a story that already wasn't exactly full of laughs and joy. And admittedly, this was 1992. Having a story with a trans woman played sympathetically and awesome and brave and pushing back and saying that she is a woman was powerful and important to have at that time in a popular series. But it still feels really crappy that she had to be killed off to provide some pathos for Barbie, who already had more than enough as it was. Still, Barbie is a good friend, so after the awful funeral, in an act of defiance and friendship to Wanda, uses her friend's favorite lipstick to write her real name on the tombstone. On the bus back home, Barbie dreams of Wanda, who now looks as she wanted to, and waves goodbye to Barbie as she's taken away by death. So hey, it's not totally without joy and recognition of who she is, despite what the moon or a bunch of bigots say. It's just it still required Wanda dying to achieve that effect. And if there's a moral there, I don't know what it is. Save maybe that we should take our goodbyes whenever we can. I thought the moral of the story was, don't summon the moon to your living room. So, yeah, that's really all I have to say about a game of you. I just don't really like it, though of course I don't begrudge anyone who gets a lot out of it. For me, it's just kind of confusing, unfinished, and not really what I want to have out of this series. Still, we must move on, so let's go to issue number 38. The last few we'll be talking about are once again standalone stories, beginning with The Hunt. It's okay, basically a fairy tale being told by a grandfather to his disinterested granddaughter who keeps critiquing aspects of it. So, you know, me, but a teenage girl. Vasily, a young werewolf, in the style of older werewolf tales where it was less a wolf man and more a person who literally becomes a wolf, leaves home with a sack of trinkets taken from a dead peddler on a quest to find a woman whose picture is on a locket. Said woman is apparently the Duke's daughter, and along the way, he encounters another tribe of werewolves, including a woman who manages to catch a deer before he can, and Baba Yaga, who takes him to the Duke's house to see the daughter. Along the way, he keeps encountering Lucian. It seems that among the peddler's trinkets is a book that got lost from his library, and he wants it back, offering to trade... But Vasily is only interested in the daughter, so he can offer nothing. Vasily is tricked into getting locked in a dungeon, and eventually, starving and dying, is rescued by Lucian, who finally agrees to take Vasily to the daughter via dreams. This attracts Morpheus' attention, and Lucian has to admit to the lost book issue, but he's amenable to Vasily's wishes, taking her to the sleeping woman. Is this a kissing book? No, because while he finds her beautiful, he just came to return the locket to her. Instead, he decided to hook up with the werewolf lady. The granddaughter takes the story to be an attempt at criticizing her choice of boyfriend, but he denies that, instead simply implying that he was Vasily and this was his story. I think the Princess Bride comparison is apt, and this story would have been greatly improved by the presence of Andre the Giant. Issue 39 is Soft Places, about a teenage Marco Polo lost in the desert encountering Gilbert and Rusticello de Pisa. They're in what Gilbert describes as a soft place, an area of the world where the border between dreams and reality is eroded or hasn't formed yet. Time is meaningless, hence why Marco can meet his future fellow biographer and Gilbert, who's several hundred years out from them. Eventually he meets Morpheus, just recently having escaped from Burgess, and gives him some much-needed water. At first Morpheus doesn't know if he can help Marco return to the real world and his father with as weak as he is, but after hearing him plead that he doesn't want to be trapped somewhere forever, he does what he can. It is very weak in my opinion. It's not bad, but I at least could see some value and themes in A Game of You, even if I don't think they were well executed. Soft Places just feels like nothing other than Gilbert complaining that soft places are few in number because people explored most of the world and that somehow made them disappear. We'll end today's episode with the Parliament of Rooks, returning to Lita and her son Daniel. While Lita talks with a friend on the phone about the difficulties of being a single mother, Daniel naps and enters the dreaming. There he meets Eve, Matthew, a gargoyle named Gregory, and they all attend a little tea party that Abel is hosting in the House of Secrets. We learn from Matthew that apparently Morpheus has hooked up with some woman and is spending all his time with her, though we don't learn who she is. Sort of. 
we'll be getting into that more next time. In the meantime, Daniel's hanging out with three horror hosts and storytellers, so they tell some stories. Kane comes in and his story is first, where the issue gets its name and provides a mystery. Birds known as rooks will often gather together in a field and have a single one of their number caught the rest for hours, hence Parliament of Rooks. One of two things will happen. The bird will eventually leave, or the rook cawing at them will be pecked to death by the rest. Either way, a more productive congressional session than human ones. Why they do this is the mystery. Eve tells the story of how, depending on your folklore, the biblical Adam had as many as three different wives. The first was Lilith, who was a basically a clone of Adam and insisted to be in a position of equality with him, which apparently was too much and she was expelled from Eden, in turn going off and getting together with demons. The second wife was formed from nothing and never had a name, every part of her being grown right in front of Adam, starting with bone and ending on skin and hair. But he rejected her because he watched the whole growing process and found her icky. Adam is kind of a douche. What happened to her is up for debate, some saying she left the garden while others say God destroyed her. And then came the final wife, Eve, made from his rib or his side depending on the translation. And we all know how that story went. That's right, Adam and Eve starting a fashion trend with fig leaves. And finally Abel, who tells a story about chibi versions of Death and Morpheus coming to chibi Cain and Abel, with Cain having just killed Abel, Death wants to take him, but Morpheus offers him the chance to come play in his garden and get a job telling secret stories. But he was lonely, so later Morpheus recruited Cain to come join him, and they lived happily ever after. Cain is annoyed by this and orders them all to leave, but on the way out, Abel reveals the answer to the Parliament of Rooks. It's not a meeting or anything. The lone rook in it is a storyteller, and they let the one rook live if they like the story. Kane kills him for revealing the answer because he's kind of a one-trick pony. And thus Daniel wakes up from his nap in time for Lita to get him dinner. A much cuter ending than last time. And there's still so much more to tell. We're past the halfway point of the Sandman, but there's still a lot to go over. Come back next time as we begin the search for the 7th Endless, an unusual tie-in to an event comic, and the beginning of the end for the Lord of Dreams. Number 4. Retrospective Ruined From What Dreams May Come Part 2, The Sandman Number 21 to 40. So as I mentioned at the start, one of the big things I did in 2023 was my Sandman retrospective, covering all 75 issues of the comic. Some agreed with me on parts of it, some firmly disagreed, and there was a lot of lively discussion and interesting things brought up. However, there was also a very notable absence that many people were confused by the longer the retrospective went. Where the hell is the Song of Orpheus? Printed in The Sandman Special Number 1, The Song of Orpheus is the tale of Morpheus' son, the mythological Orpheus, and how he ventured into the underworld to try to retrieve his beloved. However, as per the myth, he was not allowed to look behind himself as he left, lest he lose her forever. And as per the myth, he looks and she is sent back. A lot of people were wondering why the hell I didn't cover it. It's not the essential story of the series, but Orpheus and his relationship to his father is kind of a big deal, since that leads directly into the final arc. Plus, it explains why he's just an immortal head now, which I think most people would be curious about. There are a couple of reasons for this. One is the reason I gave to most people who asked about it. The retrospective was only covering the main series. As I said in those videos, I had originally planned to look at all the miniseries and spin-offs in the final part, until I discovered the sheer breadth of stuff that came out of the Sandman. Enough for its own massive retrospective or two, so I stuck to the 75 issues. The second reason... The more embarrassing reason is that I just plum forgot that the story was told in a special and not in the main series itself. I first read Sandman in trade paperbacks, and of course my collection of the series is in trades and not individual issues. And it got included in a trade, but I don't really pay attention to issue numbering when reading a trade collection, thus it never occurred to me that it might not have been in the main series. By the time I realized this, the retrospective had grown so long, and I was just struggling to get it done when it's four episodes that are about an hour or longer each. So yeah, this is on me. It should have been in part two based on when it was published, so I'm sorry about leaving it out. Maybe I'll give it its own review sometime in the future for, like, the 20th anniversary of the show or something. For now, though, I'm sorry for the omission. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. It's time for part three of the Sandman retrospective, and we're past the halfway point of this incredible series.
When we last left off, the Devil had decided it was time for a career change and left Hell in the care of Morpheus, leading to several interested parties trying to buy it off of him. Until God stepped in and decided to exercise his right of, actually this is mine and I'm leaving these two angels in charge instead. Along with several standalones and interesting bits of history involving the Endless, we had a storyline featuring a mystical fantasy land and some kind of weird dream cuckoo bird, alongside a lot of transphobia. Not from any of the characters we like, mind you, but still. Creating a story that just felt, well, not quite finished. But hey, it's really hard to have a bad issue of this series, so it certainly wasn't awful. But let's dig into The Sandman, number 41 to 60, and see if we can pick things up a bit. Issue 41 begins a long storyline and another good one. Brief Lives. After we check in with the head of Orpheus, still alive and being taken care of by a family that watches over him, even has a tombstone to Johanna Constantine, we see that Delirium is kind of just drifting through the world, hanging out with beggars. She's reminded that her brother, the seventh member of the Endless we haven't met yet, is currently lost. Naturally, she decides to look for him in the most natural of places, a sex club. She rambles to herself that she wants her family back, mistaking a goth girl for death, the Ankh necklace doesn't help, until she's eventually found by Desire. And if it wasn't evident by now, Desire's kind of an asshole, telling a woman who hits on them to go through an elaborate sequence of seducing another woman until she's so desperate for her affection that it leads to anger and obsession. Because I guess they want the emotion to just be as extreme as possible, no matter who gets hurt. Douche sire. Desire takes Delirium away to their realm, but all Delirium can ramble about is how much she wants their brother back. Desire says they don't care about him coming back and discourages her from pursuing this, but Delirium gets a good laugh at that. Well, you, telling me not to want something. I mean, that's all you are, wanting. I mean, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Isn't it funny? Well, isn't it? I mean, it's not ha-ha funny, but it's amusing, I'll give you that. Since Desire won't help her, Delirium goes to see Despair, trying to get her to help her track down their brother. However, it seems Despair has moved on from her own wanting of him back, not caring if their brother is hurt or anything like that. As such, she decides she'll try Morpheus next, though both she and Despair know he won't help. We get some insight into Despair and her realm after Delirium leaves. She has windows that she can use to observe people who have fallen to her. People in pain, consumed by regrets and their overwhelming dread. She also self-harms as a distraction from her other emotions, as is demonstrated when she remembers her brother, allowing us to finally, briefly meet the final member of the Endless, Destruction. In 1665, the bubonic plague was ravaging a town, people dead or dying, some just from the despair of their situation, something of course the namesake of the Endless approved of. She meets Destruction as he watches things unfold too. However, he admits that things are changing. Despair denies that. Some things are changeless. People love and die, they dream, destroy, despair, go mad. They fulfill their destinies, live out the course of their lives. We fulfill our function as they fulfill theirs. True, but there are also a bunch of periods where they're just bored. Where's the endless when you're just sitting on your couch, lazily eating potato chips and flipping through channels? Despite all that, Destruction keeps a chipper attitude and compliments Despair, wishing her well and says her face is pretty. Thirty years later, in Destiny's Hall, Destruction would leave his responsibilities behind. Like Lucifer, he just quit. And as we established with Dream's imprisonment, while there might be a hiccup in existence if one of the Endless isn't around to do their job, ultimately the world keeps turning. Destruction not being around doesn't mean that things don't get destroyed. But whatever, let's move on to issue 42. Say, remember how in issue 40, Morpheus apparently started a relationship with somebody off-panel? Well, it took him a grand total of two issues for that relationship to drop off, as this woman has left the Dreaming and returned to Earth. Morpheus melancholically declaring that she no longer loves him. Dude, have you considered that perhaps the problem is you keep moving way too fast with your relationships? You barely knew Nada before asking to marry her. You had a kid with Calliope. This woman moved in with you almost immediately. Do you even just, like, actually go on dates? 
With Mystery Woman gone, Morpheus decides to let it rain for a while in the Dreaming, while ordering Lucian to erase the suite of rooms made for her. I would appreciate it if the palace staff would be so kind as to refrain from mentioning her in the future when in my presence. Very good lord. No one ever really knew her name anyway, so it won't be hard. This is where we're formally introduced to another member of the Dreaming, Merv Pumpkinhead. He's another former horror host! No, he isn't. I was just kidding. But would you have been surprised if he had been? No, he's an original creation. Not a huge character, but he's around and basically a janitor, construction worker, and gardener in the Dreaming. He's got a working class, blue collar kind of New Yorker accent and attitude. Not really a major player in the series, but he's there and has shown up in a few background shots up to now. After a week of letting the rain go on and flooding parts of the Dreaming, Morpheus just doesn't get why she no longer loved him. Delirium shows up soon afterwards, and it's clear she's very disturbed and worried about what Morpheus will say to her because of past experiences, but he tells her that if he's been rude or behaved badly, he apologizes. She admits it's very different of him to be apologizing, and then explains how she thinks they should go find destruction. Morpheus contacts Desire and asks them if they put her up to this, as well as inquiring if they are responsible for his recent breakup, and Desire confirms that they didn't either, swearing on something that was apparently sacred to both of them. So why don't you go back to your gallery, tell the little Gleet to go buzz off and bother someone else so you can get back to feeling sorry for yourself? You'd think someone all about Desire would be feeling bad that Morpheus lost someone desiring him. As Delirium waits, we see her recall how she was once Delight. That, the moment she realized what was happening, that the universe was changing, that she was growing older, she was no longer Delight. You can't delight in things as you get older. Sucks, but them's the facts. She went to meet Destruction over this, and he just reassured her that it was okay that things are changing, and there was nothing they could do about it. That reassurance to her was important. When Morpheus returns, she admits that if he says no, she'll ask Death and Destiny for their help, but if they don't accept, she'll go on her own after him. She's just worried that in her state, she can get easily distracted, and she can have really bad days. But no, Morpheus has decided to come with her, informing Lucian to make arrangements with a being on Earth named Pharamond who can provide transportation. He admits to Lucian privately that he doubts they'll find destruction, but it'll provide a nice distraction from his recent romantic woes. Plus give the Dreaming a chance to drain the water and run some dehumidifiers to clean things up. Going into issue 43, we learn that there are people who are truly, truly old. Not immortal like, say, Vandal Savage, but have been around just as long, if not longer. We meet someone not that old, but going on 15,000 years, Bernie Capax, who does finally get killed in a construction accident. He's sad that that's what finally did him in, but at least he had a pretty good life for that time. Death reassures him that he got what anybody gets. A lifetime. Fair enough, Death, but some lifetimes are not as fulfilling as others when it's not really a solid unit of measurement. Anyway, since Morpheus and Delirium are traveling in the waking world, they're trying to be at least a little inconspicuous. Thus, they need to arrange human transportation, where this Pharamond guy comes in, now named to Mr. Farrell and in charge of a large travel company. After some shenanigans where the receptionist keeps refusing to let him talk to Farrell because of how busy he is, a series of disasters for his chauffeurs and agents that makes a lot more sense in hindsight, he finally goes to talk to Morpheus. Delirium, in the meantime, has been spontaneously creating little frogs. You think death comes for the little frogs? Like, did Delirium create life, or are they just illusions? Delirium made up a list of some of Destruction's old friends, people who may have some clues to his current whereabouts. The lawyer is at the top of the list, and that was the late Mr. Bernie Capax, though Morpheus doesn't know of his current deadness. Another on the list, Etain of the Second Look, we soon see as she narrowly manages to avoid getting blown up in her apartment from a gas leak of some kind. We cut over to... Destruction, surprisingly enough. Sure, he's missing his beard, but it's very clear by his hair color and happy demeanor that it's him as he makes a painting. He asks his talking dog friend Barnabas. Of course, Destruction's best friend is a talking dog. Why wouldn't it be? What he thinks of the painting. Honestly? Well, the perspective shot to hell, the colors could be better chosen, and the olive tree on the left looks like an overgrown stinging nettle. Okay, Barnabas, as someone who made an attempt at Bob Ross-style oil paintings in 2021, his art looks great. I don't know what you're talking about. 
In his gallery, the place where he could talk with the other members of the Endless, there's a big pool of water that acts as an early warning system that lets him know about trouble approaching, and it's going crazy. Back over to Morpheus and Delirium on an airplane, we learn that Pharaoh used to be a god in Babylon, but he was getting less and less worshippers as time went on, and Morpheus advised him to change career paths. Thus, he's been in travel ever since. Oh, I didn't know you could stop being a god. You can stop being anything. What about our, um, our brother? Morpheus face palms at that. As I feel I've highlighted throughout this entire retrospective, the concept of change, particularly personal change, is at the heart of this entire series. And it's funny, despite being the prince of stories, which are frequently altered through retellings, remakes, editing, and re-releases, Morpheus seems the most resistant to anything changing. Also, I hate you, 1992. I know this is probably first class, but that seems like a hell of a lot of chair room even for that. After Dream has a conversation with a little girl about how you can get lost in dreams, the two meet their chauffeur and handler for their trip, Ruby. She manages to get them to their car without dealing with customs or immigration, and is of course confused by their lack of baggage. But while she's curious about the two, knows enough not to inquire any further on who they are. And Morpheus may not like change, but he also has his own sense of style, as they've arranged a classic car to drive for their trip, bringing us to issue 44. After an opening where the Alderman, the second name on the list, senses approaching death and decides to transform himself into a bear, as you do when death is approaching, Morpheus and Delirium arrive at K-Pax's house, only to discover that he's dead, his wife and son not doing so well after this. The son especially. He came back from college, assumed his dad was the most boring man on earth, but has gone through all his stuff in the basement office and discovered passports, fake identities, gold Krugerrands, weird powders that he assumes are drugs, etc. He has no idea what to do with any of this and is just in bad shape over this... Well, revelation is not the right word, because he has absolutely no idea what to make of his father now. Morpheus being Morpheus, he is no help whatsoever in comforting this guy, and just leaves. To further his trend of not understanding people, when Ruby explains that their next stop is 14 hours away, and they're gonna need to stop at a motel at some point to sleep and shower, he's just confused by the concept. It is a really annoying, inconsistent thing about the character, because he obviously does understand a lot of human concepts and feelings, Yet then in the next storyline will act completely baffled about human things or people being upset about stuff. You can't chalk it all up to him being something beyond human because he interacts with humans all the time, especially in their dreams. And while we laugh about dreams oftentimes making no sense, dreams frequently feature the familiar in them just as much. We have mundane nothing dreams all the time. I've dreamed of walking in a parking lot and then tripping and falling, which will often wake me up. There's nothing weird about that, it's just a thing that can and has happened, but Morpheus is the kind of guy in some issues who'd be like, how can you trip? Why not just float, mortal? After stopping in the motel, we learn quite a bit about Ruby and her hopes and dreams for the future. And it won't mean diddly in a bit. But first, delirium. After summoning up some animals via soap bubbles, she lets herself be lost in the meaning of the list, trying to locate the people she's written down. Capax is indeed dead, Itain has taken refuge somewhere, the Alderman is a bear, but she does manage to make contact with the Dancing Woman, who's currently working at a strip club. Morpheus, in the meantime, contacts Lucian to check in and see how things are going. Everything's fine, and while Morpheus expresses again that he has no desire to actually find his brother, he does realize that it's a hell of a coincidence that the first person they were looking for, an immortal no less, should just happen to die the day before they come to talk to him. As such, he wants to know if someone is actively trying to stop them for some reason. After the call, Morpheus is a flashback to meeting destruction hundreds of years ago while on a walk with the Corinthian. He also demonstrates how the Corinthian kind of sucks at his whole nightmarish reflection of humanity thing because Morpheus is so much better at it. A guy tries to pickpocket his ruby and he tells him that he's going to make him dream every night of a hangman's noose around him. You could simply have taken it back from him. You did not need to do that. Morpheus, prince of pants crapping. Destruction talks about how humanity is trying to move on from superstition and religion into reason and science, but he's not seeing it as anything positive. Destruction's point in the Endless is that to build something new and better, something old must be torn down and destroyed. The past giving way to a new and better future. But he's feeling like it's not really improving, just changing. He's gone through the same cycle again and again. Bear in mind, he's not just destruction on Earth, but in all realities. It all follows the same path. 
flames that destroy everything. Meanwhile, the Corinthian eats the eyeballs of a caveman that was being dissected. Without any seasoning or anything? Ugh, you are a nightmare. And then Morpheus wakes up from his flashback to find the entire hotel on fire, with firefighters trying to get him to move. Their best guess on what started the fire was Ruby falling asleep in bed while smoking a cigarette. And thus learning her backstory and whatnot was... kinda pointless. Except for a critique I'll have of the storyline later. Morpheus meets Delirium in the parking lot and explains that they're responsible for Ruby's death since she was only doing this to help them. What's more, it's too big a coincidence that both K-Pax and Ruby died while they were on this quest. Delirium just takes this to mean that she gets to drive the car! Oh hey, there's still some delight left in her! Always finding that silver lining. And heading into issue 45, yup, she's doing just that, leading the cops on a chase. Why is that car making that noise? Woo-hoop, woo-wee-hoop, and flashing its lights at us. I have no idea. Perhaps the driver wishes to talk with you. Prince of stories, except for any that feature the police, I guess. They stop for the cop, but after he yells at them and wants to see her driver's license, Delirium makes him think there are invisible insects all over him for the rest of his life. In a parallel to what happened in the past, Morpheus asks her if that was necessary, and she gives mostly the same response he did to destruction. It's clear that our hero has changed since then, even if he doesn't realize it. Still, Morpheus doesn't want to just poof over to the next target due to them starting this in the waking world and wanting to finish it there. As such, Delirium needs some driving help. He summons Matthew for that, and he has a difficult time explaining to her how she needs to drive on the right. Okay, Matthew, to be fair, they were in England before coming here. They finally arrive at the strip club where the dancing woman, Ishtar, works. We've been seeing bits of insight into her life alongside a friend of hers, and how she's mostly okay with where she is now. She used to be the actual goddess Ishtar. It's not terrible, and we get a complete picture of her life and who she is now, but I don't know, much like a game of you, it feels like we're getting a lot dumped about a character who doesn't actually end up mattering much to the overall plot. It admittedly does give us some more insight into Morpheus, who disapproved of her and Destruction's relationship, turns out the two used to date, and arguably she can be seen as a metaphor about the nature of change. She explains later that gods and goddesses come from dreams, move into mortal lands, are worshipped and gain power, but eventually they lose supporters and return to dreams and whatever lies beyond. And while she seems to be fine, a discussion of love and how she only truly loved destruction, all her other relationships failed, seems to indicate that she is most definitely not fine, and uses the opportunity to dance, really dance, and in the process destroy the strip club and everyone in there. None of this is bad, I just admit it feels a bit weak and not really helping the overall plot. But hey, one of the great things about The Sandman is that, even with my complaints about part of it, it feels like all the characters have rich lives. They're fully developed people. Even in A Game of You, while I felt the thematic and story elements overall just weren't coming together, all the characters felt alive and not just minor background elements. They were fully fleshed out, even if in very basic ways. And that's one of the best strengths of this series. Anyway, point is that it's clear Morpheus's patience for this whole thing has reached a breaking point, since he just uses his illusion casting ability to walk into the strip club and talk to Ishtar, past the manager and guards, instead of trying to blend in. Ishtar has no idea where destruction is, and he warns her that she may be in danger given everything else that's happened. But as demonstrated, she's just sad and put off by this whole experience, and makes things go kablammo. Which seems like a dick move for all the innocent people there, but there's plenty of asshole behavior to go around. Case in point, Morpheus! In issue 46, he tells Delirium that they're giving up the search. He's decided that all they've done is bring death and damage to the people they seek, and he refuses to let that keep happening. Delirium, disheartened, returns to her own realm, where it's very clear she's lonely and one of the company, believing that none want her. Morpheus informs Farrell about Ruby's death and where they can pick up the car. However, it seems he's not quite ready to totally give up the search. He recalls that the goddess Bast had offered him information on Destruction's whereabouts back in Season of Mists, so travels in dreams to talk to her. She had admits she doesn't actually know where he is, but knew of his whereabouts 60 years ago, being in Paris. She does say that he needs to consult an oracle to find him. Morpheus says that no oracle can find members of his family, but then recalls that there is one that could and ends the dream. I feel like Bast kind of illustrates the point a bit better than Ishtar, though really it's about them all repeating the theme. She has few, if any, followers left thousands of years later, and thus she's not really as powerful as she once was. It's where the title of the storyline comes from. 
Even the gods lead brief lives. Thousands of years might seem like a lot, but when you're in your twilight years, does it really feel like it's still that long? I mean, except for Hob Gadling, that dude's still partying like it's 1699. Lucian informs Morpheus that something has happened in his gallery. Delirium's portrait, which he uses to communicate with her if he should so desire, has gone black. He summons Death to him, who's pissed because she blames him for whatever has caused her to close off her realm. She tells him that he has to go talk to her, that he's the one that put her in this mood and he's the one that'll get her out. She also accuses him of taking out his frustration about his recent failed romance on her. And she's kind of correct there. He ventures into the surreal realm of delirium and actually finds his way to where she is pretty quickly. He apologizes for what he did by sending her away and admits that he was kind of moving through the waking world as an excuse to try to run into his ex, the one that recently left him. Ah, don't be too hard on yourself, Morpheus. You're not the first guy who hoped to run into his ex and somehow work things out with them. At least you admit it was wrong. He says he really does like her and wants to resume the hunt, leading us into issue 47. During all this, Destruction has continued his artistic endeavors, and now is taking up cooking, thinking that it's a form of art as well. Barnabas is doubtful of his chances, especially since his last effort, a marble statue, didn't exactly go great. I really hope this isn't the only thing he's been doing for 300 years. Artistic skill does take time to develop, and I would have thought he'd have made some progress in that time. Oh god, Destruction's gonna get into AI art, isn't he? With the list of names not working, Morpheus decides their next best chance is to just go ask Destiny, since he knows everything. Destiny's realm is entered through mazes, the narration saying that all labyrinths are in fact the same one, and you just need to find the center. Unfortunately, along the way, you tend to run into minotaurs and the frozen body of Jack Torrance. Eventually, they make it to the center, a timeless place full of shadows of the past and future, but that's not what's important here. They reach Destiny, who advises them to abandon this quest, but Morpheus says that he can't. He does apologize to Morpheus, though, and I suspect I know why. The actions that follow this will eventually lead to the end of the book, but we'll be getting to that later. He also tells him this. She does not love you, and truly, she never did. She will not change her mind, no matter how long nor how deeply you wish that this were the case. You will see her but one more time, long after all this is over. And the outcome of that meeting will not be satisfactory for either of you. Every party needs a pooper, that's why they invited you. Destiny tells him the same thing that Bass did, that he needs an oracle. And there is one in the family. Delirium collects herself enough to tell Destiny off as Morpheus collapses knowing what he has to do. You know why I stopped being delight, my brother? I do. There are things not in your book. There are paths outside this garden. You would do well to remember that. It is refreshing to see you so collected. Stick it! Coins have two sides. Destruction told us that when he told us he was leaving. But I knew it already. You did too. If Morpheus is defined by his sense of duty and responsibility, then Destiny is ten times that. He knows exactly what will happen, but feels bound by it. It simply is because that's what he is and what he knows. The idea of breaking that, of doing something completely different than what's defined in the book, is completely alien and incomprehensible to him, even though he knows that he could do it. But like Morpheus, he's finding it difficult to change. Morpheus pulls himself together, relenting on what he has to do, and they head out. Destiny flips through his pages, the totality of experience of the future and past. He sees the meeting where Destruction declared that he would be leaving. He sees Morpheus returning from a distant galaxy in triumph over some occasion, outlined in the prequel I've mentioned before, Sandman Overtures, right before he's imprisoned by Burgess, death befriending a mortal in China during one of her days as a human. The future, where the King of Dreams is now in white and there's blood on the throne, a reborn Corinthian also there, but he finally settles on a particular passage to read. When Morpheus and Delirium arrive on the island where the head of his son, Orpheus, is guarded. The guards eventually let him pass and Delirium apologizes for what he has to do. Off panel, he speaks to Orpheus and now knows where Destruction is. And thus they head out and meet Destruction, who's waiting for them. And you, my brother, you also seem different. Perhaps you too have grown. It is not likely. I don't know, John D might disagree with you there, dude. 
He's prepared a feast for the two, bringing us to issue 48. Delirium recounts their entire journey to destruction in her own unique way, her hair and demeanor changing the whole way through. They talk about the family, how it was hard on them when the first despair was destroyed and the new one took up the spot. Destruction says that's why he chose to do this the way he did. Not just die, but abandon his post. Otherwise, some other aspect of him would have taken the job and been stuck in the same position he was. Delirium said that everything was nicer with him around, but he's made his decision, and he can live with them being slightly unhappier. Morpheus admits that he originally went on this quest because Delirium wanted company on the trip, but it became a matter of honor for Ruby's sake. She died because they went looking for him, and it seemed wrong to have her death mean nothing. 300 years ago, you would have told me that she was simply mortal, and would have died later had she not died then. I doubt I have changed that much. I suppose I had vaguely hoped that you had changed, my brother. That you'd noticed that there were other people in the world. That you had begun to see people as other than things that dream, as creatures of stories. Or at least that you had finally figured out what the police are. There's that word again. What does it mean? Is it those things with the flashing lights on top of it? Or is it what those women in the strip club were doing? Morpheus is kind of annoyed by that remark, but it's not unwarranted as we've seen, that he takes his responsibility seriously and doesn't appreciate Destruction commenting on that when he abandoned his. Destruction admits that his realm is still around after a fashion. After all, things still get destroyed and created, things still get torn down and rebuilt. The difference is that it's not his responsibility anymore, it's in the hands of the mortals. And consequently, it's not his fault. He's only been on this island for a few years now, otherwise the last 300 he's been all around just doing stuff. Being an artist in places, helping to build a cathedral, spent a decade helping dig the Panama Canal, but he also admits that what was being done to all his friends and to Ruby, those were automatic safeguards he had set up in case anyone came looking for him. He only could have stopped them if he had resumed his duties and, well, he wasn't gonna do that. But the people who were hurt, some of them had been your friends. douche destruction. Outside, he remarks on how stars give the illusion of permanence. He can pretend that things last longer than moments, but gods come and gods go, mortals live and die, and everything is transient. But it's nice to pretend. He recounts how he spoke to death once while they were looking at the stars, and despite his nature as one of the endless, he felt tiny and insignificant. Death told him that everyone is actually capable of knowing everything, just like Destiny does. It's just people pretend they can't to make life more bearable. It's a fair point. If I knew everything, that would mean I knew everything about Marvel. And there are some things that man is not prepared to know. The Endless to him don't need their responsibilities. They're just ideas and patterns and motifs, echoes of darkness and nothing more. They have no right to play with the lives of mortals. Destruction is needed since nothing new can exist without destroying the old, but it goes on without him. So he's gonna live his own life. Even the Endless are not endless. They'll only exist as long as the current universe exists. And certainly not their individual aspects, which can indeed be harmed and come to an end. Destruction plans to leave again since he doesn't want to be found by them in the future. Life, like time, is a journey through darkness. So pack a flashlight. Morpheus, according to everyone else, blamed himself for Destruction leaving, though he keeps denying that, and we can't know for certain why he would think that. Still, Destruction tells him not to blame himself, and as a gift to Delirium, has Barnabas go with her. Just as well, he kept being kind of a dick about his artwork. Constructive criticism is one thing, but you probably should find a dog that's a bit more supportive of your efforts, man. He also tells Dream that if he sees Ishtar again, to give her his love. Why don't you go do it, dude? You're a free agent now. Go nuts. Also, didn't you say she met her end? Whatever. He floats off into space. And now Morpheus has a very important job to do. He has to kill his son. Jeez, Morpheus, did you learn nothing from this trip? It's all work with you. Issue 49 and the conclusion of Brief Lives. Morpheus returns to Orpheus's island to speak with him. He says that Calliope came to visit him last year, telling of how Morpheus freed her. You have changed since the old days. I doubt it. Take note of the fact that everyone keeps telling him that he's changed, yet he denies it. Morpheus does not want to accept that he's changed, because to change would mean that not everything is as immutable as he wants it to be. If things are more than just what they are, then maybe he doesn't need to have his responsibilities. 
Maybe destruction was right. Maybe he can have things he'd like. But at the same time, that would mean that he's wasted so much of himself. So much time and effort and pain and hardship to hold on to something that he doesn't need to. But anyway, disembodied head! You asked for a boon, Orpheus. I can grant it. My nose has been itchy for 500 years, father! Please help me! No, the boon is for him to finally die. I would have asked for a new body, but sure, just have your dad kill you. That works too. Apparently he asked for this a long time ago, but Morpheus had refused, saying that his life and death were his own, and that they'd never meet again. Orpheus wishes things had been different between them, and that he's ready. And thus Morpheus kisses him on the forehead and... does something to him. The silhouette seems to indicate he shoved his hand in his forehead, and said hand is now bloody, but like... Did he just phase through and squeeze his brain or something? For all we know, he could have put his hand in his neck and operated his head like a puppet. Either way, Orpheus is dead. Morpheus says it's what he wanted and that he's truly been dead since the Sisters of the Frenzy tore his body to shreds. Despair comes by to visit, no doubt sensing Morpheus' own emotions right now, but she's really more concerned with how destruction was. She likes that he spoke fondly of her. He wasn't wearing his beard anymore, either. I liked the beard. Listen, he probably originally thought it was part of his responsibilities too, and was just happy he didn't have to deal with the itchy thing anymore. Is nothing ever good enough for you people? The three depart back to their own realms, despair meeting with desire. They admit that they had been trying to get Morpheus to spill family blood for a long time, even swore an oath to do it, but now they don't feel triumphant, just scared. Morpheus contacts the family who had watched over Orpheus and tells them that their responsibilities are over. Bury the head somewhere unmarked and they may do as they wish. From there, he acts a little strangely, telling the guards of his palace that he appreciates them, asking Nuala the fairy if she's doing okay, then retires to his study with Lucian. He tells Lucian he doesn't want to be disturbed, but he needs to arrange a few things. Rewards for those who helped him on his journey, a message for Ishtar before she goes beyond his power, and to inform the others from Delirium's list that they're safe to return from wherever they went. Tomorrow he can begin his work again, but for today... He retires to his room and puts on some casual clothes to sit in a chair and grieve. Dude, I totally relate. Order up some ice cream, queue up some episodes of Bluey, you need the day to yourself now. We end by checking in on everyone who's mortal and involved with this whole affair, however briefly in their lives we saw them. And with life itself, some are tragic, some are hopeful. Brief Lives is, ironically, probably longer than it needs to be. Still, in those nine issues, we get a lot of interesting ideas about the nature of mortality, of change, of gods, and the people who are likened to gods. Like with a lot of the Sandman, it ends up being more philosophical than anything else. Sure, there's violence, but situations are not resolved with violence. There's no angry confrontation with destruction, no bitterness or thrown glasses or anything like that. Destruction is pleasant and nice and has decided to separate himself from his family to make his own way. He loves them, but he can't be with them anymore because they're just a constant reminder of what he decided to leave behind. But let's move on to issue 50, the two-thirds marker of the series. It's a standalone one called Ramadan, and a good one. It's just I wouldn't have made it the 50th issue. I've said this before, but I feel like big milestone issues like that should be massive celebrations of a book. Things that reflect on stories past, some new information dropped, maybe looking to the future, but that's just me. Long story short, it's about the Caliph of Baghdad, Harun al-Rashid, observing the prosperity and magical beauty of the city, home to not only all-too-human greatness from various strata and professions, but also the fantastical, like animals that speak, and robots and anthropomorphic creatures, realizing that the glories of his city will eventually be lost. He's seen the ruins of ancient cities buried in the sand, and knows the same will likely befall his someday. As such, he manages to contact Morpheus and begs for the city in its greatness to be forever preserved in a dream. Morpheus agrees, and indeed, that version of Baghdad is kept in a glass bottle that he takes back to the Dreaming, to be preserved for as long as humanity walks the Earth. Of course, that also means that the Baghdad that comes out of it is not as great in that time period, and consequently it will suffer immense damage, as is told to a child in the closing pages. It's important to remember context here. This came out not too long after the first Gulf War, in a conflict that many believed America had no business being in, and many more who were very happy to be in it. 
And regardless of the war itself, Baghdad as a city is 1,200 years old. There's a ton of history there that's been damaged or destroyed over the centuries, and particularly in modern war situations. So it's a nice fantasy to believe that the city at its height could be preserved in some way. Otherwise, it being the 50th issue, they include some cool original artwork for the series as a bonus from various creators, including sexy Morpheus and Bast fan art. Damn, must be a cold night in the desert there with them dream nipples. I'll take phrases I never thought I'd say when I started doing this job 15 years ago for 200. You know, it's been a while since we had any major connection to DC lore in this book. Sure, Vertigo was a thing by now, but this book is still pretty firmly entrenched in DC continuity, right? What was going on with DC at the time? The countdown has begun. The countdown to zero hour! Yep, zero hour crisis in time was happening, and I suggest you go watch my videos on that from a few years ago if you've forgotten what happened there. And while Zero Hour and the players in it aren't specifically mentioned by name in the storyline, it's very easy to see this next storyline, World's End, as a tie-in to it. Part of Zero Hour's plot involved alternate timelines seeping into the main one, an amalgamation of possibilities, both good and bad, converging and needing to stop Parallax and Extant from erasing the universe to create their own. It was a storm of different realities. And that's what we've got going on here. But let's back up and get things going in issue 51. A man crashes his car at night from a combination of being tired, a strange creature appearing on the road, and a freak snowstorm suddenly coming up out of nowhere in June. Seeking help for the woman who is his passenger, the man, Brant, hears a voice calling out to him to come to a nearby inn, but he has to be sure it's there, though, or else it won't appear. Can't be good for revenue if your business plan is dependent on absolute certainty about the presence of a building in the middle of nowhere. He eventually makes his way with the woman, Charlene, to the World's End Inn, where the inhabitants, including several people from different time periods and various fantasy creatures like a centaur who acts as a surgeon, he uses an outdated term for it, which is a nice touch, they explain to him that they're all trapped there at the inn for the time being. The snowstorm isn't really a snowstorm. It's a reality storm, but we don't get into that for now. Brant passes out and wakes up to find Charlene mostly recovered and passing the time with the inn patrons. And what else would they be passing the time with but stories? Which is what the meat of World's End is, an anthology of the inn patrons telling various stories. It makes me wonder if this was the inspiration for the 2008 House of Mystery ongoing series, which featured some recurring characters trapped in the titular house while patrons paid for their drinks at the bar with stories, making it both an anthology and a serialized story. You'd think, given that I tend to prefer the Sandman issues that are more about the overall plot than the Dunnan ones, that I dislike this, but honestly, I can't help but be charmed by the presentation. I like anthologies. I've made multiple videos before about my love of horror anthologies in particular. World's End may not be my favorite of the series, but it's still a part of it, and they have some very imaginative work here. Beginning with this one, A Tale of Two Cities about a man who leads a dull life in an office job, but loves to lose himself in exploring his city, until one day he boards a mysterious train, spots Morpheus just chilling on it. God damn it, Pharaoh, I know it cost you a fortune to get that old car back, but I feel like forcing me to take a train on my next trip is just petty. And ends up in a twisted version of the city, with stuff that seems familiar, but nothing really looks right. He learns that perhaps this is what a city dreams of, and that kind of nightmarish quality to it is presented very well in this book. Though he eventually moves out to the country for fear of one thing. What happens if the city wakes up? If it's anything like me, groggily stroll over to my computer at 3 in the afternoon and see what's up on Twitter. In issue 52, we get Clarican's tale, reuniting us with the fairy whom we last saw presenting Nuala as a gift from the Queen of the Fae to Morpheus. He recounts how he was sent to disrupt a potential alliance between several villages and lands in a nearby kingdom. The ruler, who through legal chicanery has become both the religious leader and the political leader, is a rude, greedy, power-hungry piece of crap. When Clarican says the wrong thing, the ruler has him locked up in cold iron chains, which the Fae have no power against, and could potentially leave him to rot. Fortunately, Clarican ends up visiting Nuala in the dreaming as he sleeps and tells her of his predicament. She petitions Morpheus to help, and he's an accommodating sort, so for her sake, helps him escape the iron. In turn, he uses his Fae abilities to foment a rebellion, then prepares to privately assassinate the ruler, 
only for the previous ruler to rise from his grave and kill him instead. Yeah, that's politics for ya. The next generation always having to suffer because of the dead old guy from the last one. It's a fun little story. I have no real love for Clerican in particular, but it's a neat little fantasy adventure story, and Morpheus' inclusion makes sense given the players involved. Next up in issue 53 is Hobbes Leviathan. It's not that interesting about a youth who, after running away from home thanks to a desire to work at sea, joins a crew and boat owned by Hob Gadling. They have some minor misadventures, like a giant sea serpent, Hob talks about the value of keeping secrets for yourself, especially as he is very long-lived, but ultimately nothing of consequence. Issue 54 is The Golden Boy, and it is a weird one, owing itself to be a reinvention of a weird old DC concept. In 1973, DC released the short-lived series Prez about the first teenage president, which, like, yeah, technically, but he's 18, which is legally an adult, so... It's the whole new Teen Titans thing all over again, where they're technically teenagers, but 18 or 19. Anyway, point is, it was a bizarre little bit of satire that's gotten called back to on occasion over the years, usually to criticize and comment on American politics, and this is one of those cases. Amusingly, it says that with 18-year-olds being able to vote, said 18-year-olds were able to lower the age limit on elected officials, which is not how that works, but hey, the storyteller admits that this is an alternate reality. It's kind of a weird one, almost an attempt at likening Prez to a Christ-like figure, just with subtler symbolism. Prez is named as such because his mother wants him to be president, he fully embraces the American dream and what it means, while recognizing the amount of corruption and faults of America, but once he gains power, it's basically a breeze. Peace in the Middle East, lowered gas prices, etc. He's constantly tempted by Boss Smiley, an antagonist of the original miniseries, some kind of weird devilish figure who wants Prez to serve him, and he'll give him what he wants, but Prez resists even after his girlfriend is assassinated, in an attempt to gain the affection of the Justice Society superhero Wildcat of all people. Eventually, he stops being president after two terms, retires peacefully, eventually leaves to avoid all the people constantly asking him to come back, then dies. How he dies is a matter of speculation, but death takes him to the afterlife run by Boss Smiley, who says that he belongs to him now. However, it seems Death intervened and contacted Morpheus, and since Prez is from the realm of stories and myth, he falls under his domain and takes him to safety, encouraging him to go and save other Americas and other realities. Unfortunately, his first stop is to the Earth from the Monument Mythos, and he quickly decides that maybe some Americas are too far gone, and decides to retire again. It's a neat, optimistic little nod to the character, though I tilt my head a little. You see, there's a bit where Richard Nixon appears to Prez before he's elected, knowing he's gonna be the next president, and Nixon tells him, Yeah, you're not gonna be able to change Jack, dude. Just enjoy the ride. They won't let you change anything. But then there's no real conflict for Prez. You'd think there'd be, like, some oligarchical forces behind the scenes that impede his progress, power behind the throne kind of jackasses who prevent him from pushing his agenda, or he has to compromise to get what he wants and the youth turn on him or something. But, nope. It turns out it's pretty easy to solve America's problems as long as you don't suck. Who'd have thunk it? Next up in issue 55 is kind of several stories, all related to a character Brant meets. Klaproth of the Necropolis Lithurgy, a place that's all about burial rites and funeral arrangements and etc. The whole thing is titled Ceraments, featuring the storyteller, Petrifax, assisting in a burial where the dead body is eaten by birds. Then those attending tell stories to each other of deathly rites, about a hangman, about an old teacher skilled in her arts, and even more brief stories, but most interestingly, a story and a story and a story about destruction entering the liturgy and recounting how it came to be. That there used to be another necropolis there, but the people who ran it were jackasses who didn't actually care about the work they did, throwing out the books of ceremony, doing nothing to really care for the bodies brought to them. But then the Endless came, ready to do the rites necessary for the first despair who had died. Those of the necropolis just laughed at them, and Destiny took away the charter of their position, making their city decay into dust within moments, and granting one to a village that became the Lithurgy. Brant is a little annoyed when he can't hear more about something they talk about, a room deep in the catacombs of the Necropolis that had a booming voice declare, Which of them is dead? Ah, a comic wikia editor when they learned that a new crossover event just came out. 
Brant thinks that they're all dead, and that explains the weirdness of the end, but someone else has another explanation, leading into our finale of the storyline, issue 56. She says that this is the end at the end of all worlds, and they'll all leave when the reality storm is over. Charlene asks what a reality storm is. Well, sometimes big things happen, and they echo. Those echoes crash across the worlds. They are ripples in the fabric of things. Often they manifest as storms. Reality is a very fragile thing, after all. Yeah, Superboy Prime can attest to that. When a world ends, there's always something left over. A story, perhaps, or a vision, or a hope. This inn is a refuge. It's a neat little reference to DC's continuity. All the worlds and possibilities that end after one of these kinds of events. And hell, Zero Hour was only the second time they had done something like this, and yet even in 1993, Gaiman was pointing out how some characters' realities were shattered or made into leftovers thanks to these things. Charlene is kind of annoyed that all the stories they've told have been boys' stories. Now, to make it clear, women are, of course, perfectly capable of liking swashbuckling adventure or weird events, but it's in a tradition of boys' fantasy tales, and there weren't even any women in the stories. The whole thing is a metatextual critique on superhero stories at the time, just ambiguously enough that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on that. She laments her own life and how lame it is, that she has no story of her own to tell. Even Brant isn't someone she's very close to, they just shared the car ride to save money. She runs off in tears after saying that. Women, huh? What did I say? I mean, I didn't say anything. Well, you gotta laugh. Brant Prez would be ashamed of you right now. The centaur says that the inn is not a destination, just a place to rest upon the way, and that this is the second time he's encountered one, no doubt referencing the first crisis. Though amusingly, he also mentions that this is caused when two conflicting realities meet or overlap in the same way natural storms are participated by the meeting of hot air and cold, a reference to the Vertigo and DC split. Although it should be noted that because all this is subtextual and not like, you know, overtly stated, I could just be talking out of my ass here, and it's instead referring to an event in the Sandman narrative itself. Something that has only happened twice before... or in the future. The storm is interrupted by something outside, and everyone there looks out. Figures in the sky, huge and imposing, walking across it, led by Destiny of the Endless. It's a funeral procession, laid out over multiple two-page spreads, and goddamn, of course, you get a master of the craft like Gaiman to know when to use two-page spreads to show something huge and impressive. At the end of the procession are Delirium and Death, who seems to turn and look at Brant as the moon becomes blood red. Everyone starts to leave the inn as the storm is over, but Charlene elects to stay behind, letting Brant go with a kiss on the cheek. When Brant returns, recounting all this to a bartender, So the stuff with destruction in the Necropolis had yet another story layer? Charlene just doesn't exist anymore in the real world. The car is his, it's not damaged, and the company has no record of her. He just stayed out here, having quit his job, and he felt weird driving a car he knew wasn't his own. He apologized to the bartender if he bored her with all this, but she doesn't mind. After all, you hear a lot of weird stories behind a bar. World's End is not my favorite Sandman story, but it's definitely an interesting one for its anthology format, and, as I've said before, really demonstrates Gaiman's talent for infusing so much life into characters, even when they have a short time to do so. Unfortunately, all stories must end, and we have reached the beginning of ours. The storyline that begins the end of the Sandman, The Kindly Ones. We're not going to get through all the Kindly Ones today, but let's get it started with issue 57. The titular Kindly Ones are people we've met before, many times in the series. The Fates. They speak to each other in the opening pages. Some of it meta stuff about how the series will be ending soon. I mean, 18 issues isn't really soon, it's a year and a half, but still. And how dorks like me seem to always complain about what sort of stories they want or don't want out of things. It's never what they want, and if we give them what they think they want, they like it less than ever. It's a fair point, but sometimes the problem is the storyteller not actually delivering what the audience wants, just what they think they want. Although other times, yeah, there's no pleasing some people. Or you take an insanely long time to finish what you wanted to tell because it feels like the universe is conspiring against you trying to tell a storyline in your comic review show! And anyway, remember Lita Hall? 
Her and Daniel have been hovering in the background for a while, and Lita's getting worse, growing increasingly paranoid about Morpheus's promise to claim her son. Even after all this time, Morpheus has still not stopped by to talk to her about everything! It's been years! He found time to go on the quest with Delirium, but not go talk to this woman and explain, hey, your husband actually had been dead for a long time, and those two nightmares were tricking you two, and I didn't kill him, and your son is gonna be very important to cool in the future. Her paranoia grows when she finds sand in Daniel's bed, despite him not being in any sandbox for a long while, and then yelling at a homeless guy who just wanted to give Daniel a flower. Meanwhile, Matthew checks in with a bunch of the characters in the Dreaming to see how they're doing, including Nuala, who admits that she cleans the palace for Morpheus, despite him not asking her, simply because there's nothing else for her to do, before looking to Morpheus who's recreating the Corinthian. As he's explained before, he crafted him to be a dark reflection of humanity. Imagine that you woke in the night and rose, and seemed to see before you another person whom slowly you perceived to be yourself. Someone had entered in the night and placed a mirror in your sleeping place, made from a black metal. You had been frightened only of your reflection. But then the reflection slowly raised one hand, while your own hand stayed still. Oh well, yeah, that's creepy and all, but uh, my eyes are not made of teeth, so I know it's not me. A dark mirror. That was always the intention. But the gulf between conception and execution is wide, and many things can happen on the way. For instance, I was going to put a nose where his mouth would be. That didn't make it past the design phase. Morpheus is confident that the new Corinthian won't rebel against him like last time, but Matthew is admittedly more interested in learning about what happened to the previous ravens who worked for him. He doesn't say much, though confirms that one ended up becoming human again briefly, but neither he nor Eve will discuss it any further. My guess? TikTokers making videos about stuff they find on the ground? Lita is finally convinced to go out and meet with a guy offering her a job. They even go to the nightclub Lucifer owns and he plays the piano. He already knows about her former superheroine life, giving an abridged summary of her history with Hector. It had been a few years spread out for all these stories, after all. Up to now. What exactly he wants to hire her for is not really clear, but his company is trying to do marketing, interactive media, management, the whole shebang. Lita, this is starting to sound like you're going to be shilling NFT. Tease. Leave now! Well, she does have to leave, though. She has a sudden realization that something is wrong back at her place. She tries to call home, but gets no answer, the guy offering her a ride back. She busts down the door, and the place is a shambles. And Daniel is gone, bringing us to issue 58. Lita is not doing so well, almost reverting to the quasi-catatonic state she was in in the dream world as cops try to interview her about Daniel's kidnapping. The babysitter was asleep on the floor, and it's clear she knows, or at least suspects, that Morpheus took Daniel, but can't really tell the police, a dude claiming to be the Sandman stole my child. So she's just very quietly answering all their questions. After they talk to her, they speak to Lita's friend Carla, who confirms she's not crazy, she's just upset about her son. They give her their card, but tell her not to try calling them for info. They'll follow up later. What's weird is that she should still have some friends in the superhero community. Sure, the JSA were out of action, both because of the Ragnarok thing and Zero Hour, but Infinity Incorporated members were around and they could have called in some favors. Makes me wonder if incidents like this led to the procedures they set up in Identity Crisis. A superheroine's son is kidnapped in a locked door mystery, and the magic users probably could have confirmed it wasn't Morpheus who did it. Back in the Dreaming, Clerican pays a visit to see his sister. He recounts the incident in his dreams that got Morpheus to rescue him, as well as what he saw at the World's End Inn. He recounted all this to Queen Titania, who sent him here to say that it's time for Nuala to come home. Yes, despite the nature of the World's End stories being mostly self-contained, even that has effects that are going to put everything in motion. Gaiman played the long game with a lot of this, and it all pays off. Nuala doesn't think Morpheus will release her, though it's very clear from the way she reacts to all this that it's more that she doesn't really want to leave. Back over to Lita, she has a nightmare wherein she meets the Furies, who inform her that they know who took Daniel and want to help her, but can't really give straight answers. Especially since she uses up her three questions, though in her defense, it's not like she knew about that. You could probably explain the rules to this stuff out of the gate. They do tell her she's met the ones who took him, though, and they plan to put him to the fire. Clerican and Nawala go to Morpheus, who wants Nawala to say what she wants, 
but she says she's his and will only do what he says to do. After some talking, he agrees that she can go back, much to her shock, but then also grants her a gift for her service. She can use her amulet to summon him and ask for a boon whenever she would like. You think Morpheus would fall for the I wish for a million wishes thing? Nuala is pained that he didn't try to fight to keep her there, didn't care if she stayed or left, but, well... Yeah, Nawala, you're your own person. Morpheus is a dick about many things, but aside from Nada, he's always been pretty good about people's free will. But hey, let's move on to issue 59. We discover who it was who kidnapped Daniel, and it's a bit of a surprise. Loki and Robin Goodfellow, a.k.a. Puck, last seen in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Loki recounts a time when he tricked Thor into thinking that the Thunder God was pregnant, stuck a cork in his ass, left him there for a few days, and eventually Ratatosk, the squirrel who lives in the World Tree, pulled it out and released several days' worth of poop. We were eight at the time. Sure know how to paint a picture, Loki. And they put Daniel inside a fireplace. Uh, guys, that is not how you make baby back ribs. We check in with Hob Gadling, whose girlfriend has sadly passed away, and he tearfully talks to her grave about how it never gets any easier for him to lose people he's loved, and he still remembers all the women he's been with. However, waiting outside the cemetery is Morpheus, the two deciding to get a drink. Things start to get weird for the other Endless. Destiny spots another version of himself in his realm. He knew it would happen from his book, but it's still weird. Desire closes off their realm temporarily to walk around naked for a bit. Despair shuts herself out a bit when she notices his desire closing off her realm, and Delirium suddenly remembers that Barnabas was supposed to be with her, but she seems to have lost track of him. Meanwhile, it seems Morpheus came to offer some consolation to Hob for his lost love. He can't, or at least won't, go back and restore her or anything, but he does offer him the chance to visit her in dreams every night, but Hob turns it down, not wanting to wake up with her not there. Morpheus does, however, acquiesce to the request that the person who killed her in the car accident knows exactly who he killed and who she was and how good a person she was. Morpheus then leaves, saying he shouldn't have come. Hob asks him if he's in trouble, but Morpheus denies this. He runs after Morpheus and says the stink of death is on him. He's come to recognize it after so many centuries, so he needs to take care of himself. Thank you, Hob. I shall. A stronger deodorant I must invent. Morpheus is in trouble, even if he doesn't realize it. But then, that's a debate that many have had about this series. Is Morpheus cognizant of what he's doing? Visiting Hob like this? Letting Nuala go without a word? Anyway, Lita, as you can see plainly from these panels, is doing just great as time goes on. Hell, that guy she met with even comes over to check in on her and say the job offer is still open, and then tries to seduce the woman whose child is missing and is staring blankly at nothing, and hey, have we reminded you lately that in another reality she was the daughter of Wonder Woman? Can't imagine why I'd remember that as she snaps his arm like a toothpick when he touches her without her consent. She's barely gotten any sleep by the time the police finally stop by to tell her that they found Daniel. Or rather, his body badly burnt. They even have a photo to show her, and she insists on seeing it. And yeah, it's not pretty even with the stylized artwork, so I won't share that. Apparently there were people who didn't like the art for this storyline, and I have to disagree. The angular, very minimalistic art style works very well for Lita sequences, and the scenes in this issue with Hob are just gorgeous rendered. There's just so much atmosphere and great storytelling crafted in the shots. The almost fisheye lens of Lita in these sequences, her constantly open eyes until the red veins are popping, and then the final scene as Lita truly recalls her encounters with Morpheus and how she has to get her revenge, her face twisting into this horrible grin. And thus we come to issue 60, the last we'll be talking about today. Remiel, one of the two angels who took over Hell in Lucifer's absence, goes to speak to our pal the devil, asking if he's interested in coming back, and of course he isn't. What's more, he admits he has no respect for Remiel. Never did, even when he was an angel and Remiel spitting on him finally gets Lucifer to tell him to leave, threatening him too because he still has his power even if he gave up his kingdom. However, we learn that after his departure, Remiel had also planned to talk to him about the situation with the Dream King. Speaking of that situation, Lita might be determined now to fight Morpheus, 
But there is the matter of actually finding the Fury so she can take her revenge. She seems to either be hallucinating or is trapped between the dream realm and the real one, walking along the streets in the real world disheveled while in the dream one encountering fantasy creatures as she seeks out the kindly ones. Goes to show how useful they are. They've been showing up all over the place in this series, but no one can actually find them when they're looking for them. It turns out that Lita's babysitter, the one who somehow fell asleep while watching Daniel, was Rose Walker, the former Dream Vortex. Also, she stopped doing the purple hair thing. Carla goes to see her, mentioning that Lita's gone, but more interestingly, the cops never went to speak with Rose. Hell, even the card they gave Carla has nothing written on it. She decides to look into it while Rose does her thing, doing some kind of writing project about sitcoms. Back in the 90s, before we could make video essays and retrospectives about this stuff, writing books about them was all we could do. It was hell. Lita, meanwhile, eventually comes across Theno and Uriel, two of the Gorgons from Greek mythology. Oddly, they seem to resemble the spider ladies from Rose's old boarding house from back a ways. But no, in case you're not familiar, these two are the sisters of Medusa, and they want Lita to become their new third sister. A hydra in a nearby apple tree discouraging Lita from spending any time with them, but Lita's not exactly firing on all cylinders right now. Morpheus retrieves Lucian and Matthew for a task, overhearing Merv Pumpkinhead complaining about the weather, which even Morpheus says is putting him on edge. The weather is controlled by him, as the dreaming is another aspect of him, but he is just as much an aspect of the dreaming, so if things are gloomy, well, which is affecting the other more? Anyway, Morpheus finishes recreating the Corinthian, who says he awaits his command. And that's where we're leaving off for now. Come back next time for several characters going on quests, all the loose threads getting tied together, saying farewell to the Sandman, and saying hello to the Sandman. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. It's time for us to say farewell to the Sandman. Previously on... Previously! Known as clicking on part four of a Sandman retrospective before the other parts. Let's dig into the Sandman number 60 to 75 and put this one behind us. In all seriousness, we're in the middle of The Kindly Ones, the penultimate storyline of the book, and the longest, 13 issues in total. We've covered the first four already, but the rest of this retrospective is this story and its aftermath, so let's just get right into it. Lita Hall is still under the care of the Gorgons, who want to transform her into Medusa, but she rejects them. Her revenge is more important than anything else. Also because her hair is being transformed into snakes, and she really doesn't need any pets right now. We learn that Rose Walker is living in Los Angeles for the moment to take care of someone dying from AIDS. The implication, especially given we saw that her friend Hal had moved out this way, is that it's him, but no. It's actually Zelda, one of the spider ladies, whom, as I pointed out, weirdly resemble the two Gorgons, even though, nope, different characters. Zelda's in hospice care right now, having gotten AIDS from Chantal, who in turn got it from a kidney transplant and is dead already. She's in rough shape, of course, almost skeletal at this point. However, as Zelda slips in and out of consciousness, she delivers a message to Rose from her grandmother, Unity Kincaid, who contacted her via the dreams. She needs Rose to return to England and where she used to sleep. She'll give her back her heart, in reference to what seemed to happen in the doll's house. She says that, but you know it's just a ploy to get her granddaughter to come back to her because she never visits. In the Dreaming, Morpheus has completed the recreated Corinthian, and they talk a bit. Morpheus reused some bits of the old Corinthian to make this one. Can't afford to be wasteful, you know. I mean, there's just such a finite amount of dream material, after all. And thus he retains some vague memories and inklings of who he was before, but is otherwise just finding out who he is for himself. Matthew does not trust him, given what happened before, but Morpheus says he'll have to get over it because he's sending the two to retrieve Daniel. Nuala, meanwhile, has been returned to the Fae. She's still sad about Morpheus not fighting for her, but she also recognizes how cool it is she can summon him anytime she likes. And Queen Titania is just bitter because Morpheus seemingly never talked about her. Meanwhile, Clara, Lita's friend, goes down to the police to try to figure out what's up, 
but they reveal that they don't have any officers matching the description of the two who had come to see them. Getting nowhere with that, she enters Lita's apartment and discovers the photo of the burnt Daniel, but then the photo comes to life and spontaneously combusts. She talks with Rose about it, and both agree something's up. Carla wants the two of them to team up and investigate, but Rose is off to England to look into the message from her dead grandma, so Carla's on her own. One of the cops she spoke to takes her at gunpoint, or rather at cigarette point since it's revealed to be an illusion, and it turns out to be Loki, who kills Carla by setting her on fire in his car, and reveals that he's doing this because he refuses to be beholden to anyone, let alone Morpheus. Loki of Asgard, burdened with glorious douchebaggery. That brings us to issue 62. It's Rose's return to England, which she spends hanging out in the nursing home Unity spent all her time in. Paul, whom you may recall from all the way back in the first storyline, represents the investors who own the nursing home. Alex Burgess still sleeping in one part of it. The story... kind of feels like filler. There's a story told by one of the residents of the home about the importance of revenge, especially on very bad people. You could probably argue that the three women Rose talks to are meant to be representations of the Furies. She even tries to find them again, as she had before. But they don't match the pattern we've seen for their appearances so far. The issue is just so inconsequential other than to remind us of a few things like Burgess is still sleeping or the like. I suppose it's to establish Rose's situation since we'll be seeing more of her over the next few issues, but it doesn't really have a lot of meat to it, and her plot does not really dovetail into the larger one with the kindly ones. I don't know, maybe you guys can talk about a deeper meaning to it in the comment section. You've had some incredible insights so far, but for me, I'm not seeing it. In any case, issue 63 begins with, of all people, Thessaly returning to the plot, tracking down Lita as she sits near a bunch of homeless people. She now goes by Larissa, because I guess she needed to alter her identity after the apartment building collapsed, so we'll go with that for her name from now on. Back in the Dreaming, Odin arrives at the gates to speak with Morpheus. And who are you then to demand entry? I do not enter the houses of my enemies. I demand only that your master come out and talk. I became a vampire! Weird, I know, but weirder things have happened in Norse mythology. As for who I am, I am called Grim, the Death Blinder, the High One, the Gallows God. I am called Gondlier the Wandbearer, and I am Grimnir the Hooded One, the Terrible, the Wakeful. There are some who call me... Tim? Morpheus does come out to talk, and Odin explains that he's found out about Loki escaping his fate, and he is naturally pissed that he aided Loki in this deception. Morpheus confirms it all, including that he had the design of using him for some task in the future, and Odin calls him a fool. Loki does not like being beholden to anyone. It burns at him, and he will bite you after you've helped him. It's just his nature. Odin also says there have been rumors floating around Morpheus for some time now, but what those rumors are aren't discussed. Odin says there's no real beef between the two of them, just because it's kind of Loki's fault for tricking him like this, but disappointment that he was tricked. However, Odin does ask a relevant question, the same one I brought up last time, though far more poetically. Are you a spider who spun a web of cunning and deceit and now waits patiently for his prey to come to him, or are you a deer, frozen by the light of a hunter's flame as disaster comes toward you? Or are you the bored office worker who comes home on Friday night, puts his feet up, and turns on reruns of MasterChef because who wants to use that brain right now? Over to Delirium, who is currently searching for Barnabas, the talking dog, and recalled that when she was looking for destruction, going to Destiny had solved that for them, so she figured she'd check with him first. He tells her nothing other than she'll find it if she looks for him, though she'll find other things too. And she gets distracted by something in his garden. The Statues of the Endless. Morpheus's statue has changed, now depicting his head in his hands, almost as if he was weeping. So I'm gonna throw a theory out here, and you're free to discard it, it doesn't alter what is a big theme of this series, ties into it in fact, but I think that Morpheus suffers from trauma, or at least the Endless's equivalent of trauma, ever since he was imprisoned by Burgess. It comes back down to something he said to Alex after he was freed. Time passes no more quickly for him than it does for anyone else. He was stuck in a glass ball for 80 years with no activity, no freedom, his tools and power stripped from him, 
And all this right after some cosmic battle that he fought and won. Mere mortals took him and reduced him to a prisoner. For Morpheus, he is his responsibilities, his duty. He is the king of dreams, and that is the beginning and end of his existence. He might have diversions, he might fall in love, but he's a workaholic who defines himself by his job and his title. When Nada rejected him, him, the prince of stories and lord of dreams, he sentenced her to hell for this rejection of his station and power. But then comes this mortal who takes everything from him for decades, freed only by a stroke of luck. He's shown to be weak, vulnerable, and his title and power mean nothing. Destruction showed that you could walk away from being one of the Endless and it would affect nothing. His kingdom fell apart without him and he had to go through a grueling journey to regain what he had lost. But in short succession, he then had to deal with new responsibilities, over the fate of Hell, over his past misdeeds, needing to accept that Hob, another mortal, was indeed a friend, that he has need of companionship, and the world has changed around him and he can never return to what he was. His entire sense of self has been shattered and it is slowly eating away at him. He wants to deny that anything has changed, continually questioning anyone who points it out, and he even killed his own son. It's all coming apart, and whether consciously or unconsciously, he knows it. The Sandman, to me, is the slow story of a man coming to grips with his own pain and trauma, that he has changed forever. Now, most people agree with the fact that this story is about his change and dealing with it, but many think the inciting incident is really him killing Orpheus. I personally think it goes all the way back to the start. But yes, that's what we've been building to throughout the book, regardless of whether it's trauma or not, like I think. The world has changed as Morpheus himself has changed. Gods lose their power. Society's attitudes and ethos alter. Kings only have as much power as people give them. Morpheus at one point scoffs at Matthew about the story of the emperor has no clothes. Regardless of whether he's naked or not, he's still an emperor. But to paraphrase the ending line of Patton, as the slave said to the Roman conqueror returning home in victory, all glory is fleeting. But let's get back to the story, and an interesting thing happens as Delirium talks to Destiny. She asks if she should try to cheer him up, but Destiny flickers. There are two of him for a moment, giving conflicting advice. One suggesting she let him cope on his own, the other saying that she might be able to help. I wonder if that's a frequent thing, that sometimes the book doesn't contain all knowledge, but rather two possibilities that, like Schrodinger's cat, exist simultaneously until the state of the universe unfolds as it will. Larissa takes Lita back to her place, implying that the Furies helped her find the poor woman. She starts setting up magical protection for her, both from creatures she's going to encounter, but also protection from physical harm in the real world. Lita, as you can see, is not hearing any of this. She is mentally checked out as Larissa continues her spell studies. So, it's wash off the blood and sleep on the floor, or skip the bath and sleep in the tub. Choices. Always choices. First choice, order pizza or order Chinese, because we're gonna be in this for the long haul and you could probably use some food. Wherever Lita's spirit and mind are, they eventually come to a mirror. Her last chance to stop her quest. Different aspects of her say that she can stop this at any time, that this isn't what she wanted growing up, that she's a superhero, that there's always a choice. But as far as she's concerned, she has no choice at all. Breaking the mirror and finally meeting with the Furies a.k.a. the Kindly Ones. While she explains that there is someone that she needs to destroy, Matthew and the Corinthian arrive at Lita's apartment and discover Daniel is missing, deciding to go searching for him. Unfortunately for Lita, the three witches reveal that they can't do anything about this. Putting aside that Morpheus didn't kill Daniel, now that she listens to that part, they can only avenge a blood debt if he had killed his own child. She leaves disappointed and hurt, and hurting herself as she grips her own arm, but they stop her. After all, Morpheus did kill his own son. And that brings us to issue 64, which features a recounting of Morpheus's daily activities, journeying through dreams, acting as an arbiter to various beings, eating dream rice. Truly the greatest activity one can have in his profession. The whole thing, even at this point in the series, is to illustrate that he's not just sitting on his ass in his throne room day in and day out like I've been joking about in regards to Lita. He has his responsibilities and duties and dreams, which he continues to do even after Odin's visit. Though he also takes time to do regular things, 
feeding the pigeons, for instance. He walked across the park and watched an open-air performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream. He was mildly disappointed by the translation. It was much better in the original Klingon. He was, however, extraordinarily amused by the performance of the actor playing the part of Bottom. Behold, the face of a man who is extraordinarily amused. Delirium stops by to ask for his help in looking for Barnabas, but he says he can't because of his responsibilities. You use that word so much, responsibilities. Don't you ever think about what it means? I mean, what does it mean to you in your head? Eh, mostly stuff about Spider-Man. I really like Spider-Man, dear sister. Rose hooks up with a guy in England, the butler from a family of butlers who assisted Unity and in turn her and her mom. Meanwhile, Matthew and the Corinthian track down Carla's burnt body. He's able to place her eyes in his... extra mouths and see what they saw in her last moments, able to discern what it is that happened and who took Daniel. On that subject, though, the kindly ones arrive at the Dreaming, being multiple beings at once, including Lita Hall herself. They kill one of the gate guards when she refuses to let them enter, Morpheus allowing them in afterwards. No! Take his coat. They warn him of their task. They will destroy the Dreaming, everything he has ever loved, and in the end, they will kill him. Lita says they're doing this for Daniel, but of course the Furies explain that because he killed his son, he's their prey. He balks at this. It's his realm, after all, where he controls and holds power. They can't destroy him or it, but they remind him that they killed his guard, so he may not be as all-powerful here as suggested. Now... Don't take his coat. Morpheus calls up Matthew and the Corinthian to check on their progress, confused whether or not back yet. But given Lita just said she thinks her son is dead, you'd think he'd have figured out things are not going to plan at the moment. The two aren't even in the waking world anymore, but the Corinthian reassures him that they'll have Daniel soon. I have a certain amount of faith and confidence in both of you. It would disappoint me exceedingly to find that it had been misplaced. I mean, after the kindly ones have destroyed everything, I won't have any other employees aside from you two, so it'd be really awkward to fire you. Wherever Matthew and the Corinthian are, they're attacked by a wolf, one that they're able to kill, pleasing the Corinthian to no end. And in England, Rose Walker sadly discovers that her new boyfriend is involved with someone else after she had been gushing about how happy he made her. Well, dude, hope you enjoyed breaking the family business with your infidelity. Everyone's making good decisions today. We go into issue 65. Rose, heartbroken over the butler dude, takes a visit with Paul to the Burgess's old estate, eventually finding the secret passageway into the dungeon where they kept Morpheus. Here, though, she discovers Desire waiting for her. They don't really say much, explaining that they're her grandfather and only that they're not gonna hurt her, except with love. And indeed, Desire does so, though it's mostly Rose doing it to herself, spilling her guts about how painful and terrible love is, makes you vulnerable, and you give a piece of yourself to someone else, and then your life isn't your own anymore. She just kind of breaks down, but then is found by Paul, who leads her away, but they do find a little lighter in the shape of Desire's sigil. A heart. I... do not get the point of this subplot. Back with our hunting party, Matthew keeps feeling something trying to pull him back to the Dreaming, but the Corinthian tells him to fight it. They storm into the castle where Daniel is held and spot... Morpheus! Matthew, you and your friend have done well. I am proud of you both. You have won through all the trials and travails that I created to test your loyalty. You may both now return to the Dreaming to receive your reward. Yes, this was totally a test of loyalty! Being who has been loyal to me for several years and has done nothing to cause me to doubt that, you can count on me, uh, Drim of the Endless. Matthew is shockingly not certain, but the Corinthian does not buy it for a second. Then uncreate me now if you have the power, for I shall stand against you. I am young, true, but I have age within me. And you are not my lord. Man, Morpheus should have made a 2.0 of the Corinthian sooner. His lines are a hell of a lot better than his stupid speech to the serial killers. He chokes Loki into unconsciousness, but as he said, to kill a god would be a bad idea, even one as hated as him. Still, there are ways of making him talk, and the Corinthian is ever so curious what it's like to see through the eyes of a god. Matthew is once again drawn back to the Dreaming as the Kindly Ones pick their next target. Fiddler's Green, which they murder in the form of Gilbert. He laments that he doesn't know why they did this, but that he wished he had died another way. 
Morpheus admits to Matthew that he wasn't the one who brought him back, but now knows that he has to settle things. He has to kill Lita Hall since she started this. However, he then meets Larissa and... Well, this is weird. The implication in the dialogue is that she was the one he was dating right before the brief live storyline, but how? She already seemed pretty pissed at Morpheus when they met in A Game of You. They had clearly met before, and Morpheus seemed mostly disinterested with her, so what would cause them to fall in love? I can believe that they had been a thing in the distant past, but being the one from that relationship doesn't really work timeline-wise, and it's a massive time skip to do this. I don't know, maybe their first date was hunting down the cuckoo for some reason, and it was just a wild, passionate affair that they thought was something more. The magic protects Lita even from Morpheus, and he asks why she did all this. Morpheus wonders if she did it just to hurt him, but she explains that she made a deal with the Kindly Ones long ago. It extended her life, so she owed them. It's not said out loud, but it seems to be that for whatever reason, they wanted to kill Morpheus. Probably because of the sun killing, but needed someone like Lita to ask them to do it. They couldn't just do it out of nowhere. Anyway, Morpheus says that he could kill Lita indirectly, but that would violate the rules. Your kind are so bound by your idiot rules. No, it would be more accurate to say that Morpheus is. After all, destruction broke the rules. We'll come back to this. Morpheus leaves, Larissa being a dick to him, even while she's trying to help get him murdered. I know I keep harping on this, but if she is the one who was the romance during that time, it's really weak writing to not show them as a couple before this, because otherwise her motivations and personality are just out of nowhere. Hell, she's essentially a stranger to the audience. We barely learned anything about her in A Game of You, but she's playing a very important part of this story. Anyway, Matthew learns from other ravens, who have been coming into the Dreaming for a few issues now, that all these mystical ravens are being compelled to go there because there's gonna be a battle with a lot of corpses, mostly the Dreamings. However, on the subject of battles, the Corinthian has finished his with Loki and finally retrieves Daniel, bringing him back to the Dream Palace for issue 66. Odin also retrieves Loki to put him back in his punishment. He tries to get Thor to kill him, but Odin tells him, of course, that Loki's full of it. See, Loki, life is about, it's about growth, it's about change, but you seem to just want to stay the same. God, that is such an appropriate clip for this one. Anyway, we have a brief interview in the land of the fairies, where Nuala takes off her glamour, which apparently insults Queen Titania. God, she's like the assholes on dating apps who get upset when a woman isn't wearing makeup. Clarican covers for her, trying to say it was all a bet, and that mollifies her. But Nuala then learns of Robin's alliance with Loki, and that it could mean the death of Morpheus. Speaking of death, in the Dreaming, most of the Dream Servants have fled the land or retreated into Morpheus' palace, but Merv Pumpkinhead has decided to try to do something about the Furies, organizing some of the Dreams to fight them... And it goes poorly. You? What are you? Me? Lady, I'm your worst nightmare! A pumpkin with a gun! This is how Halloween looks to people who don't like the holiday. In the Dreaming, Lucian is pissed. Normally the most loyal of Morpheus' servants, but his refusal to take any action against the Furies or restore any of the ones they've destroyed is wearing down on him, and he's yelling at the dude. Morpheus explains that the Furies aren't going to leave until he's destroyed, and his plan to stop them by killing Lita has been thwarted, so he's considering his next course of action carefully. Over to Nawala, who, worried about Morpheus, runs into Delirium, who's still looking for Barnabas. Delirium admits that he is is in trouble, that she tried to convince him to leave the Dreaming, but he refused to. Unfortunately, that gives Nuala an idea, recalling his gift to her. She runs off and calls to him, asking him to come to her. He asks her to do this some other time, but she insists he come for her boon. He does so, and she explains about what Robin and Delirium said. He confirms he's in trouble. However, as long as I remain in the Dreaming, no real harm can occur. My lord... You are no longer in the Dreaming. No, I am not. Well, in her defense, dude, you could have explained that to her. You could have explained things to Lita. You could have explained things a half a dozen other times. You really, really suck at explaining things to people, and it keeps ending up screwing you over. Have you noticed that? And we move into issue 67. The Corinthian returns to the Dreaming in its damaged state, finding Cain. Cain, as you'll recall, is still under the protection of God himself, so he's immune to the Furies. Okay, what we've got to do is duct tape Cain to Morpheus and he'll be okay. The two bring Daniel to the castle, which acts as a place of refuge 
for the time being anyway, since, as they note, Morpheus is gone and his protections are kind of in limbo right now. There were to be apartments built for you in the castle, Corinthian, but they were never constructed, and now there is no one left to construct them. I know this makes your job less and less appealing, but I promise you, you'll still be getting free dental, which, you know, you should really appreciate. Morpheus explains to Nawala what's going on with the Furies, how they have power to avenge family killings, but it seems it's only here, to Nawala, can he confess to the truth of it all. I killed my son. It was what he wanted, what he craved. In my pride, I abandoned him for several thousand years. And then, at the last, I killed him. You... you want them to punish you, don't you? You want to be punished for Orpheus' death. After a pause, Morpheus talks about his imprisonment in Burgess's glass bottle. I told Ishtar that she was wrong, that I was not changed, that I did not change. But in truth, I think I lied to her. Whether it happened because of his imprisonment or because of killing his son, Morpheus wants to die. And he himself has been the grand orchestrator of his own demise. More on that later. Nawala suggests that he could just keep going from realm to realm fleeing the Furies, but no. He has to return to his realm and do what he must, giving his farewell to Nawala, who admits her own love for him. Back in the waking world, things are not so lovely. Rose has returned to LA to discover that Zelda died while she was gone. She admits in narration that in the back of her mind, she just hoped that a miracle would happen, but nope. As the remaining survivors of the Dreaming converge in the castle, the twin destinies become multiple destinies, all possibilities soon folding back in on themselves into only one. This will be felt across worlds and days as a reality storm, and as it plays its course, conflicting realities will fall and spin and shatter across time and existence. So if the reality storms coincide with event comics and one of the endless dying, who do you think was in trouble for Infinite Crisis? My money's on Desire. Just a hunch. Final crisis with Delirium. Morpheus returns to the Dreaming and the castle, but as said, his absence means it's no longer a place of sanctuary. The Furies arrive and actually injure his face when he orders them to leave, but then Lita spots Daniel. She forces them to retreat, saying that if Daniel isn't dead, they don't have to do this, they should be trying to rescue him, not take revenge, but Lita doesn't get it and never has. Even if their mandate wasn't purely revenge, they're here because Morpheus killed his son. Daniel's supposed death was just an excuse to get the ball rolling. With the Furies retreated for the moment, Morpheus knows that it's time to finally do what he has to. As he suits up in a manner reminiscent of when he went to confront Brute and Glob, he asks Lucian to bring him both Daniel and an emerald in his possession. He needs to speak to the child first. He recalls Nawala encouraging him to flee forever. Rules and responsibilities. These are the ties that bind us. We do what we do because of who we are. If we did otherwise, we would not be ourselves. I will do what I have to do. And I will do what I must. And what I must do is... RUN AWAY! SUCKS TO BE YOU, LUCIAN! Next up is issue 68. After completing his talk with Daniel, Morpheus speaks with Matthew, warning him that the Corinthian believes that he abandoned him during the encounter with Loki and is pissed, but he says he'll explain it wasn't his fault. The emerald, he explains, is a dreamstone, one of twelve that he created a long time ago. One of them was his ruby, as we saw at the start of the series. There were others. A rose quartz I gave to poor Alianor. And she went off and did her own thing, founded a rebellion. It's complicated. Just watch Steven Universe, Matthew. He explains to Matthew about facets, that the facet is not the jewel, but a part of it. It's his own roundabout way of explaining the nature of being Dream while also being Morpheus. Matthew wonders why he can't just wave the Furies away, but as always, Morpheus simply explains that there are rules against such things. He wants to send Matthew away, but Matthew explains that he can't leave if he doesn't want to, and he wants to stay and help Morpheus, even if it certainly means neither of them are coming back. Meanwhile, Rose Walker goes and sees Hal, the former owner of the boarding house, who has been making it big in LA as a celebrity drag queen and singer. Apparently Rose and him got into an argument at one point, but she's come to bury the hatchet, especially as Zelda is dead. Unfortunately, Hal doesn't want to go to her funeral because of some issue that cropped up between issues. And meanwhile, Delirium, still hunting for the dog, finds herself in Lucifer's piano bar, where the devil has been contemplating returning to hell because all night people have been requesting Piano Man over and over. He asks if she has any requests, and there are two, to find her dog and to keep her brother safe. 
Sadly, though, while Lucifer admits that he owes Morpheus for giving him the impetus to leave, it's on Morpheus's head here. He told him that there was always freedom to leave in particular, and at this point, it's too late to help him. Morpheus waits on some rocks and talks with Matthew, telling him what happened to the other ravens in his service. Some tired of service and wanted to just die. Two stayed in the dreaming in other roles, like Lucien, but before he can say any more, the Furies arrive. He asks them one final time to leave, but of course, they can't leave until their task is done. He can try to fight them, but he can't even touch them. They're pretty much incorporeal in any way. They'll be satisfied with nothing less than his death. Speaking of, Death herself arrives at the castle. The Corinthian knows who she is, and it warns Death that it will protect Daniel from her touch, even if it means his death. Ugh, Morpheus, this model of the Corinthian sucks too. He's supposed to be a dark mirror of humanity, but he's self-sacrificing. Take him back to the shop. With no alternative, Morpheus recognizes what must happen. We make choices. No one else can live our lives for us, and we must confront and accept the consequences of our actions. Those words were originally spoken to him by destiny, and he has made his choice. He sends Matthew away on his final task, taking his helmet and sand pouch for safekeeping. And then he tells Matthew to bring his sister to him, and then he strips off his cape, gloves, and shirt. Well, Furies, can you really kill a body this good? And thus we come to the finale of The Kindly Ones, issue 69. It is nice, depending on your point of view. Death comes to Morpheus, and he recalls their conversation early in the series, where she threw some bread at him. He offers it to her now over this. You want to make some pigeons? If that is what you wish. I'm mean, kind of neglectful of this, but if that is what you wish is kind of Morpheus' catchphrase throughout the book, which is hilariously ironic because Morpheus himself tends to follow an attitude of, what I wish is irrelevant. I have my response abilities and rules. In the castle, the Corinthian kills a giant spider that was about to attack Matthew. According to Lucian, the creature was one of Morpheus's prisoners, but everything except what was in his private chest were released by the Furies. Well, it's a good thing Brute and Glob learned their lesson and certainly weren't released to cause more problems for people related to characters called the Sandman. Death thinks that Morpheus deliberately orchestrated his own downfall. He didn't have to answer Nawala's call. He could have left the dreaming and his responsibilities like Destruction did. The rules exist only because he follows the rules. There isn't any cosmic karma that would keep him from doing anything or punish him for his choice. But no, Morpheus says he really could not. And he's right. Even disregarding my theory about his trauma, The Sandman is very much a book about something else. A man who was forever changed by his experiences, but also refused to change. To Morpheus, he is the job. He is Dream of the Endless and could be nothing more. The king of stories who himself was a story. This is who he is because this is what his story is. To change, to be anything else than what he set out to be, would be to deny who he is and what he believes in. To change would mean he wasn't true to himself. It's why I think most of his relationships fail, honestly. Being with another person changes you, for better and for worse. It forces you to confront your own wants and desires and contrast them against someone else's. It requires a person to change, in subtle ways and significant ways. As a wise Vulcan once said, Change is the essential process of all existence. And unfortunately, Morpheus couldn't really change. If you agree with my trauma theory, then he just is unwilling to go through the steps necessary to grow and recover from his experiences. It's not that he's weak or stupid or anything like that. It's just that he feels that he's become irrevocably altered by his experience. And if he can't be who he was before, then he does not want to carry on. And if his experiences over the last 60 plus issues have taught him anything... It's that he needs to change, to rectify his mistakes and make up for the kind of person he was. And if he can't change to be a better dream of the endless, then it's time for him to accept his fate. For reality, for the people he cares about, for the dreamers, and for himself. He must die. Consequently, it's why I don't think Morpheus was actively trying to destroy himself. Why attempt to kill Lita otherwise, and then be surprised and saddened by Larissa's involvement? And so Morpheus offers his hand to his sister, and she takes it. Like the purpose of destruction, the old story must be lost so the new one can begin. Nawala decides to leave the Fae. Titania briefly tries to stop her, but when Morpheus dies, she feels it. Clerican having warned her of this happening thanks to the funeral procession vision and World's End. Delirium feels her brother's death, 
but is overjoyed to find Barnabas again, who swears never to leave her side. Lucifer closes up his nightclub while Hal meets with Rose at Zelda's funeral, apologizing for what he said the day before. And in a nursing home in England, Alexander Burgess wakes up, for real this time, for the first time in years. Lita finally wakes up from her complete stupor, not even knowing who Larissa is, but she still helps her up. As I understand it, your actions have ensured that you will never see Daniel again. WRONG! I'd take a shower and then start running if I were you. Lots of people are gonna want to hurt you or kill you for what you've done. WRONG AGAIN! Including me. Impressive. Every word in that sentence was wrong. Yes, Lita does have an evil force pursuing her in a follow-up miniseries, but it has nothing to do with her part in killing Morpheus. And Larissa doesn't go after her either. It's amazing how completely wrong she is. But we'll get back to Lita in a bit. In the meantime, back in the castle, the emerald given to Daniel changes shape into a more appropriate pendant. And Daniel Hall becomes the new Dream of the Endless, fulfilling one of the future events seen by Destiny. And yeah, despite Daniel saying he's no longer Daniel, well, both for the purposes of distinguishing him from Morpheus, and for the simple fact that his appearances after the Sandman still have many people calling him Daniel, that's what we're calling him. And the kindly ones themselves return to their previous task being meta. What did we make? What was it in the end? What it always is. A handful of yarn. A little weaving and stitching, some embroidering perhaps. A few loose ends, but that's only to be expected. It's the same old story. Whatever it turns into on the way, whatever it is you originally undertake to spin or knit or weave, keep it going long enough and, in the end, my lilies, it's always a winding sheet. Okay, but I was kind of hoping you were making a sweater. And thus we arrive at the final storyline of The Sandman, the Wake, beginning with issue 70. Each of the Endless has sent a messenger by some unknown power that even they don't understand, telling them that they have to gather outside the Necropolis Lithurgy. Sadly, destruction does not come, but it's not too surprising. While he may mourn Morpheus, the simple truth is he decided to go no contact with them for a reason. Speaking of, unlike the village who laughed off the Endless when the first Despair died, they are smart enough to welcome them and bring them the cerements and books of ritual for this occasion. They can't go in themselves, so they create a golem of sorts to enter for them. Each imbues the golem, whom Delirium names Iblis O'Shaughnessy, with a piece of their power with Death herself actually granting it life. And thus Iblis enters the catacombs that were mentioned in World's End, the disembodied voice asking which of them is dead. You have come for the Seracloth then, and for the ceremony. Yes. They are yours. Take them. Please note that you bought them on clearance, and they cannot be exchanged or returned. In the Dreaming, Daniel is undergoing the important job left behind by his predecessor, Sitting on his ass not doing anything! I kid. Kane comes to him to return Abel to life after having been killed by the Furies, and he does so. He's apparently in the process of restoring the Dreaming, and there's a lot to do. In Eve's cave, Matthew is sulking over Morpheus' death, thinking he should have stayed with him to the end. Eve informs him that the funeral for Morpheus will be tomorrow, and the wake is that night, but he just tells her to go away. As the Endless make their way to the Dreaming for the Wake, characters from across the series find themselves falling asleep. Nuala, Rose, Lita, Alex Burgess, Hob Gadling, even Richard Maddock, the garbage human being who held Calliope prisoner, all settling in for a restful sleep and dream. Oh boy, it's gonna be awkward having Lita there. Hey guys, I'm the one responsible for his death! Uh, no hard feelings though, right? <laughs> Say, where are the hors d'oeuvres? Gilbert, a.k.a. Fiddler's Green, actually refuses to be resurrected, saying his death should have meaning. He had a good life, and it ended, which Daniel accepts. And thus humans, gods, fantastical creatures, fairies, and all manner of beings arrive in the Dreaming for the Wake, hobgaddling even learning of Morpheus' demise. We enter issue 71 with the Endless, giant and imposing, constructing a place where the attendees can mourn, the narration informing us that even we, the audience, are in this place. Ugh, it's kind of awkward going to a funeral for someone I don't know. I know I'm there to support someone else, but still. Daniel is not allowed to attend the wake or the funeral according to the ceremony rules, meaning he's left alone in the Dream Palace while Lucian heads off. Iblis is confused about who Daniel is if the ceremony is for Dream of the Endless, but Lucian and Abel explain that what they're mourning is... a point of view. Which would also be kind of a fun way to describe Doctor Who regeneration. The new incarnation is... a different point of view. We get testimonials about Morpheus, particularly from past lovers of his, starting with Calliope. When we made love, it was like a flame. Incredibly painful, but useful for boiling water. 
She explains that they started to drift apart after she got pregnant with Orpheus, though not because he was a deadbeat dad, but he had less time for her. Things going badly for Orpheus, they got into an argument, and he closed himself off to her. Matthew is just pissed off in general as he spots dreamers who just instinctively know what they're doing at this funeral, but then he spots Merv, angry that he's somehow alive again, despite being destroyed by the kindly ones. Which... Dude, you died once too and came back as a bird. This is not an unusual thing to happen around here. Matthew goes to the palace and talks to Daniel, reiterating that he was Morpheus' friend and not his, but then Daniel confesses how weird this all is for him. Everything about him is new and different, except he's also older than sons and gods. He's simultaneously a brand new person and an ageless entity who is the concept of dreams. It is both his first day on the job and the mind-numbing drudgery of the three millionth day on the job. Oh hey, he's what job advertisements want, a 20-year-old with 30 years of experience. Daniel admits that he was the one who made the Corinthians save his life from the spider nightmare thing, that originally it was supposed to be his blood on the throne, but he didn't want Matthew to die even as a baby. Matthew also asks if he could be sent to where the other ravens who left went, and Daniel says he can if he wants, but only after the funeral. At the wake, Rose runs into Lita, who's... better, I guess? You know, I'm pregnant. Not hardly very pregnant at all, but I am. Really? Uh-huh. Kill it, Rose Walker. Kill it now. Kill it before it breaks your heart. Or become Medusa. In retrospect, I really should have taken that job offer. Matthew asks Lucian why Morpheus let himself die, and he reinforces the thesis. I think, sometimes perhaps, one must change or die. And in the end, there were perhaps limits to how much he could let himself change. He knew something was wrong when he started filling his wardrobe with retro tees depicting old Disney movies. Larissa speaks next, and we get our backstory backfill about their relationship. That she came to the Dreaming by accident several months after a game of you, and they just started talking, which grew into him courting her, and she believed that she loved him, but in retrospect believes that she was just overwhelmed by his love of her, and eventually his love waned when he didn't have to court her anymore. Again, to quote our Vulcan philosopher, You may find that having is not so pleasing a thing after all as wanting. And yet she also says that when it was clear he didn't really care about her anymore, she shouted and screamed and was hurt by all this, and then left and returned to her normal life, swearing she would never shed another tear for him. So clearly she felt something for him. As someone who's had bad breakups and cut off toxic friends, yeah. If we didn't feel anything for them, it wouldn't hurt at all. We'd have no reason to be angry, because we hadn't lost anything of value. But such friendships and loves hurt because we cared. Unsurprisingly, Clark Kent, Batman, and the Martian Manhunter are at the wake too, and discussing their dreams. But what I hate is where I'm just an actor on a strange television version of my life. Have you ever had that dream? Doesn't everyone? Although there is also that dream I had where my parents were killed by xenomorphs. You ever have that one? I don't. Eh, give it a few years, John, and then you'll dream you're David Ogden Steers. Love this panel with Constantine and who I presume to be Dr. Occult and the Phantom Stranger. Trenchcoat Brigade away! Matthew meets up with the other Endless, who ask him to say a few words at the memorial service. They disappear as the funeral starts up, Matthew and Barnabas heading out to get a good seat since, well, several billion people are going to be there and it's time for issue 72. Chapter 3, In Which We Wake. God damn it, I just now got the double meaning of the storyline title. While Destiny opens with his eulogy to the assembled crowd of... everyone, Daniel hangs out with guardians of his realm, who refuse to leave their defensive spot. While we move on to Bast's eulogy, a figure approaches the castle gates. And hey, in the crowd we have two rulers on either side of Rose and her brother. Emperor Norton, are the dead invited too? And Darkseid! Darkseid does not approve of these pews, not as comfortable as they should be. And who should the figure approaching the castle be but Destruction, still on his travels? Daniel doesn't recognize him at first, but when they head to the kitchen for something to munch on, he figures out who he is. Destruction explains that he didn't plan on coming, but then figured he'd stop by and offer Daniel some advice. You've never been inclined to listen to my advice in the past, but, well, things change, don't they? Yes, they do. For instance, I am now Dream the White. After Despair gives her eulogy, we move on to Wesley Dodds. I only met the dead gentleman once. I heard he refused to rescue me from a fake Ragnarok. Thanks, jerk. We, uh, didn't talk. He sued me for copyright infringement. 
While some of the eulogies are presented, Destruction advises Daniel that he can always leave, even come with him and travel. And unlike Morpheus, Daniel simply says that he has no wish to leave, but he thanks him for the counsel before he heads out again. Matthew's eulogy is nice, talking about how Morpheus gave him a second chance, and occasionally they were friends. Daniel's a good kid and will do fine, and that he was a cool boss in the end. And these days, you treasure a boss who doesn't suck. After countless other eulogies, the funeral is finally over, as is the dream, and the mourners and guests make their exit, sending out the body of Morpheus, really just kind of a magic cloth from that tomb they got the ceremonies from, out into the infinite sea. Lita finds herself teleported to Daniel, recognizing him, though he denies he's the same baby, that anything mortal was burned away, and he's what's immortal about him. So what the hell? This comic did burn a baby to death? Lita's still not comprehending any of that, so just refers to him as Daniel. He says that the two are no longer blood kin, and he's only permitted to take life to protect the dreaming, but he can punish as he so desires. And you lost your son forever. Okay, but that makes it sound like it's her fault that she lost her son, as if she'd have gotten him back if she hadn't done anything. Morbius was clear he was gonna take Daniel because he was gonna become his successor. Go to hell. She wonders if he's gonna hurt her. The person who is responsible for the death of the first despair will take the rest of eternity to die. Only then will his pain cease. And he had better cause for what he did than you. You sought vengeance, Lita. But that is a road that has no ending. Lots of disused gas stations, though. He kisses her forehead. You have my mark on you, Lita Hall. No one shall harm you. Put your life together once again. Well, it's a good thing she has his mark on her. I'm sure nothing bad will happen to her after this. Matthew tells him he did a good thing, explaining that this is their only chance to talk since he'll be busy with his family and all the representatives of other realms. He doesn't want to be Daniel's raven, but he wants to be an advisor. Stick around and show him the ropes. Daniel also runs across Alexander Burgess, who sees himself in his dreams as a little boy. While Alex was already freed from his curse when Morpheus died, it'd be easy for Daniel to continue to punish him... But this is a new dream, a different one, and he sends him and all the other dreamers on their way to peace. And so the issue ends with Daniel, Dream of the Endless, going to dinner to meet with the rest of his family for the first time. It would be a sweet ending if the series was done with there, but we have some old business to tidy up for these last few issues. First up is Hob Gadling in issue 73. He and his new girlfriend head to a renaissance festival. I like Ren Fairs, you never know what kind of cool stuff you'll find there. But Hob, having lived through a lot of medieval times, just can't help but complain about the historical inaccuracies. After complaining and reminiscing and drinking for a while, he eventually heads to a nearby abandoned building and finds death waiting for him. She confirms that Morpheus is dead and won't be meeting him in 94 years. As such, she wants to know if he wants to finally kick the bucket. He rambles for a while, about dying, about what lies hereafter, about how Morpheus wasn't the only constants in his life, even after all this time, but he liked having him. But ultimately, he's still not ready to die. Possibly not ever. Personally, I would have asked if she wanted to take over or if Daniel wanted to follow in the family tradition, but hey, Hobbs got too much to live for. And in the end, he nods off to sleep while his girlfriend meets with some of her friends and he dreams of Morpheus and destruction, walking off somewhere into the sunset with them. And as Hobbs says, there's only one way to end a story, really. They all lived happily ever after. Unless you've still got two more issues of a comic anyway. Issue 74 is not one of my favorites. It's pretty decent, but it's like many of the standalone issues throughout the series, about a Japanese nobleman in exile who recounts meeting Morpheus in one of the soft places we've mentioned before. After they part, he gets lost in the sands along with a kitten, before encountering Daniel, who frees not only him, but several other people who have been lost in the soft place. Still, one of those freed has useful advice for Daniel and this book as a whole. Everything changes but nothing is truly lost. And thus we have reached the final issue, number 75. Is it a good ending? It's an ending, that's enough. I kid. You'll recall that a running plot thread from way back is Morpheus' deal with Shakespeare. We saw A Midsummer Night's Dream performed for the fairies it was based on, the first of two commissions, and now we find the second and final commission, as in November 1610, Shakespeare writes The Tempest for the Dream Lord. And unfortunately, like that one, I've never read or seen The Tempest, so some of this is as lost on me as that one was. I've seen Forbidden Planet, though. Still, the connections are clear, as readings of the play have interpreted some of it to match Shakespeare's own life. His career was close to being over, and the story here reflects that. A lot of the characters in his life, 
his friends, his daughter, his wife, seems to regard Will as having made mistakes in his choices, of his career path, of what he should have been writing about, how a lot of his work is garbage, etc. When Morpheus comes to check on him in December, it seems he's beginning to agree, looking back on his old works for a new printing and finding it mostly disappointing. And like the metatextual aspects of the Three Sisters, it makes me wonder in turn if this is also Gaiman reflecting on the Sandman. Could he have done things better? Is he disappointed by stories he included or rushed out? In January 1611, Shakespeare finishes it, Morpheus saying that he releases him from his service now that he's finished the play. However, Shakespeare wants a little more than that, being apprenticed to Morpheus for so much of his life, so they go into the dreaming to drink a toast. He asks why he was given his talent for writing, and Morpheus recounts how he saw him in the tavern, and he gave him his gift because he was already gifted and talented. He was no worse than any other man, because he had a good heart, and because he wanted it so badly. But now Shakespeare admits he's full of regrets, of how he took his lusts and passions and pains and turned them into pretty words, how he's no longer young and his daughter is being courted by someone he disapproves of, how he and his wife don't sleep in the same bed anymore, and how his characters feel more real to him than his actual friends. And he wants to know why this play. Why did Morpheus want a tragedy? I wanted a tale of graceful ends. I wanted a play about a king who drowns his books and breaks his staff and leaves his kingdom. About a magician who becomes a man. About a man who turns his back on magic. Given the time period, this could have been around the time destruction left his position, rounding down, and it might have been something Morpheus was considering. Could he leave his island? Renounce everything that he was? But of course, as he says... No, he cannot do any such thing. He's set in his ways, and as we saw in his final moments, he could not bear to change himself more than he was. But in the words of a genius, of a master craftsman, he might see himself and fantasize. Or rather, see himself and dream of something different. Will awakens from his own dream meeting with Morpheus and writes the epilogue of The Tempest, ending The Sandman. The series began with an ad promising that it would show us fear and a handful of dust but it ends with relief and freedom in a quill full of ink. Neil Gaiman's The Sandman is a lot of things. It is anthology, adventure, fantasy, horror, drama, romance, and above all, full of dreams and wonder. It changed itself as it went along, with different artists and different intentions with each story, with fairy tales and intrigue, fascinating premises and characters finding themselves in new, unexpected places where they were forced to reevaluate who they were and what they wanted. Did it end on a massive, reality-destroying battle? No. Would I have preferred Morpheus fight in some kind of weird cosmic war with surreal imagery against the Furies? Sure, but that's not what the book was about. Would I have wanted a happily ever after for every character I liked? Also sure, but sometimes that's just a dream. And despite all his flaws, I grew to like Morpheus as a character. And while he may not have become the person I wanted him to be, in the end, he stayed true to himself. And that's all we can really ask of anyone. But what of some of our players? What became of them afterwards? Well, as I talked about in the Dark Knight's Metal review, Daniel made a handful of appearances in the DC Universe proper. Same for Death. Most notably hanging out with Lex Luthor one time, because why not? Aside from a massive amount of Sandman spinoff materials that went into various characters doing things, Lucifer, the Corinthian, even Merv Pumpkinhead getting his own mini, we even got a brief visit to Morpheus's glass prison in the opening story storyline to Kevin Smith's Green Arrow run, where a book was stolen from Alexander Burgess that tied into other fun DC mystical lore. The Sandman is very much a part of the DC universe, even if most choose to not really bring it up, possibly out of respect for Neil Gaiman. But then again, some of these characters were DC first, so their stories had to continue. And that's where I wanted to end on a happier note for the one who suffered the most in the series, Lita Hall. After the Sandman, she starred in a miniseries dealing with Kronos of the Greek gods trying to use her to destroy the Kindly Ones, and in the process, she manages to start recovering from the events of the series. Though I really don't like the art style for it, especially with whatever the hell they did to poor Daniel in this thing. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. However, more relevant is what brings us over to the pages of James Robinson's, David S. Goyer's, and most especially, Jeff Johns' JSA series in the late 90s slash early 2000s. Because 
Jeff Johns had never met a story he didn't want to shove a retcon into, he set to work tying together several things. And fixing some mistakes along the way, so get this. Remember Armageddon 2001, which we talked about last year, and the fiasco of making Hawk into Monarch and then Extant? Well, it turns out that Dove wasn't actually killed. It was an illusion to drive Hawk insane. In turn, she gave birth to a child who represented order and chaos in one body, since that's what Hawk and Dove's whole backstory involved. And that child was a reincarnation of Hector Hall, who in turn took over the powers of Dr. Fate. Naturally, he wanted to find his wife, but she had gone missing in that time. It turns out Nabu, the original Dr. Fate and sorcerer behind his power, was hiding her from him to try to make him better at his job. Good job with your whole protection of her, Daniel. Is this because she never let you stuff yourself with candy as a baby? Once they uncovered this, Lita was freed and she was clearly mentally doing a lot better. Recalling only that her time with the Sandman stuff was very confusing and taxing on her, though she clearly remembered Daniel and had moved on from it. Hell, they even take on Brute and Glob again, who were probably freed by the Kindly Ones, along with the other creatures imprisoned in the Dreaming. And it's very satisfying for her to use her super strength to kick their asses. We see some shadows of Daniel in later stories, in particular telling the supervillain Mordru to leave his parents alone. It's clear that Daniel has some affection for them, even if he was denying that part of himself right after he became Dream. Sadly, she got caught up in the events of another reality storm, the Spectre's quest to destroy all magic and in the lead-up to Infinite Crisis. She and Hector got stranded, Hector mortally wounded. Fortunately, Daniel had made her an offer in her dreams to come stay with him in the Dreaming, and she took it. And that was the last we saw of them, even post-New 52 or Rebirth. But hey, she got reunited with her husband and son, so I'm okay with how that turned out. There really isn't much else I can say about the Sandman at this point. It's of course still widely available as one of the greatest comic works of all time. Certainly one of the most popular that wasn't a superhero. I may not have liked every part of it in this revisit, but it's certainly still full of heart and amazing journeys for those featured in it, and it's always fun to revisit. And I've only scratched the surface of the universe it inhabits, all the characters and stories within. Morpheus' final decision of what he must do to stop the Furies is, ironically enough, reflected in Shakespeare's most famous writing. Hamlet it's to be or not to be speech. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in this sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. But while Hamlet is reflecting that his suicide may lead to a worse fate, here the Dream Lord himself ends his own life to end his troubles once and for all. And whether he truly is now walking with destruction, freed from his burdens and hobgabbling's dreams, and what dreams have come if that's the truth, or is someplace else, we know that he met his end with dignity and love from death herself. Hopefully we'll all meet our end as well as he did. So to all of you out there, a toast. To absent friends, lost loves, old gods, and the season of mists, may each and every one of us always give the devil his due. But to add one final hope to you all, pleasant dreams. Direwolf, prey stalking, lethal prowler. I am a hunter, horse mounted, wolf stabbing, naked for some reason, riding on horseback. I think I just defeated myself.
So here we are, all three of us, just like the old days. And we've even got an audience. Let's tell stories. Unfortunately, Kane tried to tell the story of Marville, and everyone murdered him for a change. It is nearly completed. What do you think? It looks like the last one did. Yeah, I tried some variations on the design, teeth nipples, teeth fingers, but honestly, I got it right the first time and we're going with it. We are the kindly ones. We are the Eumenides. Yeah, well, Eumenides this! No, 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 Merv, like this! Eumenides nuts! Got him! They'd probably murder me harder. Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon, buy merch from the store envy link in the description, or check out the t-shirts available from Teespring. Thanks for watching.